Okay, everybody, um, we've got another 100 people that just joined us. So I um, just want to come in and say, um, like the opening, uh, opening remarks are gonna start in a few minutes. Uh, what you see on the screen right now is a program called Mentimeter. And it's just a, a lot of different government organizations are using this to just get engagement and do something different. You know, shake it up a little bit. Uh, it's called Mentimeter.com. And if right now, if you go to Menti, M-E-N-T-I i.com and use and use the code 31457508 you actually can see this minty media pop up and this is just letting us know where people are calling from all around the country so if you guys are having issues with audio there are troubleshooting directions that are in the chat they were also sent out during the Zoom email um, in the confirmation, if you look towards the bottom. And uh, right now, we're going to be starting in a few minutes with the opening remarks. The chat is going to go away. So if you guys can please direct all questions to the Q&A function. Uh, we have a, a very impactful, very um, packed schedule today. Um, I did see some people are overseas, and it's going to be a pretty late evening for, for you. But um, no, don't worry. Uh, if any of the sessions you are able to attend, you will get credit for after this event. And um, we'll be looking forward to connecting with you guys in a few minutes. Thank you. I do want to make a note that uh, we are now live on YouTube and we are live on Divids. If you guys are having issues with the Zoom platform, please connect to uh, Zoom government. I mean, um, you can connect to YouTube from a personal device, personal mobile device if you're gonna go to YouTube and Divids from government devices. And you can actually watch this live cast as well if you're having any Zoom issues. Uh, to take questions and answers though, we are um, gonna be watching those from uh, the Zoom government platform. And uh, yes, uh, Indiana, Germany, Canada, I see you guys checking in now. Uh, Sicily, thank you so much. And um, good morning. So yes, there's going to be codes and things throughout the day for each session to show what you have um, attended. Um, so thank you so much for, um, for participating and we'll get started in a couple of minutes.
Hello, everybody. We're actually going to be starting in a few minutes. Um, uh, the big wigs down at the Pentagon just walked in the room. So I'm going to give them a second or two to, to get uh, situated. And um, we're just going to do the last comms check. So I'm coming in and I'm going to be showing a few slides. We are going to be um, engaging in the question and answers from now on. So I will be turning the chat off. Um, if you're having audio issues, uh, my background team, if you guys can drop the troubleshooting directions one more time uh, for people having audio issues. And I'm going to share some slides and we're going to get started in a couple of minutes. You will get more instructions for today. Whatever session you are able to join in on, uh, there's going to be codes at, at the end of each session. So don't worry. We're going to make sure you guys get all the credit. But most importantly, guys, make sure you get your notepads ready to take lots of good notes. And these, this is going to be recorded. We are live on YouTube and Divids, as well as this Zoom platform. So please engage, ask your questions. Uh, this is the time because you know this is a very, very important and sensitive topic and wanna make sure that we have everything addressed. So please go to um, the Zoom question and answer with your questions. Um, also go to Zoom, uh, go to YouTube from a personal device if you are having issues from your government devices. And if you can get on your government devices, we have the Divids link down in the chat. So we will be turning this off and in a few minutes, you'll start hearing the opening remarks. Thank you so much. No, I wasn't talking, but I'm like, why is my video? Just to let everybody know, um, the chat has now been turned off. If you have any questions, please now direct them to the question and answer function as we'll be getting started in about a minute or so here. Um, please, please, please refer to our emails. I'm putting the slide up right now. Myself, Ashley Floyd and Elizabeth. Uh, man, Eliz, I don't even know how to say your last name and I don't wanna butcher it, Meldenstein. That was perfect. Oh, I said it, yes, yes. Okay, Liz Meldenstein, here are our emails. Please reach out as the chat has been turned off. We're gonna go dark and ask any questions that you have throughout the day through the question and answer function. Thank you so much.
Now we'll be having Dr. Jessica Gallis from the Department of the Navy's uh, Sexual Assault and Prevention Response Office. Give us opening remarks. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're calling in from or, or coming online from. I know we've got folks from all over the world joining us today. I see we've got 800 people and counting um, coming into the session. Welcome. It's an honor to be joined by hundreds of colleges and universities, representatives from all of our armed forces, our military allies, and, and really um, people from all over the globe. So I wanted to start with a, a quote that I read years ago. It's a quote by Theodore Roosevelt, and it, it's one that really stuck with me and captured why so many of us are passionate about working on these wicked problems. And he said, far and away, the best prize that life has to offer is the chance to work hard at work worth doing. And it's, it's really exciting to be joined by hundreds of others who also believe that sexual violence prevention and creating healthy cultures and climates is work worth doing. We have a tremendous lineup for you today, but before we begin, I just wanted to highlight some resources that we have avail available for anyone who needs them. As, as a reminder, these topics can be tough, so I encourage everyone to practice your self-care skills, reach out for support if needed. If you have tech support issues, please contact Ashley or Liz or check the email, your registration email that has the initial link. And now without further ado, I have the, the privilege of introducing two senior leaders who will kick off the day for us. The first is Mr. Robert Hogue, who is the Acting Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Manpower and Reserve Affairs. He's responsible for the supervision and oversight of multiple Department of Navy programs and policies related to military personnel, their family members, and the civilian workforce. Also joining us is Dr. Cynthia Evers. She is the Assistant Vice President for Student Affairs at Howard University. And for over 25 years, Dr. Evers has led higher education institutions in developing the systems and operations to support learning environments for increased student success and retention. I in no way did them justice in this short intro. They have very uh, long and impressive um, histories, but I, in the interest of time, I will go ahead and turn it over to Mr. Hope. Thank you, Dr. Gallus, uh, and good morning and good day to all of our participants, wherever you are. I'm, I'm, I was struck by your uh, introduction there. Usually when somebody says uh, somebody has a long history, what they really mean is they're old, and that's clearly not the case with, uh, with Dr. Evers, so I'm going to have to wear that mantle. So welcome everyone to the 2022 national discussion. I would like to first thank Howard University for its partnership in hosting the event. We are honored to partner with this world renowned research institution, which has a proud and rich 155 year history and has produced a legacy of distinguished leaders in government, the arts, medicine, science, law, social justice, and many other fields. Howard University fully supports and celebrates and embraces the unique experiences and perspectives of each member of its community. It brings a commitment to diversity as well as its core values of truth and service. The Department of the Navy is grateful that Howard has joined us for this important opportunity to bring the often marginalized voices of victims and survivors to the forefront. To all the leaders from higher education represented here today, presidents, provosts, heads of student affairs and violence prevention directors, welcome. Partnership and collaboration are essential to addressing sexual assault and sexual harassment in higher education and the military. Our society, including the military, is experiencing major transformation on this topic. Collaborations with academia allow us to leverage the latest scientific advances in prevention. I would also like to welcome distinguished senior leaders in the Department of Defense, esteemed members of Congress, and our virtual participants from across the country and abroad who have tuned in for this conversation. Gatherings like these create an important forum for military, civilian, and industry leaders to discuss cutting edge science and practices to advance sexual harassment and sexual assault prevention efforts. As leaders, we have a responsibility to promote prevention approaches that address the broader environment in which these experiences often happen. It is also on us 
to lead the way on persistent or emerging challenges from recognizing biases that limit our inclusion of other valued team members to addressing instances of cyber sexual harassment that have become more common with remote work and school. Our institutions of higher education and the military share many of the same populations, challenges and opportunities. Looking at today's agenda, I'm reminded that prevention is a long game. Over the last decade, we have shifted from a near exclusive focus on sexual violence response to recognize the incredible benefits of stopping the earliest negative behaviors before they escalate. Preventing and effectively addressing sexual assault and sexual harassment requires systemic changes to climate and culture, whether in the military, higher education, or industry. And culture change is tough. It's a process, it requires us to recognize where we're falling short, and also to have the courage to address gaps in programs, policies, training, and professional development. Transforming our cultures means that we have to extend our focus on victims and offenders to also look at the context where these behaviors happen. We have to challenge environments where basic disrespect, gender discrimination, sexual harassment, and other negative behaviors are minimized or overlooked. As important, we must develop leaders who contribute to or foster inclusive environments where all team members are valued and these behaviors are less likely to happen. This takes time and thoughtfulness. Thoughtfulness in our words and actions as leaders. We must set the expectations for behavior, model what we want to see as leaders, and immediately recognize and address emerging harmful behaviors. Our speakers today will share their exper expertise and guidance on how we can help students, staff, team members, and leaders build the skills to transform their values into prevention actions. We will hear novel approaches for building healthy workplaces and why a focus on civility and respect can promote skills that not only reduce violence, but contribute to inclusive cultures. We will conclude with a discussion on the role of leaders in violence prevention, from reinforcing positive leadership to leveraging climate data to identify challenges and promote accountability. All of these areas, prevention, skill building, healthy climate promotion, and proactive leadership are critical to our collective ability to stay competitive in the 21st century. Being a learning institution is part of who the Department of Navy is. I look forward to being part of the insightful discussions we have on our agenda today. Finally, I'd like to thank the team at the Department of the Navy's Sexual Assault, Sexual Harassment, and Suicide and Prevention Response Office for their outstanding efforts in coordinating this event with Howard University and for all those who participate today. With that, I'm gonna turn it back to the moderator to introduce Dr. Evers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Hogue. And Dr. Evers, I'll turn it over to you. Good morning and welcome. Thank you all for joining us today for a very important conversation. The subject of sexual assault and sexual harassment is one of the most critical matters that we must address on our campus, across higher education and throughout the country. It affects the entirety of our society, including our operations as a university and the well-being of each individual Howard student. It is the responsibility of every single person in our community to fight against it. Just last week, we concluded Women's History Month, which called upon us to remember not only the female trailblazers and change makers who paved the way for a better society, but also the discrimination and bias that women have faced historically and today. In April, we observed Sexual Assault Awareness and Prevention Month. It is an opportunity to make good on the action we pledged to take during Women's History Month, where we vowed to do all we can to ensure that women and ultimately all individuals have opportunities to succeed, to succeed in our society. As sexual assault, sexual harassment and gender-based discrimination remain an area of grave concern, despite all the progress we've made as a country, it is incumbent upon us to create a culture where these violent actions are eliminated. We must do everything in our power to lift all individuals up, to protect them from the forces that could bring them down. No individual is personally immune from sexual violence and sexual assault. And when we live in a community that tolerates or ignores this behavior, we all suffer as a result. Howard University's response to sexual assault and sexual harassment is a top priority for myself and the administration. We have a zero tolerance policy for any such actions or behavior that encourages or condones this sort of violence. We are committed to fostering and maintaining an academic and work environment that is free from all forms of sexual 
and gender-based harassment and discrimination. Howard is taking a stand against sexual assault and interpersonal violence with the hashtag HUStands movement, which recognizes that everyone can play a role in preventing sexual assault on our campus. The hashtag HUStands campaign focuses on understanding what interpersonal violence is and how to prevent it, learning what options and resources are available if someone experiences interpersonal violence. We work together and pledge to take a stand. This includes supporting student survivors and their decisions, modeling consent and respecting it by holding others accountable and fostering a campus community where sexual assault and interpersonal violence acts are unacceptable. Howard University takes the safety and well being of our students very seriously. Sexual assault against our students will not be tolerated. It is our duty as a campus community to make Howard University a safe environment for everyone. And that begins with education and prevention. In keeping with our commitment to increase awareness and to promote prevention, our students have access to programming, trainings, and opportunities for engagement from our Title IX office and our Interpersonal Violence Prevention Office. Ultimately, we want everyone to be fully aware of their rights and their resources available to them during their time at Howard University. A thriving institution and or organization is one that prioritizes diversity, respect, and accountability. The urgency to address sexual assault and sexual harassment is felt by both academia and the military. Together, we can increase innovation, share solutions, and engage on a national level to build better leaders. The fight against sexual assault and sexual harassment is core to what Howard University is and what we stand for as an institution of higher education. Giving our students a true opportunity to succeed mandates us to also create an environment where they are free from harm or threats of sexual violence. A student who experiences sexual assault or sexual harassment is not being given the opportunity they deserve to pursue an education, to explore their passions and to reach for their fullest potential. The health and well being and opportunity we provide to each individual person on our campus is reason enough to put an end to sexual assault and sexual harassment. Every person deserves to live a life free from the harm of sexual violence. We need no other reason to put every effort imaginable into this cause. The benefits of eliminating sexual assault and sexual harassment extend further. When we create a culture where sexual violence is not tolerated, all people benefit. We all benefit from the talent and skills of those who might otherwise have been victimized. And we all benefit from working and learning in an environment where no one is threatened by these forms of violence. violence. At Howard University, among the many strategies, events, and activities that we provide, the hashtag HUStands campaign demonstrates our overall pride in the work we've done and our pledge to work even harder until no one has to suffer from se sexual violence. Thank you to the Department of the Navy for partnering with us today on today's event. And thank you all for joining us for this critical conversation. Thank you so much, Dr. Evers. So we'll now transition to our plenary session. And we have an amazing session here for you this morning or this afternoon or evening, depending on where you're calling in from. I'll introduce our moderator, Ms. Rosie Hidalgo, and then turn it over to her. Ms. Hidalgo serves as the special assistant to the president and is the senior advisor on gender-based violence at the White House Gender Policy Council. She's worked in the movement to end gender-based violence for over 25 years as a public interest attorney and as a national public policy advocate. She's held multiple leadership positions aimed at shaping public policy on these issues and has leveraged her expertise in advisory roles on the Biden Foundation's Advisory Council for Ending Violence Against Women and on the American Bar Association's Commission on Domestic and Sexual Violence. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Ms. Hidalgo.
All right, everyone. And I, I know we're uh, trying to get connected with the, the studio here. So just give us a minute. And with all of you joining us virtually, I'm also honored to be able to work and serve in the White House Gender Policy Council, which President Biden created and established by executive order last year in March on International Women's Day. Good rehearsal. Yeah, <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for this invitation to join you today for this important national discussion and to commemorate Sexual Assault Awareness and Prevention Month. It is an honor to be here today with this distinguished group of senior leaders and with all of you joining us virtually. I'm also honored to be able to serve in the White House Gender Policy Council, which President Biden established by executive order last year in March on International Women's Day. The Gender Policy Council leads the administration's efforts to advance gender equity and equality in domestic and foreign policy. And the executive order designated all the members of the cabinet as members of the Gender Policy Council, as well as senior designates from across all federal agencies who are an integral part of this effort and this work. The Gender Policy Council released a national strategy on gender equity and equality last October, and it highlights 10 key priorities for us to advance as a nation these goals, both domestically and globally, including the goal of ending gender-based violence. Ending domestic violence and sexual assault has been a priority for President Biden throughout his life in public service. Over three decades ago, as a senator, he wrote and championed the first Violence Against Women Act, known as VAWA. And as you know, this is a law that has transformed how we respond and work to prevent sexual assault, domestic violence, and stalking. And he has said it is one of his proudest legislative accomplishments. And so while we know that a lot of progress has been made over these past three decades, we also know that there is still so much more work to be done. Just last month, President Biden signed into law legislation to not only renew, but to continue to strengthen VAWA and to continue to expand our nation's efforts to prevent and protect survivors of sexual assault and other forms of gender-based violence. He also directed the Gender Policy Council to lead the work across all federal agencies to develop our nation's first ever national action plan to end gender-based violence. And we're also working to update our global strategy to prevent and respond to gender-based violence globally. Last year, President Biden also issued an executive order directing the Department of Education to review the Title IX regulations and to work across the agency to look at agency actions to ensure that all students have an educational environment that is free from discrimination on the basis of sex and addressing, that includes addressing and preventing sexual assault on college campuses. The president will also be launching a national task force later this month to address the critical issues of online harassment and abuse. And as we know, sexual violence is also a matter of national security and military readiness. President Biden signed the 2022 National Defense Authorization Act, which includes historic reform of the military justice system to advance the goals of eliminating sexual assault and sexual harassment and related crimes in our armed forces and improving prevention efforts and services for survivors. Additionally, the National St uh, Strategic Plan on diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility calls on every federal agency to update its policy. Hey everyone, it looks like we're having a little bit of difficulties um, with the technical piece of this. Please stand by. Change to work for culture change so that there is no tolerance for this harmful abuse of power. 
And the president has said that. He has said that sexual harassment and sexual assault is an abuse of power. And when he was vice president, President Biden helped launch It's On Us and visited many college campuses, visited the military academies to really help raise awareness and work to support student-led efforts to improve prevention on college campuses. He believes strongly in the power of every person to be a part of the solution. And as President Biden stated in the Sexual Assault and Awareness Month proclamation for this month that he recently issued, he said this month we honor the bravery and leadership of survivors by rededicating ourselves to eliminating sexual violence. It will require care and commitment from each of us to realize an America where everyone is free from the threat and impact of sexual violence. So it is my privilege now to introduce this esteemed panel of wonderful senior leaders who are with us here today and to dialogue with them about these issues and the commitment to keep advancing these goals. And it's great to see the agenda for the rest of today's event, where so many others will also share their expertise and their commitment to advancing these goals. So I'm going to start with introducing Deputy Secretary of Veteran Affairs, the Honorable Donald Remy. Deputy Secretary Remy is a senior leader in our nation's second largest federal agency with nearly 400,000 employees, 120,000 health profession trainees, and the largest integrated health care system in the country. Over 16 million veterans receive some type of VA benefits, and of these, over 9 million receive their health care at the VA. Before coming to the VA, Deputy Secretary Remy was the Chief Operating Officer and Chief Legal Officer at the nonprofit National Collegiate Athletic Association, NCAA, where he was responsible for all aspects of strategic planning operations, budget, and legal affairs. Deputy Secretary Remy also has leadership positions in multiple law firms, in private industry, and in the federal government, including as a Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Department of Justice and as assistant to the General Counsel for the U.S. Army. He comes from a long tradition of military service and served in the United States Army, earning the rank of captain. Thank you so much for being with us here this morning. Good morning. Now it's my privilege to introduce to you the Howard University President, Dr. Wayne Frederick. Dr. Wayne Frederick is the 17th President of Howard University. Born in Trinidad and Tobago, Dr. Frederick came to the U.S. for the first time when he was matriculated at Howard University at the age of 16 to pursue a, double deg a dual degree. By the age of 22, he received his Bachelor of Science degree and graduated from medical school. As president of Howard University, Dr. Frederick has overseen a period of immense growth and transformation. He's a tireless advocate for social justice and is sought after for his perspective on diversity, equity, and inclusion. He uses his voice and his expertise to champion the need for greater access and opportunity for people, for people of color in healthcare, higher education, and in society at large. And finally, but not last, last but not least, is our Secretary of the Navy, the Honorable Carlos del Toro. Secretary Del Toro is the 78th Secretary of the Navy, responsible for over 900,000 sailors, Marines, reservists, and civilian personnel, and an annual budget exceeding $210 billion. Secretary Del Toro was born in Havana, Cuba, and immigrated to the U.S. with his family as a refugee. He earned his commission in the U.S. Naval Academy and had a 22-year naval career that included critical senior leadership appointment and multiple tours of duty at sea, including first commanding officer of the guided missile destroyer USS, USS Bulkley. After retiring from the Navy Secretary, okay, I'm sorry, there, after retiring from the Navy, <laughs> Secretary Del Toro founded SBG <clears throat> Technology Solutions, where he supported numerous Department of Navy priorities related to shipbuilding, artificial intelligence, space systems, and training. So needless to say, we have a great group here. And in addition to all these accolades, what's also fantastic is that they are committed leaders to really working with all of us to advance efforts to prevent and end sexual harassment and sexual assault. 
And so we're going to start this conversation with our panelists now, and then we'll open the floor for our audience members. Uh, and then we're going to wrap up with the white ribbon ceremony, reaffirming these le leaders' commitment and all of our commitment to preventing and addressing sexual violence. So Deputy Secretary Remy, we will start with you. Over the past decade, we've seen a significant push across society for organizations to more proactively address and prevent sexual violence. From Silicon Valley, to the film industry, to the institutions that our panelists represent this morning. So with the VA being the second largest federal agency, second to the Department of Defense, mm -hmm. how is the VA proactively tackling these efforts to prevent and address sexual harassment and sexual assault, uh, 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 you know, the ways it impacts veterans, the ways it impacts employees. Over to you. Well, well, first, let me say thank you. Um, it is an honor and it is my privilege to participate in this conversation this morning, Ms. Hildago, and thank you, Secretary Del Toro and President Frederick for uh, sponsoring this event. Um, as you said at the top, it's a really important conversation that America is having, not just today, but every day, to assure that we're positioned properly uh, to engage in this dialogue, but to make a difference. And at VA, we believe we're making a difference. Um, we focus on prevention. We focus on protection. We focus on survivor resources to assure that people are educated, not only our employees, but all of our veterans that come into our facilities around their responsibilities in this space. <clears throat> Excuse me, we were talking about allergies earlier. Sorry. I see they've gotten to me. Um, and, and so we have training that's made available um, at, um, at all of our medical facilities, at, uh, with all of our relationships with the higher education community, with our benefits offices and our memorial services. Uh, all of our employees are required to go through a training process to understand the issues and how they may present mm -hmm. and how to resolve them and how to react to them right. when they do when they too present. So prevention is, is important protection. Um, we recognize that we have to have a safe space. We have to have a space, safe space for those who are coming to receive our services and a safe space for those who are working together. Mm -hmm. And, and so we assure that information is available to be sure, but that people feel safe when they come in, that there's a culture that recognizes that this won't be tolerated. And then, you know, lastly, as I mentioned, survivor support, because unfortunately it happens all too often. Mm -hmm. I like to say, you know, one instance of sexual assault, one instance of sexual harassment is one too many. But when it does have to, and when it does happen, we have to be there mm -hmm. for our employees, for our veterans, providing them with the support that they need so that they can get through these really challenging moments. And so this is an issue, as you said at the top, that we're all focused on trying to remedy and make sure that we're positioned properly. I'm pleased to have been involved in the efforts to combat sexual harassment and sexual violence, not only in this role, but in my prior role. You talked about It's On Us, as Dr. Frederick knows, in my prior role, I was intimately involved in the It's On Us campaign as well. So I'm just glad to be here. Thank Wonderful. you for your question. Thank you so much. Thanks for all your leadership and for all that mm -hmm. you all are doing there at the VA to really advance these goals. And now mm -hmm. um, we'll turn to you, Secretary Del Toro. You know, as a Naval Academy graduate, what do you think are some of the unique challenges that the service academies face in confronting sexual harassment and sexual assault? And what are some of your recommendations that you have in addressing that? And then also what, what are different forms, you know, that different ways that different universities are able to, you think, continue to increase their leadership and their goals in advancing this? Well, thank you so much for the question. And before I answer the question directly, uh, let me thank uh, my department, particularly Melissa Cohen, who's put together, we've hosted this event, the National Discussion on Sexual Assault and Sexual Harassment at America's Colleges, as well as the, the service academies. And uh, the theme for this year is better people, better leaders, better nation. And we strongly believe in that. But I want to thank Melissa Cohen and the entire Department of the Navy staff who's coordinated this. And thank you for the efforts that you've made at the White House on this very important topic as well, too. Now, I've been blessed as Secretary of the Navy, actually, to have my 22 years in the Navy. And I actually commanded a ship that had a mixed gender crew. So I understand the challenges that sometimes 
military uh, military institutions have in, in, in these cases, um, as well as being a, a graduate of the Naval Academy itself. And in my private sector capacity, I also had the opportunity to serve on the Board of Visitors of the University of Mary Washington in, 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 in Fredericksburg, Virginia, and on the uh, Commonwealth Council on Higher Education as well, too. So to directly address your, your question with regards to the Service Academy, a lot of it really has to do with education, right, and early education. The students, as they first come in in their first year, in the case of the Service Naval Academy, as we call them plebes, but in, in all universities, it's important to capture those freshmen and start to educate them so that they understand that perhaps cultural behaviors that they might have been exposed to in the past just simply aren't, aren't acceptable. You know, in the Department of the Navy, and the same applies at the Academy, we're trying to build a culture of warfighting excellence where everybody treats each other with dignity and respect. And that's very, very important because you've got to treat people with dignity and respect. I like to say that, you know, those young freshmen that are coming into the Naval Academy and other individuals who are coming into the Department of the Navy, they are the Department of the Navy. Those individuals are the Department of the Navy. And we have an obligation to treat each other with dignity and respect. And there's no room whatsoever, nor tolerance whatsoever for sexual harassment or sexual assault or any other type of negative behavior as well. So that's what we try to do early on as these students arrive to the Naval Academy and to the Navy itself as well, too, to try to curb these negative behaviors from developing in the future. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And Dr. Frederick, as a leader of an institution of higher education and a leader of a historically black university, what are some of the specific challenges that you've seen in your efforts to address sexual harassment and sexual assault? And what recommendations do you have for how to enable students, faculty, and staff here and in universities all over the country to more effectively address these challenges. So again, I uh, want to thank you for doing this and certainly welcome all of you um, to Howard University. Now, I think on a university campus as this one with um, students from more than 46 uh, of the states and from about 71 countries, you have a very complex environment of different norms and different cultures, et cetera, that all come to one. And so the first challenge I'll put out there is the fact that you have everyone that addresses some of these issues in a very different way yeah. or participate in a culture and have seen and witnessed things that would be aberrant to someone else. And so the first thing is trying to recognize that everybody's coming from a different place, but we have to agree on what our standards are here. Uh, we also, in a university environment, you have all five generations alive today are working in the same environment. So again, you may have someone who is an 85-year-old professor and you have a 16-year-old student. And so that exposure is very different as well. So I think that that uh, difference in generation also um, purports that we have to look at those things. And then the third challenge, um, I think that is something that we, we have to address as we look at the dynamic on college campuses as to culturally how we've evolved over time. We now have more, far more women in our undergrad campus than we have men. As a matter of fact, here on Howard's campus, 74% of my undergrads are women. And so the leadership also needs to reflect that because you send a message, um, you know, to the student body based on that. So what are the solutions? I'll start with, you know, the last one. We, we had one woman dean when I started um, out of 13. We now have 14 schools and colleges. We have 10 women deans. So they're far more reflective of the student body. And that sends a message just in terms of leadership, as you spoke about the power dynamic. And I think that that's extremely important. Our orientation is focused around trying to give um, students and faculty and staff an opportunity to understand who our students are, especially as the generational change um, occurs. I have a 17-year-old son and a 15-year-old daughter, and um, I get it from my daughter all day, every day, right? Um, I came home one day, and she was a little <coughs> miffed about a conversation at school, and the conversation was about girls playing football. And I, of course, being the dad that I am, I said, you don't want to play football, do you? And she said, that's not the point. The point is we should be able to have a conversation <laughs> about us playing football and whoever wants to play should play, even if it's one person. And so that sets a tone around kind of how we view gender and, and the spectrum of it as well. Right? I think it's also important to recognize um, as we have more transgendered individuals that we don't look past them in the discussion and that we do uh, create an opportunity for acceptance. So the so that and, and the different norms, one of the solutions we've had apart from orientation is also doing palpable things that can make people feel more comfortable. So, you know, everything like having uh, gender neutral restrooms in every single building, um, we felt was important. Uh, making sure that um, 
<clears throat> you know, female hygiene uh, products were available to students throughout the campus, um, anywhere they go. And we still have more to do. We still have to look at things like in the workplace. Do people have appropriate um, stations? Um, if you have mothers who may need to breastfeed or for that matter, um, you know, collect milk, all of those things that we think are important. And that sets a tone around the issue, I think as well, of sexual harassment and violence. Because if we elevate um, how we see all participants on the campus, it makes it very clear that certain behavior is aberrant and, and we don't tolerate it. So we have an HU Stands program, and I said we all stand against sexual assault and sexual violence. And everybody on campus is um, encouraged to take the pledge and to participate. And the last thing I'll say is passerby um, involvement is very critical as well. We have to empower everyone in our community to recognize that sometimes just a soft word to someone about something that probably isn't quite across the line but can lead there um, can be helpful. And sometimes that's your very friend who you hear saying something that you know is not quite probably what's in that person's heart. But if that sentiment continues down the road, they'll get there. Or you hear them expressing um, uh, you know, the need to perform a certain act or something like that, and that's your opportunity to say, or you witness somebody doing something, whether under the influence of drugs or not, and that's your opportunity to you know, correct and to step in. I think that that's important. And we've had training on campus around this issue as well. That training is um, open to everyone on campus. And uh, we have had almost 100% participation every year. And we think that that's absolutely critical because we have to learn about this. What may bother mm -hmm. someone else may not bother you. And we have to recognize that hearing all perspectives is extremely critical. Wonderful. Thanks so much for sharing that. You know, I'm really glad you you also lifted up how critical it is to work at these intersections. And that's one of the things in the executive order that created the White House Gender Policy Council and, and, and called for this gender strategy. We really looked at how critical it is to also elevate and work at those intersections with the president's EO on racial equity, with the um, executive order on the rights of LGBTQ plus individuals, with the need to look at the way different populations are impacted and really work at those intersections to elevate the rights of everyone to thrive and to be in an environment where they can develop their full potential. So I think it's just really exemplary the way you all are, are doing that here at Howard University. And as an aside, I have two daughters and a son of college age plus who and people say, oh, they must be proud of what you're doing. I say, well, they're always calling me out. They keep me humble. <laughs> they still think that we're, there's more to do. We're not doing enough. And you know what? They give me hope. I see this next generation. They're impatient, both young men and young women. They want to be a part of the solution. They want to be a part of social transformation. They keep us humble, which I appreciate. And so it gives us also that opportunity to keep learning from them as well as we also work with, with students to, to advance these goals. Um, and so now back to you, Deputy Secretary Remy. You know, the VA has partnered with academic institutions for over 75 years to grow our next generation of medical students, healthcare professionals. So what are some of the efforts there in the VA that are underway to ensure that students and trainees are working in healthy climates? Uh, thank you for that question. That's a, that's a terrific question because we have so many health profession trainees. Uh, throughout our system. Indeed, you may know that many of America's doctors at some point in time in their careers are trained in the VA system. So we want to make sure that part of that training indeed includes training around these very important issues. Uh, when I think about it, our relationships with America's higher education community are broad, wide, and vast. Indeed, I think it's around 99% of our higher education community we have relationships with through our health profession trainee uh, programs. And so within those programs, we can help instill the culture that Dr. Frederick talked about here today. It's so terrific to hear what you have going on at, at Howard University, my alma mater, by the way, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and recognize how important these issues are on, on campuses across America. But as importantly, we try to bring to those campuses those lessons learned that we've seen and assuring that those who are providing healthcare services, not just at VA, but throughout all of America, are trained properly. They understand the issues. They have the information at their fingertips and they can utilize that as they go through the training process while they're on campus and in the future 
as they are clinicians and practitioners servicing our veterans and working alongside others in our VA medical facilities. We contribute a significant amount of time, effort, energy, and funding uh, to these endeavors to, to make sure that we have uh, this type of training available to them. That's fantastic. You know, that's one of the things we're seeing also as we're working to develop the National Action Plan on Gender-Based Violence, that while there's an important role that the criminal justice system plays, we mm -hmm. really need to see this also as a public health crisis, right? And really recognize the need to take a public health approach to train our medical professionals also to help educate and identify and support individuals who might be experiencing sexual harassment or sexual assault and connect them to the resources and support they need. So, right, and, and, and all the rules, if I could, if I could yeah. also add here, you know, the rules that apply to federal government work, the federal government workforce as a whole yeah. are equally applicable. Uh, to those trainees while they're in this in this environment. So they, yeah. they get indoctrinated into a system that exists uh, through all of our agencies as they go through this process. That's fantastic. And Secretary Del Toro, over to you, with so much work to be done in this area, it can often feel, right, that, that we're paddling upstream. We recognize a lot of progress has been made, but so much more to do. So could you please share with us what are the positive lasting changes that you have witnessed over the years that you have been doing this work and, and that give us cause for optimism as well? Absolutely. And, you know, my glass is always half full, not half empty. Mm -hmm. And I really do believe that. You know, when I came into the Navy in 1979 as a midshipman at the Naval Academy, we were the first class to be trained by women first classmen or upperclassmen who seniors basically at other universities mm -hmm. and you know and that was special and when i reflect back on the experience that those women had at that moment in time you know there's a group of extremely capable women that were coming into this highly charged environment and they sh and many of them struggled obviously because of the obvious biases that existed back then you know and it's a tremendous testimony to their fortitude how they actually graduated from the service academy but you fast forward you know 20 plus years later and we're very proud there's still much more work to be done let me make that perfectly clear we're proud of the accomplishments that women have made in the united states navy in the past 20 years and today we have far more female admirals and captains we have commanding officer of our of one of our nuclear powered uh, carriers uh, the abraham lincoln is a female the commanding officer of our oldest ship in the navy the uss constitution is also a female we have both the oldest and the newest um but there's much more work to be done and the point that i also want to make beyond that is it also requires resources and i'm very proud of the work that president biden and secretary austin deputy secretary hicks has done to ensure that the services the navy the army the air force now are investing the necessary resources to implement the recommendations that have been made by the Department of Defense uh, Independent Review Committee, for example. And we're executing on those recommendations very aggressively this year and the several years to come. But it does take resources. Talk, I always say, is cheap. It's the, the resources that you put behind it to execute those policies. That's very important. So I'm proud and I'd like to, you know, America to understand that the Department of Defense and Department of the Navy is really investing the resources because we care deeply to prevent sexual harassment and sexual assault in the Department of the Navy. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that and for calling out the amazing work of the Independent Review Commission that Secretary Austin yes. and that President mm -hmm. Biden had mm -hmm. called for and all the ways that you mentioned that even though some important changes were made in the laws for military justice reform, at the end of the day, it's all about implementation, right? Yes. It's all about that commitment from the top and throughout to really move forward because it's going to be a process you know, an evolving process to really bring about these significant reforms and changes. But with leadership like yourself and others at the helm, I think that also is great cause for optimism. And that's what we have been seeing as the Department of Defense is moving forward to really move all of this forward. And it's really important that it be top down, but also bottom up, mm -hmm. right? right? And they've got to meet at that intersection where hopefully we can change the culture and prevent these destructive behaviors from occurring. Yeah, wonderful. And, and Dr. Frederick, back to you, and I know you touched upon this a little bit earlier, but you know, one of the things we see, of course, is that anyone and everyone has a risk of being impacted by sexual harassment, sexual assault, including men, women, LGBTQ plus individuals, and, you know, the, across races, ethnicity, income level, religion, right, this is something that impacts everyone. And yet we also know that it disproportionately impacts women and female identifying individuals, LGBTQ plus individuals, those from communities of color who at times encounter additional challenges or barriers to getting services and support. So just, you know, we'd love to hear from you. What more do you think can be done to address 
in that manner and make sure that, that anyone who's a survivor gets the services, support, resources they need that are unique to them as well and to address, you know, to really recognize and address the way this happens at, at various intersections of identities. Yeah, well, obviously, there's structural issues in our society that need to be addressed that speak to that. I mean, you look at the pandemic um, over the course of the past two years, the increase in domestic violence as people were locked in uh, to unsafe spaces. Um, certainly uh, was alarming, but that I think also exposed that the lack of access to support systems, to social services, et cetera, um, has really eroded that. So I do think our public health system, this is a public health issue, right. um, as far as I can see, and I think our public health system needs to be strengthened around these issues to be able to provide social services, et cetera. And then I also think in terms of, when you look at our society as a whole, in terms of structure, I think we have to go back as early on because this is, a lot of this can also be learned behavior. So we talk a lot about what was happening when people were locked in in terms of between the adults, but the reality is you have kids who were witnessing and listening to that and therefore the psychological harm caused there is also an issue. So as we bring people back out, especially as they come into our campuses, we really have to beef up our uh, psychological counseling services as well mm -hmm. to make sure that people have an opportunity to hear what they've seen and heard and uh, to talk about how that may impact them, to make sure that they don't repeat the behavior or they don't normalize the behavior because I think a lot of um, that normalization is a concern. And so the, marginal commu the marginalized communities um, I think it's a bigger systemic issue that has to be addressed. Our, our concern about systemic racism has been elevated, and therefore when we look at those resources, we need to do that. But I, I will say that the most important thing I think about this at the end of the day, regardless of who is being impacted, is that we're here to amplify each other's humanity. And I think in a lot of ways, when we discuss this issue in the past, we've discussed it from the perspective of respecting each other's humanity, which means that as long as it's happening in your house and not mine, I'm doing my job. And I think that that's a, that, that's a missed opportunity. I hope that all of us in our society every day would recognize that we have an opportunity to amplify each other's humanity. And like I said, it takes sometimes the simplest of interventions um, on a daily basis for us to commit to how we do that. And we see it throughout, right? We, you just spoke about the fact that there's some that are more vulnerable but there's other behavior that mirrors that. So whether somebody's participating in road rage or you see somebody at a department store in the grocery um, carrying on about a mask, to me, all of those are warning signs for how people use their physical power and their um, anger and rage um, in the wrong way. And we have to keep making sure that we speak against that and that we also provide people with opportunities. And the last thing I'll say on safe spaces um, and I say this on campus, it's not always uh, probably the most popular thing to say, but I do feel strongly about it. When we talk about safe spaces, we must be careful that we don't talk about safe spaces in a way that means that the rest of the space can be unsafe. Mm -hmm. And I try to tell people we want to create a safe space here on campus, so that doesn't mean that once you cross Georgia Avenue, um, mm -hmm. it's okay for somebody to be unsafe. <laughs> so we're not retreating to safe spaces, but what we're trying to do is to build out our safe spaces so that our entire society is seen as a safe space. Wow. Mm. Wonderful. I love that about amplifying our common yeah. humanity, right? Yeah. And really recognizing yeah. that solidarity with one another, how interconnected at the end of the day we all are, right? And what impacts one impacts others and the ways in which we can really build this out in society. Because you're right, we're talking today about military academies, college campuses, universities, institutions, but at the end of the day, it's all of society that's impacted. And it's creating an environment where everyone can thrive, right? When, when we yeah. amplify everyone's humanity and center it on that respect. So I think it's a great way that all of these initiatives can continue advancing these yeah, larger yeah. social transformation goals. That's right. If, if a student comes yeah. here and, and we do right by the student in terms of the environment, but they go home for, you know, the holidays and they're in an environment that they're witnessing domestic violence, et cetera, the problem isn't solved. Yeah. You know, and that's one of the things we've been looking at, too, in, in developing this national action plan is really taking that life course approach and, to your point, recognizing the impact of young people who witness violence or experience violence, right, in the ways that later may 
manifest itself in other ways? And what, how do we go upstream also to do a lot more with that prevention, that education, that support mm -hmm. for young people who are impacted by that? Um, and I think, you know, even something like the ACEs, right, the Adverse Childhood Experience Scores, I think have really helped people recognize that, to your point, it's not just when people get to a college campus that we have to start focusing on how to address these issues, but right. more upstream. And I'm wondering if any of you have, you know, any recommendations around ways you feel that more of that work, even in the K-12 space or in hospital settings or in other settings, working with families and communities that we can do more to sort of take that, that life course approach. Well, it's a, it's a real challenge, and you know, in the military, for as long as I can remember, you know, we were able to obviously, like most of us, were able to have some control or influence over the space that we're responsible for, right? Whether it's the university, whether it's a, a ship or a naval base or something. But what happens after they cross the threshold and go home? You know, domestic violence, uh, violence against children. Those are things that are, are challenging to, to have greater influence over if you're not physically there to watch it, to control it, and so forth. And so that's why I think education is just so very important. And we haven't talked a lot about accountability, but accountability is also very important as well. When destructive behaviors do occur, we need to hold individuals accountable for that in ways that are responsible, but also demonstrates that you know leaders have to make a difference and they can't just ignore things when they happen. That's very important. So that's you know, and one of the things that we have we have a, a campaign called "I Am Not Invisible," which allows those who have who are survivors to tell their stories, mm -hmm. to create a safe space and environment where they can say, "This is what yeah. has happened to me." They can be advocates for mm -hmm. change for how to deal with these circumstances. But certainly when others see you sharing your story, recognizing the challenges that you've gone through, they may have gone through similar challenges. Right. They feel empowered to be able to talk about these issues in environments where they otherwise may not have been willing to talk about. Fantastic. Were you, you gonna know, add something uh, yeah, to that? A yeah, a few years ago, uh, one of our student trustees um, who is openly gay, came to me to start what's called the Lavender Fund and to have a, a ball, as it were, around um, the activity of homecoming, which is extremely popular on our campus. Mm -hmm. And I almost flippantly said, sure, I'd be happy to support. And um, to double down on that, my wife and I will match you know, any money that you raise. Mm -hmm. um, I attended the very first one, and I got there, and I was shocked. I met an um, alum from the 70s who graduated who was stunned, one, that we would have such an event on campus, and two, uh, that the president would attend. And so that said something to me. It said that despite the fact that our DNA is social justice, the reality is that that's not what we were living for everyone in our community. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it, I think it's also important for us to be self-aware. Sometimes it's difficult for us to admit where we probably have come up short, but I think we have to also um, have that self-awareness and, and examine, examine those um, issues. You know, when I meet with the students in that community, um, I'm listening. 90% of the meeting is me just listening because I need to be educated about what they're thinking, what they do, you know, how they feel about it. And again, that represents also a generational difference. My 15-year-old and 17-year-old are a lot more educated, I think, um, about these issues. And so I think that's the other thing that's very, very important, mm -hmm. that self-awareness from leadership, but also from administrators who want to do the right thing, but we can't be prescriptive in these circumstances. I think we have to take guidance. Wonderful. Well, that's a wonderful message also mm -hmm. to lift up. I love the campaign you mentioned because I think really this movement, this work has been led by survivors, right? Survivors mm -hmm. who aren't going to be invisible, who are willing to step forward and really work with society to, to address this. And you know, sometimes we focus so much on risk factors, but how do we focus on those protective factors, the leadership of those who are survivors and of all who are you know, willing to be a part of expanding our solutions and our commitment. So this has been a wonderful dialogue. I thank yeah. you all so much. I thank all of you who have joined us virtually and all who will continue to participate in this event today. And I'm just excited to continue all of us together to advance these goals. And before we wrap up, we're going to now turn to what's known as the white ribbon ceremony, mm -hmm. right? Because it's exactly what we all have been talking about today. Everyone has an important role to play in this. And so this is an opportunity to take that pledge and to amplify our commitment to that. So I'll turn to you now, uh, Deputy Secretary Remy, to lead us through that. Well, thank you very much. And it's terrific to be here and to have this conversation. I'll just note that um, any time that we have 
uh, new staff member come into the VA, they take a white ribbon pledge. And the white ribbon pledge is, is our commitment to providing the safe space that we've talked about mm -hmm. to the prevention uh, of sexual harassment and sexual assault. And so it's a terrific part, no matter your level, uh, no matter your role, you raise your hand and you commit uh, to this pledge. And it's something that we've developed together with the National Association of Social Workers. And so what I'd like for us to do here today mm -hmm. is to take the White Ribbon Pledge, to raise our hands and, and to take <laughs> this pledge together uh, as a team, recognizing and respecting the conversation that we've had here Wonderful. today. So um, I don't know if we, have to, if we can stand or not. Um, if, OK. So? If, uh, um, I guess we, we can stand and, and, and raise our hands, and I will lead us Hopefully all. Hopefully those pledge. joining us virtually will do the same wherever they are. Um, and, and again, if, if, if we can do this together, it would be, it would be great. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure where I'm looking. At, over here. Oh, over there? Thank you very, very much. It's our, our dedication to this. And, and, um, and so I, Donald Remy. I, I Rosie Delgo. Promise to never tolerate, commit, excuse, or stay silent about sexual harassment. I should never I promise never to commit, commit excuse, excuse, or stay, stay silent, silent about, about sexual, sexual harassment. harassment, sexual assault, or domestic violence. Sexual, sexual assault, assault or, or domestic, domestic violence. violence. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Well, it's been a real pleasure. Yeah. Just so Thank appreciate you. this Thank opportunity you. and all your leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Secretary so much. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very Secretary. much. Good to have you. Thank you. Appreciate you. Oh, are we taking pictures? Thank you all for joining us for this session. Um, just wanted to say thank you all for taking and doing that pledge. I also did the same as I know that, um, that this is a really, really near and dear uh, topic to my heart and doing that pledge to never stay silent is, is, is so important. Um, we want to thank you guys for joining us for this uh, first session for this morning. Um, if you would like to uh, take the pledge again, the link is in the chat. And so you guys can commit to that um, and join those across the country that are doing the same. Um, for, uh, for this first morning session, uh, there is going to be a link sent out in an email. And for this morning session, if you have attended, uh, the code word is going to be Apple. So we're gonna send out the link in the emails and at the end of this, uh, at the end of today. So we don't have to do it you know, every single time, but please take note and write down the, the and write down the, the code word for this morning session please uh, write down the word is Apple. You will be getting uh, credits and, and certificates after this for each session. So this is an all day session and there's multiple sessions. So for each session that you attend, we are going to have uh, this indicator to so show which session you actually listened to and were a part of. Uh, for those that have stepped away uh, to use the restroom, we're going to take a few minutes uh, break and then we're going to have our next speaker up, Vice Admiral Sean Buck from the US Naval Academy. So please, Please write down this word, Apple. I will show it again in, a, in, a, in one more minute before the, the next speaker comes up. And please make sure that you, you guys um, are write this word down and take the pledge that's in the link. Thank you so much. One, two, three. Hear you loud and clear.
Hello and uh, good day, everybody. One more time. Uh, we're going to be moving into this next part of your session. So if you attended the first session, again, the code word is Apple. We're going to be sending out a link at the end of the event so that you guys can register which sessions you all attended. Um, so I wanted to say good day. Uh, my name is Ashley Floyd, and I'm going to be the MC for the remainder of this event. And uh, if you're going to continue to request the credits, again, wait till the end. We're going to send put a link at the end, but we will also send it to your email so that you guys will have it to be able to put that in. I do want to make a public acknowledgement and recognition for um, the failure to get our closed captioning service. Uh, we've tried to request and, and get this in, and we were unable to get it to today. A YouTube link will be recording this, and we'll have it after. So if you if you do have a chance to go back and listen to the sessions and uh, get the markers to indicate that you listen to the session, the closed captioning will be there. We apologize. We apologize. We definitely did take um, note to do this in the beginning because we are trying to uh, make sure that at every single event like this, uh, Department of Defense wide, we are making sure that we have closed captioning available. So I wanted to just take a uh, time to recognize it and apologize to the audience and um, just technical difficulties. We did request it um, and it just fell through this morning. And so uh, we do apologize and, and, and for that. Um, please note the code word. And um, so now we will be hearing from Vice Admiral Sean Buck. He is the superintendent of the U.S. Naval Academy. And I see that he's joined on. So I welcome, um, welcome Admiral Buck. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good day, everybody. I'm honored to join you from the United States Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland, to take part in a series of important conversations around a subject that affects each and every one of us on our campuses. As a leader of an undergraduate institution, I look forward to this event each year and the range of perspectives and expertise it brings together to try to tackle the issue of sexual assault and harassment in an effective and holistic manner. My intent today as I talk with you is to ignite dialogue on how institutions of higher education can lean forward in addressing and preventing sexual violence through programs that address campus culture. My work with sexual assault and prevention, harassment response and prevention efforts began long before I put on my hat as the superintendent of the Naval Academy. During the period from 2013 to 2014, I served as the Navy's sexual assault prevention and response officer. In that role, I visited bases around the world, held candid discussions with sailors of all ranks. But I also visited universities across the United States to see what you all were doing on your campuses and share observations and best practices. I've long seen this as a challenge that we can face best together, given we are both educating and developing young adults in the military and on our campuses. I learned that if we we're gonna get better with prevention and ensure survivors felt comfortable seeking resources, we needed to get real that sexual assault is an overarching cultural issue and not a series of isolated incidents. At the time, I used to say to the leaders uh, and the commands that I interacted with, sexual assault and harassment are fleet issues that require a fleet solution. I believe we can apply this framework to college campuses and the students under our charge. Now at the Naval Academy, I tell my team, sexual assault and harassment are brigade problems that require a brigade solution. So what does that mean? First, leadership must set conditions for success. Leaders have a responsibility to set the cultural tone on our campuses and the conditions for success of any sexual assault prevention and response effort. We need to do this through our words and our actions. They must reflect the culture that we're trying to cultivate. We need to demonstrate with how we staff and resource prevention and response initiatives that we take this seriously. But to be successful and enduring, cultural change needs to come from within the student body. Sexual assault and harassment is a student problem that requires a student solution on campus. Sexual assault and harassment are cultural issues that our student bodies must own the solutions to in order for them to work. 
We need to empower our students to recognize destructive behaviors and intervene as bystanders when they see something that is not right, especially in the spaces where we administrators, faculty, coaches, and staff members are not present at all hours of the day. This can be incredibly challenging for young people to do, especially when they care what their peers think of them, are seeking to make friends, and they need to feel included. Furthermore, there are many unspoken power dynamics where some may feel more comfortable speaking up than others. We need to recognize those and also model what right looks like in these uncomfortable situations. Every single one of us has experienced peer pressure. And as we all know, peer pressure is one of the most potent forces for good and for evil in this world, no matter what age you are. So the key challenge and opportunity we face as leaders can be summed up in the question, how do we change the culture on our campus so that peer pressure can be leveraged for good? While the Naval Academy and our sister service academies are unique environments compared to civilian colleges, we all face many similar cultural challenges. I'm gonna discuss two areas today where I think we're making headway with programs or initiatives on our campus that I think can translate well to other college campuses. First, we're identifying key influencers of campus culture. In today's culture, we hear the word influencer a lot in the news or on social media. Last year, the Department of Defense's Office of People Analytics conducted an academy climate and networking survey to determine who are the key influencers were within our student bodies at all three military service academies. They then conducted smaller follow-on focus groups with the 60 students identified by their peers as key influencers. The survey and groups honed in on how midshipmen best receive cultural messaging and through what means. They also examined what social norms existed on campus and how well the participants adhered to those norms and how well their peers did. Across the board, when it came to positive norms, such as confronting programmatic language or discouraging destructive behaviors, students had higher expectations of behavior than they practiced or observed in their peers. For example, 90% of the respondents indicated that they expected others to confront sexist behavior. However, a disappointing only 65% of respondents indicated that they did this in practice themselves and only 58% of their peers did. Furthermore, students thought more highly of their peers who modeled positive behavior in accordance with these norms. This provides an opportunity to focus interventions on skill building to help students align their actions with the positive norms that they identify on the campus. It also allowed us to identify which positive norms were accepted by our student body and which ones we need to work on. This to me was a really novel idea to approach campus culture from a social networking standpoint and learn how cultural messages permeate an institution. It also allowed us to identify what positive norms exist already and could be capitalized on to improve peer-to-peer -peer behavior. The natural follow on to this in my mind is ask those influencers to help get positive messaging out to the student body and change the culture around topics like sexual assault and harassment and normalize conversations about these topics. This is where we're heading next with this concept at the US Naval Academy. Second, we're lowering the barrier for students to receive help and information by leveraging trained student ambassadors. Our Sapper and Sexual Harassment Guide program was designed to lower the barrier for midshipmen to seek resources for sexual assault or harassment, and to also ensure peer leaders were present in many facets of midshipmen life who would model what right looks like in challenging peer-to-peer -peer situations. In this case, GUIDE stands for Guidance, Understanding, Information, Direction, and Education. 
The Naval Academy Guide Program is made up of 60 volunteer students on a campus of about 4,500 students who undergo specialized two week long training to be sensitive and capable sapper and sexual harassment prevention allies and provide outreach and education in the spaces where midshipmen live, eat and recreate. The selection for this program is rigorous. Guides submit an application essay along with recommendations from staff members and they participate in an oral interview. The guides are spread out across our dormitory spaces so that every midshipman should know and have access to a trusted and discreet resource should they require help or guidance 24 hours a day. Our guide peer-to-peer -peer outreach and support program creates a very low barrier for individuals to begin the process of receiving care and resources for those who might be wary of reaching out to official resources on campus or confused about the official process. We also ensure our guides represent a cross-section of our student body, including gender identification, race and ethnicity, sexual orientation, athletic and extracurricular participation, and other characteristics, so that members of the brigade can find a guide that they feel comfortable approaching. Additionally, our guides are very visible examples of individuals within the midshipman social ecosystem that have dedicated themselves to taking the issue of sexual assault and harassment seriously and demonstrating what right looks like. We saw in the Academy Climate and Networking Survey what right looks like. We also saw what our students identify as positive norms. But often, as I said a moment ago, they don't seem to wanna to live up to those norms or expectations themselves due to peer pressure. There are many close knit, mutually influencing cohorts or communities on both civilian and military campuses from sports teams to dormitories or houses to extracurricular activities where having trained and available student ambassadors could make a difference between someone coming forward for resources or trying to manage what they're going through alone. It also could be the difference between having a trained educator step in and correct troublesome behavior informally on the spot and demonstrate peer leadership through bystander intervention. Ladies and gentlemen, my colleagues, these are just two examples that I hope can ignite dialogue across our campuses and our communities represented here today in this convention so that we can continue to share ideas and learn from one another in order to change our campus cultures for the better. As institutions of higher learning, we're educating and developing young adults into leaders in their communities and for our nation. Part of our responsibility is to give them the guidance, the tools and the space to develop creative solutions to tackle destructive behaviors in our society and within their peer groups in order to create lasting change on these issues. This leads us into an incredibly important panel on an emerging challenge which is closely tied to campus culture that we must be working closely with our student bodies to address, cyber harassment. Our students on this next panel who represent military and civilian colleges will share with us the nature of online harassment and provide tangible tools for addressing and mitigating these behaviors. I look forward to their insights. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Vice Admiral Buck. Um, if you all have attended this session, um, please take a note of this on the screen. It's a carrot. So at the end of this event, and as well as in the email, we will be sending, sending out a link so that you can show that you have been a part of these different sessions. So yes, again, thank you so much, Vice Admiral Buck, for your amazing remarks. Our next session is on an area that Ms. Hidalgo had highlighted as a critical challenge for so many organizations for cyber, for cyber um, harassment. We're excited today to have a, verse, a diverse group of students. And as they come on uh, camera, from, these are from public universities and service ac um, academies. Leading in this session is Dr. Dana 
uh, Cabot Farr, who has done extensive research on workplace mistreatment, including negative behaviors in a, in a remote setting. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Farr. So can you hear me okay? Yes, you can. Okay, awesome. So thank you so much for that introduction and welcome to our session on student perspectives on tackling cyber harassment. Often when we think about harassment, what comes to mind are face-to-face -face interactions from taunting comments to disrespect in the classroom. However, the drastic shift from COVID to online learning and now the continued reliance on technology for professional and educational events, such as panels like this and class sessions, really opens the possibility for new forms of harassing behaviors. And these new forms are also able to take place in new spaces. I've been able to meet with our panelists ahead of today, and there's already so much that I have learned from them. Throughout our panel, I also want to draw your attention to the ways in which these cyber experiences of harassment likely mirror patterns of in-person harassment by people who have social power against those who have less social power. This means that harassment often takes place along lines of social identity, like gender, race, sexual orientation, or immigrant status, among others. And existing research finds that harassment is experienced at higher rates by students with marginalized identities, as well as at their intersections of multiple identities. So for example, a black female student may experience more harassment than their black male or white female counterparts. These disrespectful and demeaning disruptive behaviors are experienced as forms of exclusion that maintain the status quo. This is important to highlight as harassment erodes organizational efforts to and mission to diversify and promote cultures of inclusion and respect. Today's session will cover broadly cyber harassment, and that can include harassment based on social identities. So racial harassment, sexual harassment, gender harassment, and so on. Our panel today will discuss these new frontiers in harassment experiences. And through the discussion, our student panelists will highlight how countering harassment will require new ways to address, investigate, and support victims of cyber harassment. For today's session, I'll be moderating a series of questions so that we can hear from students who are tackling issues of harassment in their own institutions and academies, and also from students who are conducting research on ways to counteract and intervene in harassment. So with this, I'd like to start off by having our panelists introduce themselves. So you can um, come on camera and off mic if you haven't already. So welcome, everybody. Uh, let's start with midshipman uh, Blaisdell Vera. Hi, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. You good? Okay. Hi, thanks so much for attending. Um, my name is Blaisdell Vera, and I'm a senior at the United States Naval Academy. I'm originally from Austin, Texas. I'm a cyber major here and a French minor. Um, during my time here, I've worked as a sapper guide, um, which is the student ambassador program that the superintendent just spoke of, and in positions involving alcohol and drug education and health and safety. And I run an extracurricular program here called The Profession, where we work with the Naval Institute um, to publish opinion pieces on topics like we're going to discuss today. Great. Thank you so much. And Cadet Jen Bana. Hi, good morning. Thanks for having me. Um, I am cadet second class Jennifer Bonna. I'm from squadron 18. I am a systems major and a human factor with a human factors emphasis. I am a I am the cadet uh, wing deputy commander for the tail rope program, which is super exciting, which is our equivalent to the peer guide program that they have over at the Navy. Um, and I'm super excited to talk to you guys today. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Anna Morrison. Hi, my name is Anna Morrison. I am a senior psychological sciences major at the University of Connecticut. I'm currently working on my honors thesis, which focuses on sexual harassment and bystander intervention in the workplace. And after graduation, I'll be working in human resources. Wonderful. And Mr. Khalif Matelis. 
Hello, good morning, everyone. My name is Kalish Matellis. My pronouns are he, him, his. Um, I graduated from SUNY College at Westbury, spring of 2021. My major was politics, economics, and law. I just got accepted to SUNY U Albany to start my master's in public administration this summer. Um, I currently hold the title Student Advocate Fellow for the State University of New York SUNY system, which oversees over 64 SUNY campuses in New York State, which I'm charged with um, being uh, uh, Oh so I serve on the chancellor's leadership team. So I'm an advisor to the chancellor and I help push different student driven policies and initiatives to enhance the student college experience. Excellent, thank you. And Ms. Julia Ciarello Fernandez de Moral. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to participate in this panel. I am Julia Ciarello Fernandez de Moral. She heard her pronouns, a senior in energy engineering at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis. I am an international student from Spain and I serve as the current president of the undergraduate student government at my campus and as a chair of all student governments in the Indiana University system. Last year, I was the chair uh, of the It's On Us chapter at our campus, uh, which is a movement among universities to combat sexual assault. And this year, I have been working towards pushing for initiatives related to prevention as part of student government. I look forward to today's conversation. Thank you for having me. Wonderful. What a great panel that we have here today uh, to share their knowledge and experience with us. And so when we talk about cyber harassment, it's important to have a sense of what exactly we mean by that. So perhaps that's where we can start by hearing from each of you examples of things that you have heard about or witnessed that you would consider cyber harassment. And so I'll turn it to Cadet Bana first. Thank you, ma'am. So at the United States Air Force Academy, cyber harassment is part of our commissioning education. So in our cadet standards and duties document, it outlines all the thing, all the rules that we have to follow as cadets. And cyber harassment is a huge emphasis item, not only for the cadet wing, but for permanent party leadership as well. We have about a page and a half of this document strictly dedicated to what cyber harassment is, what comes, what comes from if you do it, how to avoid it, and how to recognize it. We have had some run-ins um, in the past with cyber harassment, and with every incident that we have, it is addressed immediately by permanent party, and we reference that document or we add to it. This is just to keep us um, kind of updated with the culture and the changing of times um, with social media and just new apps and new platforms to, that people use to express themselves, but also use to put, sometimes put other people down. Um, one of the biggest things that the Academy emphasizes on is the use of the app Yodel. And I know that Midshipman D. Oliveira can speak to this as well, so I won't cover it too much because I know she'll do a good job. Um, Yodel is a app that cadets, really anyone from any university can use and post anonymously so that anyone else that has the app can see. Um, this, this app was created um, just to give a platform for cadets to speak out against things that they kind of didn't disagree with, um, just because we don't really have that um, because of the nature of the academy that we're in. Um, it was, it usually is used for good things and just letting people get their voice out and know that they're supported by others, but sometimes it could be taken a step too far um, with sometimes racial slurs or just people calling out other people's names. Uh, this isn't usually, it's not like a common occurrence, but it does happen and it is uh, addressed immediately. Great, thank you for that. And Ms. Shipman de Oliveira, do you wanna talk a little bit more about Yodel and other examples? Absolutely, ma'am. Uh, Cadet Bonnet did a great job already, but um, Yodel and Yik Yak too are really good examples of why anonymity can be so dangerous and hard to counter. I think I would say think of Twitter, um, except everyone, everyone's anonymous. And so they can say exactly whatever they want and it's primarily based on location. And like Cadet Bonnet already said, it, it's very helpful a lot of the time you can ask people for help on homework, you can ask people what are going, what's, what, what's going on on campus or what uniform to wear to what event. Um, but at the same time, if there's bad things being talked about, it's di very difficult to track. I've heard about Yik Yak some, from some of my friends at um, UMD, but in, it's virtually the same as Yodel, um, but Yodel is primarily used by the service academies I've noticed. 
Um, and you can identify people simply by using their initials in their class year because we have such small schools. So for example, if you were talking about me on Yodel, you would say BD22, so like the initials in the class year, um, which can be really dangerous depending on what the comment is saying and what the intent is. Um, so you'll see sometimes on these platforms during heightened political tension, there can be racist or threatening comments directed at people specifically. Um, there have also been situations of sexual and gender harassment, either like slut shaming or very general comments about women at the academy that are just not supportive and you're reading this and it makes you feel very negative. Um, and these kinds of people that would use these platforms are the kind of people who would never say something like that out loud. They are cowards who use the anonymity in order to communicate how they feel, but they still do pose a real threat, which is why it's so important to talk about. Okay, great. Thanks for that. And Khalif? Oh, so I'm just learning about Yik Yak and Jodo. Um, yeah. So something to add, um, what I see across the different SUNY campuses is called doxing. And the definition of doxing is when a person publishes private or identifying information about a particular individual on the internet, typically with the malicious intent. So I could give you two examples. Um, say I create a fake social media account and I have private information about one person on the panel and I post it out to the public. The public now sees it and the public can take the information and create memes or bully the person or attack the person. And the person who's behind the intent, nobody can um, um, know who that person is. I mean, another incident would be, say a person got um, a conduct case for not wearing a mask on campus and they end up getting expelled and they went through the student conduct process. Basically, if the student posts the conduct case, you know, on social media, it exposes the student's personal information and the um, conduct team's personal information that use utilized to um, expel the student. And that information is now public and it opens up the doors for a lot of people to comment and give their perspective, which some people might be for the student not wearing a mask, as we see in today's society, and some students would attack the student for not wearing a mask, and there could be attacks on administration as well. So that's what doxing is, and that's what I see on some SUNY campuses. Okay, great. That's a really, you know, important example, and it's it shows how cyber harassment can kind of escalate and, and elevate the the you know, the extent of the impact into students' personal, professional. And so once it's on social media, then your social network, uh, you know, becomes aware of these issues as well. And so it really can cascade and, and get, um, you know, out of control faster than, say, folks that are, are used to kind of handling or intervening in-person experiences of harassment. When it's cyber-related and it's on social media, it can really, um, you know, burn through the networks. So... Thanks for that example. Let's hear now from Julia. Yeah, so I wanted to bring light into um, just two topics. One is related to dating apps and the other one within messaging apps. So some of these dating apps include Tinder, Tumblr, and so many other apps that you might have heard of. And uh, something that we have been seeing at our university is that there's fake profiles being created to try to impersonate other students, uh, which is definitely not allowed and it does affect a lot of our students. Another case is that sometimes uh, students meet others through these dating apps and they try to meet virtually, but then whenever they start meeting in person, sexual assault uh, end up happening. Um, so we have had some of those issues. And then in terms of some of the messaging apps, uh, such as Snapchat or Instagram, these apps let you private message different people without, uh, sometimes you are able to send this type of request without having, like being friends, you know, like how in Facebook that works. Uh, so some of what we have been noticing is that there's uh, people that use these platforms to threaten to publicly post personal information or private and explicit pictures as well. Uh, another case is that we're seeing students that are receiving unpleasant uh, pictures very frequently and in large volumes. And it's something that at this point, it has been even normalized and it's a very inappropriate behavior that we're seeing. And then this last um, instance that I wanted to bring up is that sometimes we have issues with retaliation situations. So if a student is experiencing sexual assault and is going through the process of reporting uh, and there's an investigation that is taking place, uh, we have seen cases of victim blaming and threatened um, people threatening this student through this type of social media as well, this investigation is going on. Uh, so these are some of the cases that we have been seeing at our campus. 
Thanks so much for sharing that. And I think it's really important as we're hearing about the ways that dating apps and social media are forums where students experience harassment. It's important to keep in mind that research shows that harassment is very rarely about obtaining sexual access or to establish a romantic relationship. So harassment is about power, status, and dominance. What's challenging as you're hearing about here is that on the internet, cyber forms of harassment um, there's much more possibility for anonymous comments, fake profiles, and things like that. So instigators are feeling emboldened and actually hide behind the anonymity. But now I want to turn it over to, to Anna to hear about a few more examples. Thank you. Yeah, so during online classes over the past two years, there have been outside users who join classes solely to disrupt the class, but there are also fellow students who intentionally try to make others uncomfortable by sending inappropriate private messages either to one classmate or to multiple classmates in order to watch their reaction to the message on camera. And additionally, since perpetrators can often see glimpses into students' homes or their home lives, they're able to misuse that information in a way that makes students uncomfortable. So there's really that added layer of vulnerability that comes with online classes where students' privacies can be invaded. Those are all great examples. And I think as we're hearing about these different kinds of examples of cyber harassment, it's apparent that universities and organizational policies and processes might not be able to keep up or maybe haven't yet caught up with the different ways that harassment can manifest and use these different forums, social media app, apps, platforms um, to change the way that harassment is being perpetrated as well as experienced. So I'm gonna turn uh, now back again to the panel to ask what recommendations would you have for helping faculty, staff and leadership become more digitally literate? Because I know I've learned a lot with uh, my conversations with you all. How do we keep up and learn about these different apps and forums that are out there? So let's start first with Anna. Yeah, so since cyber harassment is evolving with the development of new social media and technology, such as Yik Yak and Tinder, which we've been talking about, upward learning can be a really useful tool for faculty and staff to learn from the student workers and volunteers that they're already working with in their respective spaces and their resource centers. And this also helps to ensure that survivors don't have to explain or justify their harassment experience when they're reporting, as the student advocates will regularly be educating faculty and staff for them. That's such an important point, Anna, the fact that we don't want people that might be considering reporting or seeking out help to have to somehow educate those that are there to support them, but might not know what Yodel is or the different functions and ways in which Tinder can be abused or used to harass others. So those are great points. Um, Julia, why don't you take it next? Yeah, I have a couple of ideas. So in terms of uh, faculty and staff, uh, maybe we can have some faculty and staff reach out to student government or student organizations that are focused on sexual assault prevention. And they could just have like a meeting once a year or a semester to just get updated on some of these terms and some of these apps and what is going around within students groups. And another option would be to even invite those student groups to speak at a faculty council meeting or a staff council meeting and then and they are able to provide that update uh, to that consi those constituents. And then maybe perhaps they can just share those slides and the message to all the faculty and staff that were unable to attend via a newsletter or through a, uh, like a university-wide email. Okay, wonderful. Great so much. And so, uh, Khalif, do you want to uh, add anything? Yes, ma'am. So I know some apps, well, majority of apps have a support team. So I was thinking the staff from a campus or like the president can do like a big meeting with the whole campus and reach out to the support, to support team of each app to have them come in and do quarterly trainings so that the staff is updated with the platforms and they'll um, be more aware of signs of harassment and bullying. Okay, great. These are all really good ideas. And I know I'll be taking notes and thinking about the ways in which we can enable learning at my university. Um, and it's really clear that leaders in our institutions need to be responsible for that self-learning to be aware of, you know, these different forms and ways that harassment is experienced 
as well as the spaces. And, and so a pre, in a previous panel, we heard about, you know, the kind of the lack of control or the lack of influence to maybe um, guard or think about people's experiences when they're not, say, at our physical university, our physical academy. Um, cyber harassment is that 24-7. And, you know, we don't have access to all of these different profiles and different people's chat rooms and things like that. And so really we need to open our minds um, to think about these different experiences that are that students are having that really have the potential to affect um, their personal lives as well as their, their uh, experiences with our educational institutions. All right, so let's continue on with another question. So what are some ways that institutions can support victims and enable reporting and justice when dealing with cyber harassment. I'll turn again to Khalif for, for your input. Yes, ma'am. So at SUNY System, we have a media and communications team, basically where we put out graphics, facts, statistics, create a social media toolkit and send out to all 64 campuses to get information out to the whole student body, which is over 385,000 students. Um, highlighting, we also highlight student experiences. So we'll pick a couple of students from different SUNYs and we'll highlight them. They do social media takeovers on our Twitters and social media accounts. Um, I know some campuses, they do anti-bullying and reporting programming on the campuses. And um, I would recommend to provide resources and examples of bullying at the start of a student's um, college experience at campus orientations. Okay, wonderful. And uh, Julia? Yeah, so one main thing is that we need to help change the culture on campus, especially about bystander in intervention and sharing reporting resources. So an example is like one of my professors actually takes the time to read through the syllabus and the anti-harassment policy to make sure that everyone in the class feels comfortable and knows that he is someone that you can reach out to if you need resources. And it just shows everyone that it's a behavior that is not tolerated and we might speak up if we see some of these behaviors from our classmates. And I would say that uh, on another end, cyber harassment is not really as clear in reporting websites in universities. Uh, so it would be useful to include examples on the website and share what information can even be used as proof. Uh, we have found that this information can sometimes be outdated and even misleading uh, on today's online society. Yes, I think that is definitely a, you know, a message that um, will ring loud and clear. If we all go back and you know, review our harassment policies that many of our institutions have, if we take a look at them, do they actually reflect the current experiences and ways in which harassment is perpetrated and experienced? Um, I think what you'll find is that we've got some work to do to think about the ways, the spheres, and the, the timelines also where, um, you know, students are experiencing this. It's in their class, but, you know, someone can ping them on even the course management website at all hours of the day. Um, so it really kind of um, has the ability to seep into all, you know, even times of that student's life. All right, wonderful. So next I'll turn it to Anna. Thank you. So a big reason why students don't always feel comfortable reporting is because when they look into their, how their universities have handled cases in the past, they may find that some survivors did not feel as though they received comprehensive justice. And those past survivors are a really big resource for the current survivors who are considering reporting or moving forward. Sharing one's harassment experience can seem violating and embarrassing. So students will be reluctant to share their experience if they're not confident in their university's response. So universities really need to have an established track record of taking cases seriously to strongly demonstrate their commitment to survivors. I think that's a great message, Anna. We know from the research on sexual harassment that the organization's tolerance or per, our perceptions of how tolerant or how responsive the organization is to these complaints, it's one of the strongest predictors of later sexual harassment experiences in the organization. So we need to be listening and importantly, making sure that there are consequences. Um, and so let's continue now and hear from Cadet Bana. Thank you, ma'am. Speaking to Anna's point, it, it is a problem when the institutions aren't being very clear with how they handle se or sexual assault, sexual harassment, cyber harassment, all those types of cases, and that's an issue. I think the Air Force Academy does a really good way 
at three different levels of showing how they support victims and enable reporting and justice when they're dealing with these types of harassment. From the, uh, the top level, from the Air Force, the Air Force supports victims in reporting and justice by posting court martials, which are just court, court trials, and putting the information out there of who the who the person is that's being prosecuted, why are they like what are the laws or the UCMJ articles that they are being um, put up for when the trial is anyone can attend what you're going to wear just it, it's very clear and very concise in that you can go on and you can attend any trial that you want to meaning that you, they're very open about what happens during the trial what are the results of the trial? They're not hiding anything. And so at the largest level at the Air Force, that's what they're doing to make it very clear of how they handle these type would handle with seriousness these types of cases. Uh, a step below that, our permanent party at the Air Force Academy, for example, we had a racial issue um, on the Yodel app a, a year or two ago. Our permanent party, our superintendent, our commandant, our dean took this matter extremely serious. They took the case to the inspector general, moved forward with the investigation and released their results and their response and attacked it immediately to show that, hey, this isn't okay. You guys are gonna be officers. You're supposed to lead, you're supposed to, we have you held at a higher standard. You need to own up to that standard. And that's kind of where they're stepping in for us and holding us accountable. And then on the next level, it's our level. So what can we do as cadets to help support each other, get rid of victim shaming, enable reporting, encourage people to get justice and give them the power back that was taken from them. We have what we call here is really a team of teams. We have our cadet wing teal ropes, which is um, the program that I'm a part of and that I'm heading. We have our cadet wing diversity and inclusion um, cadets. And then we also have our peer program cadets. They're all liaisons of different helping agencies that we have available to the cadet wing with uh, tail ropes being liaisons for SAPR, diversity and inclusion being liaisons for our equal opportunity office and our peers being representatives for our peak performance and mental health programs. These programs are embedded in the cadet wing. We have a total of six of these liaisons in each squadron at minimum, available 24 seven, right down the hall, open to helping people get the justice that they need at any time, any place and better than anyone else. Thank you, ma'am. Great, thanks for all of that information. And one thing that really struck me as we had a few conversations leading up to this panel is the transparency and the system of accountability that's happening at these, um, you know, the Naval Academy. And um, so thinking about how that would translate to civilian university life where we do have um, concerns about privacy and things like that. How do we kind of open up our, our um, system such that we can provide um, an indicator of the responsiveness of the seriousness that these um, the, the claims, the harassment uh, experiences are taken as well as an indicator of the consequences so that we can start to show people how responsive hopefully our our institutions are in um, uh, reducing or eliminating these types of behaviors. So with that, I'll turn now to Midshipman Dale Vera. Hi, everyone. I think, um, so what Cadet Vana just said about the open adjudications, or sorry, the open trials, we call them adjudications here. Um, I think that'd be really helpful. I just, I think the implementation of that, so the implementation that I've seen so far at the Academy is for something like a DUI or an alcohol related incident um, where it's meant to embarrass the person and like show everyone else, hey, you don't wanna be up here on the stage in front of these people. Um, but I think that in cases where there's open adjudications for something like sexual harassment or assault, the survivor should be able to decide if, it should, if it's going to be open because especially at a school this small, a lot of people know a lot of people and it's really difficult to keep things on the DL, especially if you're trying to, um, I guess, protect the survivor, right? Um, I think one of the big 
um, focuses has to be bridging the gap between the students and the adjudicating authority. So in our case, it would be our chain of command. Um, one of the most tangible ways I try to get people to focus on that is evidence collection. And so in like the cyber harassment realm, um, that would be some kind of paper trail. I'm talking about um, screenshots, screenshot everything always, especially if you get someone who adds you on Snapchat and they send you something you don't want, screenshot that, document everything, because especially in this day and age, it's so easy for things to disappear, just like it's easy for to track things, but it's also difficult to track things and it takes a lot of manpower and effort. And it's a lot easier to delete a message than to have someone in, who's investigating it later find that message again. Like, yes, it exists, but it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of effort. Um, I also take, I remind people during the trainings that we give that um, sending nude photos to people without them being asked first is sexual harassment and it is a crime because there are legitimately people who come to college thinking that that's an okay thing to do. Um, and it's honestly become a little bit commonplace, I think, in my generation. Um, if you if you talk to, I mean, I, I see um, Julia nodding, like it's, it's pretty common. Um, and uh, it's difficult to trace, especially if someone's using a, uh, I use this term terminology before, burner snap, and no one really knew what that meant, except for people in my age group. Um, but it's a, a Snapchat account that has no at, uh, attributing factors to the person's actual identifiable information. So that it would be like some fake name or no name at all, some weird username, it doesn't give location, it doesn't give age, it doesn't give anything that is identify about, identifiable about you. So when you go and try to say, like when they ask you and you go report it and you try to say, oh, um, I have no, I have zero information about who sent this to me except for what they sent me. It's really hard. It's a really hard starting point if you're trying to launch an investigation. Um, but I see people working really hard on like trying to solve this issue. Um, and it, it, it does start at the bottom level, which is why we have to like talk about this in the first place. Mm -hmm. That's that's great. And I know, you know, I've learned so much about, I guess, the burner snap, which you uh, have educated me on. And so um, it's really important to also think about the ways in which we've set up our reporting systems within our universities and our, and our academies that allow for or already understand this type of evidence that there's, you know, there are accounts that did once exist and no longer exist, but the, the actual evidence has been uh, screenshotted. Um, so we need to be thinking, um, you know, in up-to-date ways about the type of evidence that we're going to include in our various investigations. All right, let's continue with our questions. Um, so can you say more about what kinds of peer training and support you've been involved with and what have you found to be most effective about that? So let's start with Midshipman Dale Vera. So um, I was told not to go into too much detail about this, um, but it's difficult if you don't know the terminology. Um, so SAPR stands for Sexual Assault Prevention and Response, right? Um, and anyone under that umbrella of SAPR is responsible for the education and prevention on the student body side on the topics of sexual assault and harassment. Um, anyone in the program receives training every year for two weeks straight to eight hours a day. Um, and then we meet once a month. Um, and it's a very exhaustive education. It's like you're going home tired at the end of the day. Um, and under SAPR, there's two groups. There are the SHAPE peer educators um, and they teach classes to the brigade. And we have mandatory training as students here. Um, usually it's at least four times a year, but we have speakers come in. We had um, Ms. Rachel Den Hollander come in and talk to us about her story um, and just other things like that. And then we have um, the guides and guides are available for people to get in touch if they've faced sexual assault or harassment. Um, so for example, I'm a guide, um, I'm on the response side. Um, and the guides do training too, but it's a very, it's smaller level, it's around 40 people instead of like large classrooms of people. And guides are not the end point. We just listen to as much as people want us to hear and then direct them to the right resources and give them all of their options. We do training on uh, how to help a friend. So if people come to you and tell you what happened to them and your response is negative, they're less likely to go to others and seek out the help that they actually need. So it's super important that the first person that they encounter 
is supportive to them. So we do how to help a friend in order to teach everyone, here's how you respond if someone comes to you with their situation. We do a training called Bagels, um, where we cover healthy relationship basics with the freshmen and any of the upper class can come as well. And basically it's just covers if you know if your relationship is a healthy or an unhealthy one. And we work with One Love on that, which is a fantastic organization. We do basic trainings on Sapper and Simeo. Sapper covers sexual assault. Simeo covers an umbrella of harassment items, um, including like gender, sexual in nature, race, color, religion, sexual orientation, hazing, bullying, retaliation. So Simeo is the command management equal opportunity side and Sapper is the you've been assaulted, let's respond side. Um, and within Sapper, there's a ton of options. There's restricted reporting, unrestricted reporting and just no report at all. And for restricted, you can report and have access to every resource that you could want. But at the same time, it, no one finds out that you reported it. So you can tell every, you can tell them and have it documented, but have it stay a secret um, until um, you can use the CATCH program. Um, and the CATCH program basically compares different reports and tries to match uh, perpetrators. So if there is, let's say a serial offender, they're that much easier to catch. And from there, it, it's very, it's, it's honestly a very um, detailed process but it's very anonymous and very safe for the survivor. And I'm really grateful, honestly, especially after seeing how much structure we have in comparison to other colleges, like for how many options that we do have. Um, but every group's training. So we also have the peer diversity educators, for example, um, those cover like racism relating items. And so at the lowest level, if they see someone make a racist comment, they step in. Um, so it's, you're seeing like a bottom up help for the chain of command and lots of people who want to step in and provide and every group's training, like every single group that I just mentioned, which I know is a lot and I apologize, um, is really extensive and people can find a, a guide very easily, just like the, the teal ribbon kind of that I'm wearing or, um, what did you call it? Cadet Bana? The, the, the the teal rope. <laughs> the teal rope, yes, the rope, yeah. Um, and uh, we're lucky to have such in-depth system in the place where it's like super easy to find the people that you need. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, all that sounds great in terms of lots of education happening, being very forthcoming. Like it seems like it's a very visible kind of approach. And I think there's a lot of value in that. And the idea of restricted reporting where someone can make a detailed report have their experiences heard by the organization, and yet um, their identity is not um, revealed. And in some systems that I've seen similar to this, I'm not sure if it's the case in yours, but then basically that person would, you would just kind of hold off. But if you, the organization would let you know if other people had complaints against the same person. So you could go forward together um, to, to make a claim because that is something about, you know, coming forward with a, a complaint of sexual harassment, assault, um, and so on, that it can be very intimidating. And there's actually a lot of cost um, to, involved. And so if you're able to do that with someone else, um, you might feel more empowered. And so now to Cadet Bana. Thank you. Um, going, I'm just going to take it a little bit more broad because Midshipman Dill Vera kind of went into a lot of detail and we do a lot of the same things. Um, like I said, I'm part of the Teal Rope program here at the Academy. We, unlike guides, are not split into two different, um, two different education and prevention or we're not split into two different groups. Our mission set is to educate, encourage, and escort. So we have that response and prevention aspect in our jobs. There are a total of about 90 teal ropes, two per squadron, um, two per two on the group level, and then three at the wing level. Um, going off of this, like I mentioned before, we have the diversity and inclusion. Um, cadet program, we have the peer program, and we have the tail rope program. These are all programs embedded into the cadet wing to make coming forward more comfortable and just to get rid of that victim shaming and instead foster an environment of victim empowerment. And so what we're doing at this kind of peer level is that we are taking this responsibility on us. We're the ones that can change the way that the wing responds. We're the way that we, we change the environment 
because we are the environment. So our goal here is to give the options back to the person that wants to report. So if the survivor comes to me and they're like, hey, this happened, I'm going to stop you and say, hey, listen, we're not, um, I'm not confidential. Like, please, you can definitely tell me if you want to, but just letting you know, like, I won't share anything, but if I'm put up like court of law, I have to. From that point on, just letting the victim know everything, very, very clear, giving them the power to make the decision that they want to make and tell the story the way that they want to tell it. From this point, we at USAFA have a no closed door policy. This in the sense is it doesn't matter if this person comes to me, comes to a DNI cadet or diversity and inclusion cadet or comes to a peer cadet, we're gonna give you the best option. Just cause I'm a sapper liaison doesn't mean I'm gonna tell you to go to sapper. If you come to me with something about mental health, I'm gonna take you to the right person, even if it's not sapper. This no closed door policy really just opens up the options that people have to get help. And just kind of, like I said, takes away that victim shaming. You can go up to anyone that has a rope on. Uh, We have different colors for those different groups, but anyone that has a rope on and get the help that you need so we can start that healing process and give that power back to the victim that was taken from them in the first place. I think that's really powerful. So thanks so much for sharing that. And I think what I what I hear is happening is that the narrative is changing. And I think um, you know, researchers in the sexual harassment field have been challenging the notion that we should hold like formal reporting up to the highest levels of the organization as kind of the gold standard. Um, what we find in the research is, as I mentioned before, um, yes, that can be helpful that the organization knows about it, but in fact, there's a lot of cost for uh, the victim or the target that has experienced um, this harassment and that they might prefer um, some sort of peer level intervention. They might prefer a level of social support um, rather than a formal all the way to the top kind of investigatory process. Um, now we'll move to, to Anna. Thank you. So as I mentioned in my introduction, I've been working on my thesis, so I've really been able to dive into the literature and harassment generally or broadly is certainly not new. And specifically sexual harassment is a term that's been widely used since the 1970s, but harassment has definitely evolved over time. And so that can leave students wondering whether or not they have been harassed. And also acting as an ally in the cyber harassment space is trickier as there are less opportunities for bystanders to witness the harassment. But if you as a bystander do see or hear the harassment in real time, or if you're approached by a survivor after the harassment takes place, clearly stating that the behavior truly was harassment can go really far in helping to validate the survivor's feelings and empowering them to take further action. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, so the idea of really holding up the the idea that um, students can support each other And just acknowledging that you saw it and it was wrong can be can be powerful. So we're going to move now, um, jump ahead a little bit to to our to our next question, our final question. What are some obstacles to providing safe and sufficient supports for reporting? And I'm going to ask Julia to respond to this one. Yeah, definitely. So the main one is we need more professionals at universities. Uh, so just to give you an example, we have only had one person in the Interpersonal Violence Prevention Office, similar to Sabir, which has been mentioned before, for a, like 20,000 student campus. And there was only one person in charge of this office. And just now I heard that we are hiring two more individuals, which is great to hear, but I'm sure this is an issue that has been experienced in other campuses. Um, another thing that I wanted to bring up is that um, professionals need to be connected with students and they need to be updated with any words that need to be used. I know we have covered earlier, like how we can make sure that faculty, staff and leaders can connect with students to make sure they catch up with that information and to make sure that the websites are updated in terms of what can be used as proof and how a cyber harassment case can move forward. And then one last thing that again has been mentioned before, but I just wanted to uh, emphasize more on it, but follow 
talks uh, normally also delete some of this content whenever it happens. So like what uh, I can remember who were saying, uh, but like just taking screenshots every time uh, for cyber cases, like we need to make sure everything gets saved. And sometimes if it happens just once, it might not be enough information to move an investigation forward. So the more, um, proof that you have the better so that way it'll be easier to just go through that process great thanks for all that really good information and Khalif do you want to offer your insights yes ma'am I think an obstacle is having um, everyone take situations like this seriously when we look at today's society when it comes to students people celebrities etc people get bullied all the time and we don't take it serious um you see people posting jokes and memes on social media which we don't know how that makes another person feel and that's why certain people you know end up committing suicide and suicide rates are high so I think that when we we don't know what affects someone and how what we do or what we say affects someone. So I feel like when we take things more seriously, when it comes to situations like bullying and sexual assault, we need to take them serious. Because once we take them serious, it is set a tone for everyone else to take things seriously. And um, I think that can um, be a, uh, that's an obstacle. And I try to provide something different from the panelists. So that's what I have. Okay. Try not to take anybody's ideas. <laughs> All right, wonderful. Uh, Midshipman Dale Vera, we've got a couple minutes left here. Um, I just think it's important that you have that community. I, I've been navigating these issues since high school and the way that I thought about them during Catholic high school uh, was very, very different than how it was when I came to the academy. And I was astonished when I first showed up by the support that I received and that other people received um, by the program that we have here. There is a community here, especially among peers and the Sapper and Simeo offices, but the trend that I've noticed um, is that people are not interested in doing something about these issues um, until they are personally involved in these issues. Um, the people that are interested are already involved. The people who haven't become interested yet, it's because they haven't had to deal with something personal to them. Um, and that's why it's so important to talk about this because you don't want others to have to deal with something personal to them. That's the whole point of this, it's about prevention. Um, but if people aren't educating themselves and staying ahead, like how we're discussing this on the cyber area and how technology is, becoming a little bit more complicated, it becomes the survivor's responsibility to seek that help out. And we don't want them to ever have to feel like they have to do something, just what they want to do. Um, and so I guess like Vice Admiral Buck said earlier, it's it's the student problem that requires a student solution. And we're already well on our way, I think. Okay, wonderful. Thanks everyone for sharing your insights. And we are gonna turn it now to open it up for a question and answer. Um, so Jess, I think is monitoring questions. For yes. Okay. So we have one here and I apologize if this was already covered in some of the programs. Somebody asked, do you have information on the peer diversity program? Um, so I can take this. Yeah, that would be this. great. That would be great. Um, I'm sure it's the same thing at the Navy. Our peer diversity program is brand new for us this year. So it's our diversity and inclusion, and their job is to monitor and educate cadets on just making sure that there's racial equality, you know, like we said, making sure that no one's being targeted, race, sexual orientation, just anything um, that people would might be targeted on for these anonymous platforms. They're kind of our tiger team going after creating attacking like all of our programs, trying to find issues, trying to make sure that it really is an inclusive, that we're fostering an inclusive and equal environment for not only the cadet wing, but our permanent party and our Air Force too. Thank you so much, Cadet Banya. And the, the other question we've got is around um, resources and references and uh, I'm wondering if, if any of you have cyber harassment specific resources um, to share with folks after the session, or uh, I imagine, I, I know a lot of you have other more general resources that are, are really amazing um, that you're sharing on your campuses and or developing, but I'm wondering about anything cyber specific. I was gonna say for us, um, everything harassment related falls under our equal opportunity office. So anytime 
yeah, as well for, for Ms. Jim and De Oliveira, um, any type of harassment directly falls under our Equal Opportunity Office, which is separate from our sexual harass or sexual assault office. And so they handle all of those cases, get resources, get help, and start the investigation. Wonderful. Wonderful. The the last question, I know we've got a few minutes left. Um, what are your recommendations? You know, we talked through some recommendations on how do we help develop digital literacy. And I, I think I've shared with this panel previously that, uh, you know, I thought Netflix and chill was really people liking uh, Netflix and just hanging out. <laughs> Um, and I know we have some of the same challenges in terms of what we're using in, in social media and, and the many changes that are happening there. But I'm, I'm wondering if you had to give advice or a recommendation to your peers on how to address this issue, like what you could do personally, is there is there anything in particular you would recommend? And to, to give to give folks a little bit more context, you know, we, we've talked a lot about um, reporting throughout this session. So what are the different formal mechanisms that students can take when they experience cyber harassment? But are there some informal areas that students can explore to, to really, um, you know, confront or address these issues? Just any, any tips that the, the panel may have? Ma'am, I, um, I think the biggest thing is leave it, have a paper trail. So I always tell people to screenshot stuff. I know I mentioned it earlier, but it's, it's worth saying twice. Like if you already have the evidence, then no one's going to be debating what, like whether it actually happened. And it's super easy to collect that evidence if it's like over the phone. That's a great point. Thank you. Anything else from the other panelists? Anything um, in terms of you know, I don't want to say by center intervention, but anything when you see behaviors, anything that you've seen work well in terms of addressing those behaviors? I think something in terms of mindset is there can be different sorts of cultures and behaviors that may be normalized on one platform that wouldn't be normalized in real life. And so when you see interactions that look questionable online or you hear about them, I think thinking about, okay, if that happened in person, uh, kind of what would be my reaction. And oftentimes it's probably um, some sort of harassment issue and it should be taken seriously, even if it's online and it seems more casual or more harmless. Yeah, and to just quickly add into what Anna just mentioned, it's just like a lot of these type of behaviors and harassment um, have been just normalized uh, within our society and our communities, like in like universities and academies. So it's just about ensuring that everyone understands what bystander intervention is, what is tolerated and not on campus, because we need to have all of these folks like speaking up whenever they see something that is not appropriate, something that that is not like the mission statement of the university or the academy. I just making sure that everyone is supporting the survivors or just ensuring that these um, cases don't happen. That's such um, a great. Oh, if sorry, I can add, ahead. if you don't mind. <laughs> no, go for add, it. Um, we at the academy have what's called a wingman clause or our wingman policy. So this policy holds you accountable for not acting in the event that like, if, if you're there and someone gets sexual, sexually harassed or sexually assaulted and you don't do anything, you're also held accountable. The idea is that you have to be a wingman. It's kind of an Air Force thing, a wingman, but you are responsible for the actions of the people around you. If they, if they're a cadet and you see them doing something wrong, you have a responsibility to intervene. We don't just kind of say like, oh, like you should intervene. You like by us have to intervene or else you are also held responsible. So it just kind of puts that it's on you to change the environment. And if you see something, say something and do something. Thank you. All right, I think we've got time for one last comment. So I just wanted to add, um, so we have something called safe reporting where um, we, let's say that you're a freshman and here freshmen aren't allowed to drink at all, even if you're of age 
that year um, and something bad happens to you. You get sexually assaulted at a party, let's say. Um, and if you went and reported your sexual assault and wanted it to be an unrestricted report where there's an investigation launched and military protective order and all that stuff is available to you, you would also have to tell them that you were drinking underage because that's part of the evidence that's being collected and you would get adjudicated for drinking underage. But with safe reporting, you can say, hey, there was a situation where I drank underage and this happened to me and you don't get in trouble for the drinking. You're not going to get punished for coming forward about something that's already so difficult to come forward. And um, it hasn't been around really long enough for us to see like the improvements that have been made. But I know generally from the student body and their perception of the program, it's really helped in terms of, um, I guess, having faith in the program. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And, and with that, I'll turn it back to Dr. Cabot Farr to close us out. Yeah, so thank you so much for um, your attention throughout our panel. And I'd like to really extend a warm thank you to our panelists for sharing their experiences and so many of their insights. So we know that experiencing harassment in any form has negative effects. And to the extent that this happens online, organizations need to be ready to address it. By reducing cyber harassment and supporting those that experience it, organizations will be able to promote diversity and inclusion, as well as the health and the well being of their students. So, thank you again so much for your time, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the program. Thanks so much, everyone. And it looks like we are now on break until I think we circle back at. 10 after 12 Eastern time for some remarks from the Deputy Secretary of Defense. Thanks. Now, just to add, I'm pulling it up right now. Sorry, I'm working on two laptops. And uh, of course, as you all government folks know, government computers are usually a little lagging. Um, so thank you. Thank you for that session. Uh, oh, got a little issue. Thank you for that session. So one thing that I learned, I did not know that they have uh, like those programs that will help you track things on social media, because I do, I have experienced where something got hacked in my social media and got some very harassing, very scary emails that I, I reported to police because that's all I knew. That's all I knew what to do. So uh, having these other avenues that you can uh, reach out to is, is, is definitely um, very important. So to finish off this session, the code word for this session is orange. Orange is the code. And at the end, uh, as we stated before, if you've missed in the beginning, the codes of these fruits will be actually posted into a link sent out in an email after this event. And we will put post it at the end of this event. So please take a piece of pen and paper, write in your phones this note, the code for this session is orange so you can get credit for your certifications so after each session we will be posting these we are on a small break right now and when we come back we will have uh, special remarks um at 12 10 so i'll put up the slide for that Lead this up so please stretch your legs uh use the restroom get something to eat and then uh, return back with us at at 12 10 so thank you very much and thank you panelists um thank you this was an amazing discussion and really appreciate uh, having you all here and I uh, look forward to seeing you all back here in a few. Thanks.
Hello and welcome everyone back from break. I'm just going to let you know that we do have a video from the uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense, Ms. Uh, Dr. Kathy Hicks. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna play the video and I will let you all know now, it is going to be choppy because we were coming over bandwidth literally over the entire world. It's going to be choppy, but we are gonna drop a link, a safe link that you can go to and actually watch the video live during this time. So I'm gonna be playing the video right now that you'll see it. You'll hear, you're, you will hear really good audio, but you may not be able to see a really clear video. So again, um, I'm going to play this video, but it might be a little bit choppy for video wise. So if you'd like to view the video on your own, uh, my colleagues behind the scenes are going to drop the link in the chat and you guys will be able to watch the video on your own as well. So if you stay tuned in the next um, uh, 30 seconds, I'm going to get this video queued up. And then if you need to watch it again, the link will be in the chat. We will also send it in the email and we appreciate you for coming back. Thank you so much. Hello, I'm Deputy Secretary of Defense, Dr. Kathleen Hicks. It's great to be with you at the national discussion on sexual assault and sexual harassment. Thank you to the Department of Navy and Howard University for hosting today's event. Our military and higher education communities have much to learn from one another in preventing sexual assault and sexual harassment. Discussions like this benefit all of us. At the Department of Defense, Combating sexual assault and sexual harassment in the military is a high priority for Secretary Austin and me. Doing so not only ensures that our service members serve in a healthy organizational climate, which bolsters our readiness, but it is also the right thing to do. That is why last year, Secretary Austin established an independent review commission and charged it with developing recommendations on how to advance efforts to counter military sexual assault and harassment. This independent body of experts met with hundreds of individuals from all across the department and produced an evidence-based and comprehensive report that provided the secretary over 80 recommendations. We are now in the process of implementing all of the Independent Review Commission's recommendations, and we are developing metrics to track our progress in doing so. Some of our key areas of focus are reforming the military justice system, establishing a dedicated and specialized violence prevention workforce, and redesigning how we staff, resource, and professionalize the sexual assault response workforce. Let me highlight three areas of departmental action underway now to change culture and behavior. First, DOD aims to empower our service members with the knowledge, skills, and training to prevent, recognize, report, and respond to sexual harassment. Second, across the department, we are working hard to ensure healthy practices in our military workplaces. This means promoting inclusive environments across units and offices while targeting those risk factors and negative cultures that lead to sexual assault, harassment, and other readiness impacting behaviors. The department also recently released the 2021 on-site installation evaluation report, which reflects a new and now recurring effort that will help leaders up and down the chain of command identify key information to improve command climates. This will not only help to prevent sexual assault and harassment, but also to prevent other harmful behavior such as suicide. And third, taking steps to strengthen leadership prevention competence. This means training and selecting leaders who are not only committed to building and growing healthy climates, but who also demonstrate the skills we need to effectively prevent and respond to reports of sexual violence. In closing, thank you for attending this important event. Whether you are in higher education, considering military service or civilian employment, just beginning your career at DOD, or are a seasoned leader, Prevention is truly an all-hands effort that begins with you. Thank you for your participation today.
Thank you all for watching that short video. We are going to um, be starting the next session in a couple of minutes. And um, for those that have might have missed the code this morning, and if you have any questions about that, please drop a question in the Q&A function. And um, when our speakers are, are ready, then we'll go ahead and get started and I'll, I'll give the introduction for them. So uh, just wait with us for a couple more minutes and uh, we'll see you in a second. Oh, so there actually was not a fruit for that last session, but um, there will be one coming up uh, after this one. So if the first, there's only been to date a three, well, to, to this time now, three fruits so far. Thank you all for your time. Just uh, giving a few few moments I did see in the chat. So we do have uh, Senator Thomas Tillis and he had to go and vote. So I guess they pushed the vote back to 12. Um, so as soon as he's back, we will start the session. Thank you so much. So just because I don't like awkward silences, I'm gonna go ahead and take up some time to actually display a Mentimeter if we had some space. Uh, if you guys have all joined us from, uh, well, let me be inclusive. If you people have in uh, have been with us since the beginning of this program, we actually talked about uh, the, white, the white ribbon campaign. And that was a campaign this morning that was presented by uh, Howard University and, and Secretary Del Toro about 
uh, taking the st- the pledge to stand and not be a silent bystander. So if you guys learned about that today, I learned about that today, actually. Uh, if you can go to Mentimeter, this is just a, a survey that we are using to like just get engagement. It's a tool that a lot of the different departments, Department of uh, Defense sites are using uh, just to just do a different way of polling. And so if you go to your phones and you will go to www.menti, M-E-N, ti.com. You can actually use the code 31457508. And then you can actually join in this word cloud. So if you guys can look on your screen, let me see. I think I can make it bigger. Mm, full screen. There you are for, for the ones on mobile devices. Learn today. So it looks like some people uh, learned today. They were already familiar about it. Uh, I learned today. They are knowledgeable of it now. Learn today, I I love what I'm seeing. Nope, but I am now. Not a prevention strategy. It does help. Being not a silent bystander does help. Use it for SAP them every year, am now. Learned about it. Awesome. Wanna thank you all for participating in this session. And so um, right after that session, we actually had, if you're just joining us for today, uh, we had some students from a different department of different Department of Defense, uh, military organizations, and some colleges and universities around campus. And they actually talked about uh, harassment through the use of like social media. Well, that was that was one of the main ones. Uh, harassment through the use of social media and tools that they gave out that they were, that people can use to keep themselves safe. So I'm actually going to start start that one. So uh, what is what is your social media platforms of choice? Uh, I am a, I am definitely a, a big person for Instagram. I have a business that I like to post like all my food videos and things like that. But uh, let, let us know, what are your uh, social media platforms of choice? So we see Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, lots of Facebookers, Instagram. Let me see if I can scroll and keep this moving. Let's see. I'm, rust, I'm rusty with my Mentimeter skills. Oh, there we go. MeWe, Facebook, IG. So someone uses all of them. Snapchat, Reddit, TikTok, Facebook, Facebook, Twitter, IG, and Facebook. And what do you guys think about this tool? Is this a nice, a pretty nice tool to use for engagement? Not on social media. My cousin was just telling us, like, I'm not on social media, so send me all of your videos. Thank you. I'm just scrolling and using it. Lots of participation. Thank you all for for participating. Uh, Social media being used to talk to family. That is amazing. So for then, So if one has to go, which one would you choose? Looks like Facebook is winning. It looks like so our, our Congress member will be back Where do we answer these questions? So uh, for those that have missed it, we're actually on, if you can go to a mobile device and you can answer the questions on www.menti.com and you can use the code 31457508. So if you'd like to answer and participate in this Mentimeter tool, this just is a way to just kind of grab engagement. It's like, it's nice and got the pretty graph charts and can be done a lot of things. And there's actually free accounts. I use it for a lot of these meetings or a lot of uh, things during to just kind of pulse the community and crowd. Uh, So yeah, we'll leave this up here for another minute or so. And then I'll put the slide back up. And as soon as the Senator is back from voting, we will get started right away. Thank you guys for your patience.
Hi, Tom Tillis joins. Hello, sir. I am so sorry. I was tied up with votes and just finishing a uh, hearing actually on military suicides and I'm ranking members, so I couldn't leave it early. Of course, of course. Well, if, if you're ready, I can go ahead and introduce you. I, it seems like your camera is on, but I'm not getting any video. Oh, there you go. All right. Redundancy. <laughs> All right. Well, well, we're definitely excited to have you here, a national leader and definitely at work. So thank you for taking the time to actually just meet with us for this short time. So we pushed your session a little bit longer so you can have uh, some time to chat. But uh, definitely, I want to I have the privilege of introducing our moderator, retired Brigadier General Richard Gross, Gross. Mr. Gross, yes. Uh, he served in the Army for 30 years as an infantry officer and judge advocate. And he's on the line now, and he is now the highly qualified expert for the Department of Defense's general counsel. In the latter part of his military career, he was a principal legal advisor for the Joint Special Operations Command, U.S. Forces, Afghanistan, and NATO, International Security Assistance Force, and the U.S. Central Command. In his final military assignment, he served as the legal counsel to chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff from, 11, from 20, 2011 to 2015. Mr. Gross is currently assisting the Defense Department with the Defense Department with military justice reforms and, impl and implementation of the recommendations for the 2021 Ind Independent Review Commission on Sexual Assault and the Military. Over to you, Mr. Gross. Oh, thank you, Ashley, very much. And it's really my honor to introduce Senator Tom Tillis, who's here with us today. He's not only a tireless advocate for service members, veterans, and military families, but also for the survivors of sexual assault. So we're, we're just thrilled to have him with us today. Senator Tillis was first elected to represent the people of North Carolina to the United States Senate in 2014, and currently is serving his second term, having won re-election in 2020. Before serving in the Senate, he was Speaker of the House in the North Carolina General Assembly. There, he played an instrumental role in enacting job-creating policies and reforming North Carolina's tax and regulatory codes. Senator Tillis has a significant experience in policymaking and managing complex organizations. For nearly 30 years, he served as a senior executive in private sector technology and management consulting firms. He's a member of the Senate Armed Services Committee, the Veterans Affairs Committee, the Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs Committee, and the Judiciary Committee. Senator Tillis, welcome to the national discussion today. We're thrilled to have you. Thank you, General Gross. And again, I apologize for being late. I'm ranking member of the Personnel Subcommittee, and we were taking up the, uh, the subject on uh, military suicide. So this subject that we're talking about today is equally important, sexual assault and harassment in the military. But before I begin, General Gross, I also want to thank you for your prior service, but your current, your continued service, including serving on the board for the Independence Front, an organization I'm very familiar with and also very much focused on uh, issues to better support the men and women who have served. But um, I want to go to, to questions fairly quickly. Here's a comment that I'll make. Uh, I'm very proud of the annual process, <clears throat> excuse me, that we complete in our office to consider young men and women uh, for nominations to the military service academies. Um, but and, and we have a ceremony after we decide who we're going to send forth uh, to award them the nominations, recognize them for the hard work that they did to get to that point, because they're extraordinary people and future leaders. But over the last two years, I have added a discussion in an otherwise joyous setting, a discussion about military sexual assault and my expectations for these young men and women to be a part of the new culture that makes it simply unacceptable. We have so much work to do. I've recently got a, a readout from a research that's just been completed uh, by the DOD uh, that is promising on the one hand, because they understand the problem and they're coming up with strategies to address it, but it's disturbing on the other hand, because the numbers are not going down. Uh, I don't even think they're flat. Uh, we have a, a growing issue here uh, that I think we have to address. We have to do it not only for our service academies, but for every 
learning institution across the United States. And the work, uh, there's a lot of work to be done. And as long as I'm in the U.S. Senate, I'm going to be on the tip of the spear trying to get it done. No, and thank you, sir. And we really appreciate that. As you pointed out, the problems of sexual assault and sexual harassment in the military and on college campuses has received tremendous attention from legislators generally and you specifically. You've led a number of efforts in this area personally. Could you speak to some of the recent changes in the law that you expect to contribute to positive culture change within our institutions? Well, we implemented in last year's NDA. Uh, the, uh, it, this to me is more what occurs. We've done a lot of work on providing resources and restructuring the Uniform Code of Military Justice to, to seek justice after an event occurs. Um, what I think we have to do is go further up the chain and focus a lot more on prevention. Um, and I think it's at every level, uh, whether it's the, uh, the students, the, the command, the department, uh, we've got to, uh, I've talked with Senator Gillibrand about this. I think that we need to let the reforms on prosecution, uh, which may have uh, an effect on, on prevention, but we've got to get more deeply based on data and based on science into what we need to do uh, with command climate, with, uh, with educating the young men and women better, particularly educating uh, lower level leaders and their role and responsibility for prevention. And I suspect that we will have in this year's National Defense Authorization Act, uh, we will have additional provisions in there to continue to make progress. Well, speaking of progress, where do you believe our institutions of higher education, whether colleges, universities, or the service academies, have made progress in addressing sexual harassment and sexual assault? Well, I think there, there are some bright spots, but it's not uh, uniform. I think some institutions are doing better than others. There's some data to suggest that the uh, service academies may be uh, in, the, in the upper quartile in terms of, of uh, their own performance, but it's still uh, absolutely unacceptable, the level that we see in the service academies. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with... Um, with providing a safe harbor for people who come forward to report sexual assault. A lot of it has to do with identifying potential predators, uh, obviously allowing them to be, um, uh, to have access to due process. But what, what we've seen repeatedly is, is those who are guilty of sexual assault often not only do it once, but do it multiple times. So I think it's providing an infrastructure in place so that any young man or woman feel like they can go somewhere and if they see something, say something. If they're not comfortable with being involved directly, at least we've got to do a better job of, of educating the population on the resources that they have to report something that just doesn't seem right. And if they do that, uh, in many instances, you're going to find people out there who may be guilty of, of multiple encounters, and that could be great progress. So it's better tools, better access to information, encouraging people to understand they're a part of a community uh, that they can make more safe by, by being very aware of their surroundings and being willing to report something that just doesn't look right. No, there's some great ideas there and, and, and looking forward to seeing, seeing more of that on our campuses and, and so forth. Well, earlier today, we heard some of our panelists discuss the continuum of harm and the critical role of immediately addressing negative behaviors such as basic disrespects, sexual harassment, and gender discrimination in order to effectively combat sexual assault. What are some of the critical steps our institutions need to take to address these risk factors? Well, I think a part of what we have to do, at least uh, again, speaking for the service academies, and, and we, we have people within the DOD collaborating uh, with public and private institutions. I think it's to to bring together the best ideas and, and uh, to the extent that they they converge, implement best practices that we that 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 hopefully get implemented outside of the DoD. In my lanes, I know we can get it implemented inside the DoD, particularly as the ranking member on 
uh, the personnel subcommittee, but it's how can we make all of these institutions aware of the situation on the ground and have access to these tools, procedures, and policies that we think are going to bend the curve in the right direction. Uh, a lot of it's just communication. We had a, um, uh, I think a lot of it requires more forms like this, uh, casting a wider net with uh, uh, higher learning institutions and making sure if they if they don't know they have a problem, almost invariably they do, and they need to implement the tools and the best practices that we're doing our best to promote. Now, it makes incredible sense, and, and uh, I agree with you. Well, we know that progress on sexual assault and sexual harassment prevention depends on engaged leaders. As you think about your experience in making substantive reforms in these areas, what are some of the advances you've seen and what changes have you seen in leaders' perspectives on these issues? Well, uh, General Gross, I think that's an area where we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, when I recently reviewed uh, military sexual assault uh, data a couple of weeks ago, it's still very clear to me that we don't have, we do not have a pervasive culture. What we have when we see uh, an installation, so let's just get out, outside of the service academies, when we see an installation that seems to have a relatively low rate of military sexual assault, you wonder what kind of systems or processes they put in place to achieve that. Uh, what you find is it has more to do with the personalities in command at the time. So we've got a lot of work to do to create a cultural stickiness that transcends um, any one command. Uh, we all know that, that, that uh, commands move around every couple of years and uh, you're at risk of seeing what may look like a best practice because of reports or outcomes in a given period of time is at risk once the command changes and it's not a part of the culture or the priorities of the, of the subsequent command. Uh, that, that's why it's so much, we had the same discussion in the, uh, the hearing that I was in today on suicide prevention. Same, same thing, this has to be a priority for the command. Training has to be in place to make sure they understand it's a priority because this gets to readiness. It, this is, uh, when you have the, this sort of environment here, I think there's a credible case for saying you're diminishing the readiness of the men and women in military by having this be uh, a factor at a given installation. But there's a lot more work to be done. I, I wish I could say that we had the training, the policies uh, in place on a, on a broad basis. I think that we have some bright spots. Uh, there's some great data coming out of the Air Force, but there's still a lot more work to do. Well, as organizations look to make changes and get better at this, what advice would you give them? I think look to the experts and be driven by the data. Uh, baseline data so that you can track trends. Uh, figure out how to better use technology. Um, so it, it's to me, it's people, technology, infrastructure, processes. Uh, you, you need to look at all of them and make sure that you're creating a, um, a consistent application of the policies and best practices, but always measuring your results. Um, and uh, I know that, that the work that I've seen in the service academies, I'm optimistic that we're moving in the right direction, but structurally that's how any institution, whether it's a private or, or public um, or service academy, all of them need to look at it and systematize it. Measure your progress. If you get bad news, get intervention strategies in place to address it. Sir, we've focused today a lot so far on prevention, but we know there's also a lot more work to do in victim care and taking care of the survivors of sexual assault and, and other crimes. And over the past few years, we've seen a lot of focus on reconsidering how victim cases are handled. Title IX, call for UCMJ reform, et cetera. What are some of the biggest gaps you see in terms of victim support or advocacy? Um, again, I hate to keep uh, referencing back to the committee that I just came out of, but it's it's very there, uh, there. There's also a correlation between someone who's a victim of sexual assault and potentially um, uh, suicide ideation, for example. So what we have to do is look at all the risk factors that may occur when somebody's been a victim of sexual assault, um, and we have to have resources on the ground that can uh, care providers. Um, 
and caregivers, you know, the care providers or the medical professionals that a victim may be able to avail themselves to. But I also think that we have to work on caregivers who may be a very, very important um, link in the chain for providing care that the, uh, the service man or woman may need. Um, I think those are the, the, the key areas to look at and, and recognize that, uh, that this sort of trauma can bring, help, bring forward behavioral health issues. We have to have more people aware of, uh, of other things that could compl complicate that service member's life. So assume that they're a victim of a, of a sexual assault or some sort of harassment. They may be exhibiting behaviors. They could have behavioral health, depression, uh, suicide ideation, other behaviors that could have a, a second the victimization of the victim is the impact that it could potentially have on their future military career. In the, in the case of, uh, say, a service academy, um, uh, a cadet or someone else who moves on to serve. So you, you've got to look holistically after the event and determine what risk that victim may be subject to as a result of the trauma that they experienced and have a holistic approach on trying to identify all the risk factors and making sure they get the care they, they need and deserve. Well, thank you, Senator. Do you, do you have time to take a few questions from our audience? Yeah, I do. All right, we will open it up for questions. If anyone has questions for the Senator, please type them in. Let me uh, go ahead and read the first one from uh, Wiley Graham. Uh, pr presently, what is the greatest barrier to progress and is that or are those barriers parallel among various categories of institutions, higher ed, military, federal employment? Um, uh, I, I think the greatest barrier to progress is the, um, the creation of a culture that transcends enlightened leaders. Uh, that's why it's so important to get the people, technology, infrastructure, and policies in place so that you're not dependent on a particularly enlightened leader that once they leave, they take their eye off the ball and, and you have positive progress and it goes back. To, to me, the, the evidence is overwhelming that an installation, speaking for, uh, uh, for the service academies or actually speaking more broadly for military sexual assault, um, it's very much connected to the personalities who are creating the climate. And, and what we have to do is be able to build this expectation for any future leaders, whether it's a private college, university, or service academy, this is a priority. And the processes and procedures in place are a priority. And your ultimate performance is also going to be driven by, by the, 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 the reports of these sorts of incidences on your watch. I think it has to be spelled out that plainly whether a private college or university, public institution, or service academy, that this is a performance factor that ultimately judges your performance on the job at every level within an institution. Thank you. Well, we've got one from one of the phone lines. How can we use initiatives from the grassroots level to help inform leadership? Well, I think it's, it's providing us data, particularly best practices. I, I, I could not overstate the importance of the use of technology and, uh, uh, and the use of other organizations and helping encourage the reporting, the prosecution, and the identify, uh, identification of people who may be guilty of, uh, of sexual assault or harassment. Uh, so I think that, um, you know, we're constantly looking for uh, faster, more efficient, more effect, uh, efficacious ways to go about tackling this problem. And we need people uh, at, at the individual level, uh, outside organizations to really engage, provide us with the best ideas. In my case, if it has something to do with uh, the service academies, then uh, give us the information that we need to implement legislative policies that we expect the Department of Defense to abide by. If you're talking about a private institution, then it would it would depend upon whether or not you're going to state legislatures or, or, or uh, private institutions to carry that message forward. Well, we've got a question about uh, possible changes in law to make uh, more stringent or stricter punishments, uh, more serious consequences for those who've been 
who've committed and then been found guilty of sexual assault, sexual harassment. Any thoughts on punishment levels, changes necessary, or uh, any thoughts in that area? Well, we've actually uh, have looked at some of that uh, as a part of the, the, the UCMJ revisions. Uh, some of this is going to wade into a uh, state legislative policy, uh, so it'd be very difficult to, uh, to to answer on a broad basis for all the states and territories. But in, in our case, we're trying to send a signal with respect to uh, UCMJ that we take this seriously, that we're identifying other uh, crimes that could be uh, highly correlated to people guilty of military sexual assault. So we've expanded even some of the crimes that would be prosecuted um, with some of the changes that we made last year. But uh, I think you go back and look at the states that you represent and uh, benchmark that against what we consider to be um, uh, the appropriate level of penalty for the crimes that are being committed. Uh, and at the same time, we have to ensure due process because some of these cases can become very, very complicated. Um, and so we, we also have to look at the rights of the accused, but we also need to be prepared to implement serious penalties when in fact they are guilty. We have a question on, uh, several questions actually on the military uh, criminal investigation organizations. Just wanted to get your thoughts are they effective? Should there be a separate, perhaps, organization? Are they doing their jobs well? And, and what legislative reforms, if any, do you see regarding military criminal investigation organizations? Well, over the, uh, over the course of the next year or two, you're going to see some, uh, some significant changes with respect to military sexual assault. That was uh, included in the National Defense Authorization Act uh, next year. Uh, what we're trying to do um, uh, and, and Senator Gillibrand, I have to give her a lot of credit for the work that she's done on it, is put a priority on this so that we can bend the curve on no progress at all over the past several years in terms of reducing military sexual assault. So we thought a part of what we need to do is make sure that people are pursuing those cases, have expertise in it, um, uh, because uh, as I said earlier, they can be very complex cases. So we're uh, that is at a, about a two-year timeline, uh, maybe a year and a half now, a little bit less for uh, implementation. But it's a complex change in the way that the military is going to go about uh, uh, pursuing uh, these sorts of cases. At the same time, we want to make sure that we keep the command involved because commanders need, uh, for good order and discipline, need to be engaged in the process as well. We're trying to strike the balance, but you're going to see uh, some significant changes in the way these cases are prosecuted um, over the next year and a half. Well, Senator, we had one question that came in. What are the ways that leaders can be engaged daily on these issues without oversaturating their employees, their staff, or their students? Uh, that, I, think it, I think it comes down to um, not, you know, if they're engaged daily, it could be just uh, anecdotal or, again, personality-based. I think it's when you onboard staff, just like when you on, onboard a, uh, a new student to the service academy or like me, I'm, I'm starting with a discussion on military sexual assault uh, seven months or more before these young men and women are going to go into a service academy by letting them know I take this seriously and I have high expectations for people that I'm willing to associate my office with to uh, send forth a nomination. But what we have to do is, it, it, again, it goes back general to uh, a cultural, uh, not, obviously there needs to be training, uh, there needs to be intervention strategies, maybe that's when on a daily basis leaders need to get involved, but we just need to make this a part of the fabric of our society, not only in the service academies, but uh, in any of these institutions, that it's something that has to be spoken about when a student is admitted to a college, a university, or a service academy. It's something that needs to be touched on in terms of training uh, as they go through uh, their uh, curriculum and as they move into the military. It's just got to be a part of that cradle-to-grave culture that we need to create within the DOD. And I think every institution, every private or public institution that's trying to tackle this as well. It's the same thing. From the time that that young student is admitted to an institution until that time that young student separates and moves on 
uh, with their life, at least for that period of time that you have them, make sure that you understand it's an important part of the culture. We've had a number of questions that kind of center around the idea that things often change as administrations change. For Title IX regulations, for example, was one of the examples. Is there a way for Congress to make changes permanent that aren't dependent upon as political parties change in, in the office of the White House? Um, I, I think that obviously we've been doing this for about 200, a little over 240 years, and uh, every year or two we change things that seem like a great idea at the time. Um, the best way, the advice that I would have, uh, the best way to make sure that the, the congressional legislation that we're passing into law, we have two pieces there. We have administrations that change, and then we have Congresses that change. The best way for any legislation to have staying power is make sure you've done the work to get bipartisan consensus. That's the best way to protect against any sort of, of a repeal or significant change in the future. Um, with respect to administrations, we're constantly looking at uh, executive orders or agency decisions that we think are a great idea and they should have staying power. So we codify policies uh, as a matter of uh, uh, actions that we take in the legislature. So a good idea, something that we want to have some permanence after the agency has thought it out, they've implemented a policy. We're oftentimes looking for that as feedstock for legislation we should pass, which means that no future administration can change it without an act of Congress, literally an act of Congress. So to the extent that uh, the, the people have asked that question think that there are good administration policies that they would like to, to, to uh, transcend administrations, they should contact our office or, or the offices of, uh, of the members who are represented, depending upon what, the, what, what state they're in, and make a case for actually trying to codify it. And uh, Jake, I think I have time for one more question. I've got to run to uh, two other meetings happening simultaneously. <laughs> All right, let me, I was going to give you a wrap up time, uh, but let me find one more question. Um, we've covered most of these, I think, pretty. Uh, I, it looks like a number of questions seem to cover the idea of what, how can legislation help with prevention efforts? Any, any thoughts on that? I know you've addressed it already, but there seem to be a number of questions about prevention uh, and, and climate. I wondered if you had any closing thoughts on that. Well, one thing that I would encourage, um, again, we've gotten a climate survey back that is going to be very instructive to any additional proposals that we have in, uh, in this year's National Defense Authorization Act. But um, I would encourage uh, institutions, if they haven't done it, is to complete a climate survey. Uh, ask, you know, try to, uh, number one, you'll be sending a statement that this is important to you. Number two, you may learn about areas of vulnerability. You may actually find uh, some areas that are uh, bright spots, but I think start with really baselining the situation in every single institution with a comprehensive climate survey, and then make sure you have the right kind of expertise on the ground, people who have deep experience in this subject matter to recommend to you any uh, remediation, any training, any of the, uh, the blocks in that cultural foundation that I was talking about that need to put, be put into place so that you're, you're improving and uh, helping prevent um, sexual assault and harassment. So I think start with a good baseline, not anecdotal, comprehensive, and uh, work from there. Well, thank you. Senator, any closing thoughts for the audience today? Now, at first, just to thank everybody for focusing on this topic. It's very, very important to me. It's important um, because if we're able to do this at the young formative ages that we're talking about here for most of the people attending school, then we're doing good in the later years for uh, our, our country as a whole. So I appreciate the work you're doing and General Gross, like I said before, I, I, I appreciate all the work you have done in the past and all that you continue to do. And if you have any questions about work that we're doing, anyone, if you have questions about work that we're doing 
on uh, particularly the service academies and how that could be applied to other institutions, feel free to contact my office and we'll make sure that we, uh, we get you all the information you'd be interested in. Well, Senator Tom Tillis from North Carolina, sir, thank you so much for taking the time out of your extraordinarily busy schedule today to talk to us. Thank you. God bless. Thank you, Senator Tillis, and thank you, um, General Gross. So what I'm going to do now the for the phone callers, this the session is a uh, lemon. I am putting it on the screen right now. Again, so the, the, the code for this, thank you for this session. Uh, we really, really, really appreciate all of this. We could not get to all of the questions, of course, but uh, these questions are being recorded so we can address them and, and talk about them. Uh, so we're actually gonna, after this, we're gonna have a, a little short break until about uh, 1315 Eastern Standard Time. And I'll be putting up another Mentimeter in the meantime to kind of get your thoughts from this previous session as well. And so we've been using this, using these tools. So by now you will have had four key codes uh, for fruit that is going to be entered at a link at the end of the event. We're gonna put the link at the end of the event and we are going to send it out for email. If you had to leave, uh, of course, we're definitely gonna take the honor system, but you had to leave a little few minutes early and miss this. Uh, we will be recording this and this will go out. We will send out all the necessarily links that we mentioned earlier. And um, so the code word for this session is, is lemon. And at the end of this event, we will be putting these in for the one link to have all the codes so you get different credits for your continuing education, CEUs, CUUs. And so uh, we thank you so much.
We have about five more minutes until our next session. So I'm gonna leave this minting meter up for about 60 seconds. Thank you for all of these, all of these comments. Um, what do you do to promote a positive culture? Uh, making others aware of how their jokes may be perceived to others and more self-aware of the harm they're doing. That's, that's a huge one, especially me being a jokester. I had to learn that um, multiple times on how, how offensive sometimes things can be. Uh, training staff on what positive culture looks like. That's a good one. Uh, taking a stand uh, when, when you see um, negative culture and be an ally. And of course, I love this definitely very biblical for myself, you know, to treat others as the way you want to be treated. So um, definitely big for me and, and knowing as a huge empath myself, putting myself in the place of, of other people's shoes and feelings and trying to understand their perspective or listen or just be there. Um, these are great. Leading by example, not turning a blind eye, remaining transparent. That's huge and being approachable. Speaking up for those who have struggled for speaking up themselves. Um, empathizing with people. Uh, pretty much the difference of instead of feeling bad for someone, feel bad with them. Fairness and equality, encouraging those around, being example. These are these are all great, and we really appreciate this feedback and, and sharing with others on how you all lead by example. Um, again, the last session that we had uh, with with Senator Tillis and, and General um, General Gross, the code is lemon. Well, I'll put that up on the screen one more time, and then in a few minutes, in about four more minutes, we will get started on our next session. Thank you so much. Also, if you are having audio issues, I will repost in the chat the, the troubleshooting directions. They are also in the emails that were sent out from Zoom government. If you're having audio issues, you can dial in from a phone line and we are up on Divids and YouTube. Thank you so much.
Okay, and welcome back. So we are going to be starting our next session. If, um, if my next speakers can come off of mute and come on camera, we have Dr. Lynn Bowes Sperry. We have Dr. Victoria Banyard. We have Brig Brigadier General John Klein and Dr. Jessica Gallus, who will be moderating this next session. So thank you so much. If you guys have any questions, please direct them again to the question and answer chat. And I see that my speakers are starting to come on camera and I will um, hand it over. Okay, it looks like we're having a little bit of issues. And um, all right, there you go. So getting everybody there and Dr. Gallus, you have the floor. All right, thank you so much, Ashley. And thanks to everyone for joining us for this session. We have a great panel here for you today of subject matter experts a military leader, and we're going to be talking through how to help students, faculty, service members, and leaders build the skills to translate their values to actions. So why the focus on skill building? First, we know that prevention knowledge doesn't always translate to prevention action. And we know that most people want to do the right thing and believe that these negative behaviors are unacceptable, but they don't always know how to do, how to address these behaviors or how to contribute to healthy climates. So our session today really helps address some of these gaps from a positive perspective of what right looks like instead of some of the, the former traditional approaches that focus on compliance and what not to do. In terms of the session format, I'll introduce one speaker at a time and have them talk for 10 minutes. And then at the end of the session, I'll have a few questions for them and we'll open the discussion to the audience. So I'll start by introducing Dr. Vicki Banyard. Dr. Banyard is a professor at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, where she is also the Associate Director of the Center for Research on Ending Violence and the Associate Dean for Faculty Development. She's co-authored a, a recently released book, Strengths-Based Prevention, Reducing Violence and Other Public Health Problems. She is, she's, Sorry, I thought maybe somebody had a hot mic. She has dedicated her academic career to finding better ways to help communities prevent and respond to interpersonal violence. She's got a PhD in clinical psychology, a certificate in women's studies from the University of Michigan, and has worked with many colleges across the US and abroad to really shape policy at the national, state, and local levels. Through, through a rigorous examination of violence prevention programs centered on a critical question, do they work? Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Banyard for the first part of our session. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. I am gonna share my screen with just a couple of slides to kind of summarize some main points that I hope will uh, continue to further the, the discussion. I've been listening in all morning and I think that folks will see a lot of what has been resonating in the Q&A through the discussion this morning, as well as on the, the interesting, um, I forget what you call it, where people write in and people are talking about how do you create a positive culture, right? And I think that's gonna resonate with a number of the things that, that, um, that I am gonna talk about um, right now. So hopefully folks can see, um, can see the slides. Yes, we can see them, thank Great. you. Super. So just to summarize some of the limits of where we've been and current prevention approaches, right? So many prevention approaches, unfortunately, are fairly atheoretical, so we don't really have a view of why they might work. Um, they rely a lot on admonishment, on telling us what not to do, as opposed to visioning what it is that we want people to do. Um, we use a lot of rational actor models. And what I mean by that is that we try to assume that people are their best selves and, and thinking through um, problems and, and complicated situations with um, their most problem solving hats on. And we know that when we're talking about sexual harassment, sexual assault, a variety of public health problems that actually there's a lot of emotions that are there. They're very fraught and complicated situations. And so um, we need to kind of move beyond those kinds of models. 
Our prevention is all too often focused on individuals rather than groups and context. We heard a number of people, of people talking today about social norms, about leadership. We had a panel of students talking about their own leadership among their peers. So really thinking about building that context. And then I think we've also been very hampered by this idea that it somehow isn't prevention if we're not talking about plug in X, Y, or Z substance abuse, suicide, um, dating violence, sexual harassment. If we're not saying that word, then we're not doing prevention. And I'm going to suggest um, with a couple of ideas that maybe we can broaden our view of what might be helping our prevention efforts. And that is largely through the untapped potential of strength um, and really focusing on strengths and positive behavior and, and why, right? It brings people in the door. Um, it's, it's very much more, uh, we, we found that with bystander intervention, right? When we start to ask people to come to the table, Table, not as potential perpetrators or survivors, but as helpers, right, all of a sudden we get a lot more people at the table. Our research, uh, research that I've been doing on the topic of strengths and resilience shows that it improves outcomes. Um, it helps us vision the presence of what we are seeking as outcomes rather than what we're just trying to decrease or move away from. And it can be very inclusive, which is to say that our the huge and growing literature on ACEs, on early life trauma and adversity shows us that even when we think we're doing primary universal prevention, many of the people in the room even when we're working with middle school students have already experienced adversity and trauma, which affects how they receive those prevention messages. When we use a strengths-based approach, we can be doing primary as well as secondary and tertiary prevention levels, perhaps all at the same time. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about our prevention portfolio model. And this is really based on some work that I did with colleagues Sherry Hamby and John Gritch on what we call a prevention portfolio, a, a resilience portfolio model, which is a way of describing these strengths for prevention um, that I'm talking about today. And we really grouped in this portfolio on three main areas of strengths that are associated with a whole variety of positive well being um, and positive climate outcomes. These include regulatory strengths like emotion awareness and regulation, interpersonal strengths, including compassion, generativity, community support, empathy. We saw some of those in that. that um, open item response that people were, were just responding to before this session started, and the often neglected meaning making, right? The sense of purpose, optimism, cultural traditions, mattering, things that can also be built into the workplace as well as academic settings. And that we find that these things are, are really important um, buckets of strengths. But more than just the individual types of strengths, right? One of the things that, that our research has really been showing is that dose matters, that it's not necessarily one particular strength, one particular area of knowledge, one, in fact, knowledge in general doesn't predict positive behavior. Um, it's another thing we need to move off of from prevention, but that it's not any one particular strength, it's having a variety of them available to you. And the more strengths that we can build, and reinforce while we're doing prevention, um, the better off we'll be. And so we coined this term poly strengths to really talk about that it's really about having access to a bunch, not just one. So this is um, a graphic uh, that we have built, um, the book that we wrote around, which is taking the resilience portfolio model and making it a prevention portfolio model, and really talking about how prevention can both insulate us against the kinds of negative behaviors and public health problems that we are talking about today um, and in other spaces, as well as interrupting the link between risk factors, adversities that people may bring into the room or into uh, our campus or into our workspace that puts them at risk for some of these negative outcomes. Um, and we really talk about a variety of ways that we if we work across silos, if we borrow from insights and prevention that take place in suicide prevention, in substance abuse prevention, using those lessons to build a, a more de-siloed approach, if we move toward strengths, if we think about tailoring them to help people think about where do they already have strengths, where could they be building some new ones um, that we may be more effective in our prevention efforts. And so I'll just mention here, um, again, because the idea is just to, to get people thinking, well, some brain teasers, and then we'll have some discussion, but some key strength strategies that we um, talk about in our work, 
scaling things like positive youth development that are very promising as a prevention strategy for young people for later points in the lifespan. Would love to think about what does that mean from a lifespan perspective. Bystander intervention, which some of my colleagues on this panel are going to talk more about, but really prompting people to think about proactive bystander intervention, changing norms, shaping culture, not just reacting when something negative is happening. Mindfulness practice, I just came off a three-day resilience conference where there was lots of research continuing to establish that the practice of mindfulness, um, which used to be branded as just this kind of thing that, that certain groups of people did, but now is widespreadly known as a, as a foundational prevention practice for all of those different strengths building uh, buckets I was talking about. Things like gamification, making prevention fun, and thinking about social norms, social marketing policies. There was some discussion with the senator about that. How do we resource um, and think about broader policy changes? And again, policies that can influence strength. So I'll give just an example. Um, uh, researchers have discovered, for example, that when you look at policy changes like changing gasoline prices or increasing the minimum wage, that it reduces problems like child maltreatment, right? So there's how policy can actually influence rates of violence. When it comes to youth, for example, people who have studied in the early days of states adopting um, LGBTQ plus um, marriage um, laws that, that permitted uh, marriage, that, that in those states, we saw declines in youth suicide especially because we know sexual gender minority youth are at particular risk for suicide. So, so policy also does matter and continuing to think about, about those contexts. So I look forward to conversation and shameless plug for the book, which talks a lot more about all of these ideas. Thank you so much, Dr. Banyard. I really, I appreciate your comments around the need for multiple doses, the We've got to move beyond knowledge to really focus on that skill building that we can really benefit by thinking through tailored approaches to prevention. And that we've also got to consider, especially for organizations where, where team um, teamwork and team behaviors are salient, such as the military, you know, how do we think about prevention from a, a team and leadership perspective? So thank you. Our next panelist is Dr. Linbo Sperry. She conducts and publishes research that has practical implications for organizations, such as improving their ability to manage problematic interpersonal behavior at work before it escalates to illegal harassment, and providing employees with the skills to take effective action when they experience or witness harassment or are faced with other ethical dilemmas. Her research on sexual harassment and bystander, I apologize, bystander intervention in the workplace has positively impacted the global community through acknowledgement by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the Canadian Parliament, the Australian Human Rights Commission, and various media outlets such as the Los Angeles Times and ABC News. She's held a number of leadership positions in the Gender and Diversity and Organizations Division of the Academy of Management, has testified as a subject matter expert on workplace sexual harassment before the Canadian Parliament, and conducted numerous professional development workshops and training sessions. So without further ado, over to Dr. Bosberry. Um, I would like more ado. <laughs> 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 Never enough ado. Yeah, so uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone who's attending and the people who are sponsoring this, and I feel honored to be an invited panelist. So um, as uh, we have said, I will be talking about translating values into voice, all right? So we all have values, and um, sometimes we voice them, and sometimes we don't. So one of the things, um, this quote I, I just love. It's from the EEOC Select Task Force on Workplace Harassment, which was, um, it's about five years old by now, maybe six, with legal liability long ago established. It almost sounds like a fairy tale, right? <laughs> with reputational harm from harassment well known, with an entire cottage industry of workplace compliance and training adopted and encouraged for 30 years, count them, three decades, one, two, three. <laughs> Why does so much harassment persist and take place in so many of our workplaces. All right, so 30 years, it's been illegal. It's been problematic for centuries, okay? 
So when we focus on the legality of the issue, I have this phrase, I don't know if I coined it, but um, purpose drives process. So if our purpose is to keep an organization from being sued, then by all means, let's continue the way we're doing it. If the purpose is to actually stop the behavior, you need to understand human behavior, not the laws. As Dr. Banyard referred to, knowledge, um, knowledge is power in some regard, but knowledge does not help you translate your values into a voice, right? So we need to think more from a human behavior perspective. So um, I'm hoping this is a rhetorical question. After 30 years, is there something we've been missing? Yes, I'm gonna go with yes, that there's probably something we have been missing. So what is that that has been missing? Well, the understanding of human behavior. So whenever we're talking about anything that has legality associated with it, fears, right? People become defensive. Am I being judged? Will I be blamed? No, I was misunderstood. Oh, you're just overly sensitive. But more importantly, this is so awkward. Awkward when you see somebody do something. Now, we're not talking sexual assault on this. I, I want to start off and make that clear. There would obviously be a different dynamic if you see somebody being physically and sexually assaulted than if somebody makes um, a joke that didn't quite land exactly, maybe as they thought it would, maybe they didn't realize that it, it was inappropriate, right? So the way I come at this is I started focusing on it as an ethical issue as opposed to a legal issue. Right, because many things um, are unethical, but they're not illegal. For example, harassment based on what they refer to as a protected category, gender, race, ethnicity, those types of things, illegal. Generic bullying, not illegal in the United States, right? So, so um, probably gonna my recurring theme is I'm glad it's illegal in the sense of it's brought into the public mind. But if we keep treating it as a legal issue, it's not going to be resolved. So we need to understand the awkwardness about trying to call someone out on their behavior. It's um, hard to do. It takes courage and it might not land well. So your purpose often gets lost in your behavior. And if we can get people to acknowledge that there's so much awkwardness and defensiveness around this. This is one thing I really don't hear discussed very often. And to solve a problem, you need to know the root of the problem, right? So, so if we're not focused enough on um, social psychology, human behavior, motivation, defensiveness, all of those types of things, I don't see how we can make progress. So since I am talking about values, I figured I should know what the Naval Academy values are. And uh, from what I've gotten off the website, three biggies, honor, courage, commitment, all will be relevant in terms of translating your values into voice, bystander intervention types of things. Honesty, dignity, respect, courage in all, notice how I capitalize all, endeavors. So if you're going to be courageous in combat, yes, that's obviously expected. Being courageous in interpersonal interactions, also part of your endeavors. So one thing I want to say now about organizational values, these are the Navy's values. These are the Naval Academy's values. However, if you're at a university or a company, you may have different guiding values. So I'm not saying that every program should revolve around these three values. What I'm saying is you need to identify, and most companies do have um, you know, organizational values and their mission statement and things like that, vision. Know what yours are. And if you can, back to what Dr. Banyard was saying, focus on being proactive. Instead of don't do this, we want to focus on do this. So know the values um, and then frame. And by no, I mean the people who are trying to um, get, whether it's students or employees or soldiers, to be on board with this. Uh, don't read the law and say, this is what you can't do. And I, I, I always have this kind of like funny picture in my head after a compliance-based training, like people running back to their desk. Oh, it doesn't say I can't do that, right? So it's like when you give a list of behaviors you can't do, it's like, well, what can I do, right? So um, it's, I'm a little facetious with that, but it, I don't think it's 
it's that far off the mark in, in some regards. And um, I educated myself today. I learned a new term, bullying. Um, so this is news to me. I, I knew there was shining shoes and all that. So I, I said, all right, I'm trying to think of a behavior in the military that once again, I am not in the military. So if I'm wrong on this, correct me. I think this comes natural. The people know my boots need to look like this. There's a dress code. I wouldn't dare violate it. People police their own. Oh, your shoes aren't right. Oh, you're not wearing this properly. What are you doing showing up in this bathing suit? Um, so we know that values can, we know people can be held accountable for violating values. So if we treat harassment as just another type of thing in, in the regard of, you know, you'll do this, why won't you do that, right? So when we make it like this big, ooh, it's so awkward and it's, uh, you know, it's another, you could think of it as another um, value to uphold. Technically, you could think of it as a rule, right? A dress code, a code is a rule, but once it becomes internalized, I don't think it feels like a rule. It feels like just commonplace, natural behavior. This is what we do. We stop questioning it. We don't think, well, what are we doing this for? And um, I also noticed that I like the bullying because then I could tie it into bullying, right? So um, in the idea, why am I connecting these two things? Well, what I'm thinking is that the bullying would be taken for granted behavior and when you see someone bullying the taken granted for behavior, uh, sorry, taken granted behavior would be holding them accountable for their behavior. All right, so from values to action, um, organizational culture, uh, literature, everything you read will tell you this, whether you're talking about um, innovation or you're talking about preventing harassment. Without accountability, nothing else matters. So training, see above, <laughs> that's why I have the arrow. We cannot even talk about, I can come in and give you the best training you've ever seen. And if the organization is not holding people accountable, they're just gonna be like, wow, that was cool what Lynn said, um, but guess what? No one's holding me accountable, right? So um, knowledge is power, but <laughs> accountability is the thing that gets that power um, you know, up and moving. And then the other term I have here is talking about espoused versus enacted values, right? So espoused, what do I claim? What do I say? We say these are our values, great. You know, you gotta start somewhere. Are those values being enacted? Because if they are not being enacted, now you're hypocritical, right? You're sending a mixed message. You're saying we value these things and then people will come in and go, oh yeah, it looks like you're valuing those things. What about this? What about that? What about the other thing? So, um, I think uh, that is the last I have. Yeah. All right. I have 40 seconds left. So um, in closing, um, even though I'm focused on things other than training, we will be doing training. Most companies will. So try to keep it focused on the human behavior aspects rather than the legal. People can read a PowerPoint on the legal issues to get that knowledge. All right. They can have it on a card, a laminated card to look up. Okay, these are the no-nos. But we focus instead on intervention, which I'm actually now calling involvement, right? Because if words matter, ooh, intervening, scary, becoming involved, oh, expected, right? So I think that um, language matters and my time is up, so thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bosberry. I think that's spot on, language does matter. and. It's something we always grapple with, even when we talk about victims, um, particularly in a military context. You know that is not a term that that resonates with a number of people. And I, I think your uh, your point about involvement versus intervention is a really interesting one. I also like your your comment about having you know how having the best training in the world is great, but if folks are not held account accountable, you're basically dead in the water. And and I, what that tells me is that this is really just a reminder that we can't train or policy our way out of these challenges if the right parameters are not put in place. So the, the last but certainly not least speaker is Brigadier General John Klein. We are so grateful that he was able to, to join us today. 
General Klein is an aviation officer who has commanded tactical aviation units at the company, battalion, and brigade levels with multiple deployments and leadership positions in Iraq and Afghanistan. He served in a wide variety of staff and leadership positions, including two years at the Pentagon as the Deputy Director for Army Aviation and as the Executive Officer for the Headquarters Department of the Army Deputy Chief of Staff. General Klein later served as the Deputy Commanding General for the 7th Infantry Division in Fort Lewis, Washington, and from um, 2018 to 2019 as the Deputy Chief of Staff for the Training and Doctrine Command at Fort Eustis. Oh, I see that's 2019 to 2021. All right, well, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to General Klein. Hey, thanks, Jess. Uh, and thanks to everyone that's joining us today for this, uh, this important conversation. Um, I don't have slides today, so you get the uh, the privilege of looking at my face. Um, hopefully that works for you. Um, but before I get into, um, you know, what I was asked to talk about, how the Army instills core values in our military recruits, I would just offer that the bio that was just read by Jess, many of you are probably thinking, like, what has this individual got to do with this particular topic? He's, I get it, he's commanded at a bunch of units out there and, and it's seen a little bit of Southwest a Asia, but my current position, um, I'm the commanding general for the Center for Initial Military Training. And, and in essence, um, I have uh, oversight of all initial military training. So I get the unique opportunity to influence every future soldier that comes into our army. Um, and that's a uh, responsibility that we take very, very seriously. So if you think things like basic training, the education requirements for our officer initial training programs, as well as the training of the drill sergeants. Um, that's me. That's what we do. And it kind of adds some scope to it. Um, it's 130,000 soldiers that, that come through the front doors of the Army uh, every year. That's kind of like we bring in, um, imagine Kansas City, Kansas, uh, not Kansas City, Missouri, but I mean, it's, it's that kind of magnitude. Um, and as you can imagine, uh, our recruits, they come from all walks of life. Uh, they have different goals and different motivations as to why they join the Army. I would say most come from homes with involved parents and coaches and teachers that are imparting strong values. But we also have recruits that come from less supporting environments that are absent of the values that, that we embody. And this is a mission that our, our cadre, they take very seriously, and they are determined to make a positive change um, with every individual that comes through our front door. Um, some are easier than others, but uh, each one of these individuals raised their right hand. They swore an oath, as you see in the picture behind me, and that means something to us. And so it is now our obligation to do the best we can to turn them into soldiers. It's not always successful. Um, we do have a low attrition rate, but um, for those that just cannot adopt our values, um, despite our efforts, um, we do separate. Um, but for the most part, um, we were able to make the transition. Um, what's unique with what I do specifically is unlike the earlier panel discussions that largely kind of covered the collegiate environment of our or our academies. Um, in basic training, I, unfortunately, I don't have the luxury of four years to influence behavior and instill our values. Um, in contrast, I've got about 10 weeks. And I got 10 weeks to execute this transformation from what was previously a high school student, civilian, now into a soldier. Uh, with the goal of having them committed to our Army values that can successfully integrate into their first unit of assignment. Um, and so, you know, that's that's a fairly uh, big task to, to take on. It's fast paced. Uh, the cadre love do, doing what they do. And they are passionate about making that next generation of soldiers. And so for those out there that haven't seen a basic training family day or a graduation ceremony or swearing in ceremony, I would encourage all of you to, to come out and come to Fort Jackson, South Carolina, or Fort Benning, or Fort Sill, or Fort Leonard Wood. Come to one of our Army training centers and watch the faces of our uh, the mothers and the fathers or the family members that are there to, to see their loved one um, put on the Army patch and put on that beret and, and become an Army soldier. It's, it's, a, it's an electric atmosphere. So how do we do this? Um, I'll just start by saying that the pursuit of prevention um, is one that we can never be complacent on and it is one that is an enduring mission. Um, and so it is venues like that or events like this that are so important because trust me, I'm, I'm writing down and capturing as many notes as, as hopefully I get a chance to share with you. And so 
Um, I got to see some really good stuff this morning that I, I will look to incorporate into our program. But I'd also like to share with you what we don't do anymore, um, because if you are envisioning uh, some sort of atmosphere that resembles uh, movies like Full Metal Jacket or Stripes, you would be way off the mark. Um, so we used to call that the infamous shark attack, this, this yelling in the faces of recruits and forcing trainees to do push-ups every 10 seconds and running around with duffel bags over their heads. And all of that is over. And as we look on that behavior, which, by the way, started by um, or under a draft army um, through a, an idea that we would compel those to serve by fear, um, we look back on that now and, and we see there's just zero benefit. Not to mention, it is completely contrary to the values that, uh, that we uh, embody, specifically treating others with dignity and respect. So um, it just doesn't bode well when you are doing that in their, as their first impression and then they go to their first unit assignment and, and we're trying to share with them that um, we, are, we embody a culture that treats everyone with dignity and respect. And I'm sure like our sister services, we start with um, proven leaders that personally embody our, our army values. Leadership is absolutely the secret sauce here. Um, and they must foster an exemplary command climate. And unlike, you know, the collegiate environment at basic training, we have the opportunity to completely immerse our trainees into an environment that is, yes, it's very controlled and it's absent from some of the distractors that might occur elsewhere. Things like um, phones, for example, um, they do get very limited phone use, but, and that's an interesting and separate conversation entirely. But when you remove the device from the individual and they are, they have to learn how to cope without it, um, that there are some positives that, that can be shared from that. Um, and you can imagine that we educate uh, using a variety of methods that are, you know, somewhat traditional, you know, briefings and practical exercises and vignettes. Um, sometimes we have role playing that our drill sergeants will, will, will do um, to kind of show what right looks like. And what we've learned, um, many who join don't know how sexual harassment and sexual assault are defined. And it's not until we educate them in basic training that we realize that They've experienced something back home or in school that was a crime and is, is punishable under the law. And so, you know, when they have that discovery, if you will, um, we get a lot of initial reports that are tied to life before the Army. But now they, they receive counseling from a professional. Now they get to see leaders that are engaged. Um, and many times this is the first time that they've, they've had this kind of interaction. Um, and so we know that this is so critical in establishing trust. Um, and critical to the success of instilling our values in such a short time is the command climate that we operate in. Um, and I know that's largely the theme of, of this uh, discussion today. But, you know, recruits are very observant and, you know, um, that works to our advantage. If we have a climate that we operate in is very positive, which we work very hard to do, then they see that we practice what we preach. And we know without question that those units with healthier climates have fewer harmful behaviors. And that's not just sexual harassment, sexual assault, that's extremism, that's racism, that's suicide. Um, and so healthy climate uh, drives those risks down. And given the theme that we have today and the audience that we have today, um, I think it's worth a few seconds to describe uh, what a positive climate looks like specifically within the Army. And it was great to see the comments that came up on Menti. Um, I was smiling as I read several of them come up there. So that was a great question that you asked. But I'd offer how Army Doctrine describes a healthy climate. It starts with a leader who encourages fairness and is personally embodies our Army values. And for us, those are loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. Um, that leader has got to set the example. It centers on teamwork, unity, cohesion, and trust. Uh, members of the team are treated with dignity and respect. Leaders foster an inclusive learning environment. They encourage innovative, candid, and diverse thought. Team members are valued. They understand their purpose and their contribution to the larger mission. They know that their voice is heard and the leadership is willing to listen. And one more that I'll share is that leaders reward those that uphold our values and they hold accountable those that don't or fail to do so. Uh, accountability is a key ingredient uh, in this prevention of sexual harassment, sexual assault. So unlike the shark attack uh, that you may have in your mind from, you know, Hollywood years ago, now when you come into basic training, 
you're going to arrive at one of our four army training centers. We start with a more meaningful reception that we call the first 100 yards. And that allows our drill sergeants to demonstrate our army values. They physically take off their brown round hat. They put on a patrol cap. They look like those recruits that are coming through our door and they participate in a series of arduous events. If you can imagine, there's a little drama that goes on. There's some smoke that's, you know, that's on the, on the set, if you will. There's simulators that are going off, but there's a drill sergeant that receives a mission. And he, re he receives all of these new recruits that are coming off the bus. And he says, follow me. And he leads them through this kind of arduous exercise, not yelling on the sidelines and pointing at them and, you know, admonishing them if they don't do things correctly, but by their side, showing them what right looks like. It is this, this initial impression that we make that is so helpful in building trust. So later on, we can build upon that as they go through the, the basic training experience. Um, we, we emphasize the, uh, the importance of treating our teammates, obviously, with dignity and respect, the significance of wearing this uniform, the flag on our sleeve. We stress the importance of teamwork, and we strive to break those previously learned unacceptable behaviors. We also teach what we consider basic life skills. We, we, we kind of jokingly call it adulting 101, but how to control your emotions, what proper behavior looks like, both in person and on social media. And additionally, much like the Naval and the Air Force Academy, the Army recognizes the power of peer pressure. And we, too, have adopted uh, HASH-like programs, ambassador-like programs that were discussed earlier this morning. Um, and, and what we do is we identify and train individuals uh, within the peer group to raise awareness and intervene when behavior is contrary to our values. Um, we teach bystander intervention and mindfulness to, to my uh, fellow panel mates here. Um, we understand the value of that. I would offer, though, with bystander intervention, um, I kind of view that as kind of the last hope, uh, the safety net, if you will. So if you can if we can start with, you know, really building individual readiness and then as kind of the first tier of defense, the second being that inner circle of trusted agents that might be a battle buddy. It might be a spouse or a loved one. It might be somebody that you have a very tight relationship with. It is somebody that will come to your aid at two o'clock or three o'clock in the morning if you are in a bad way, if you will. And then lastly, we're looking for some bystander to intervene. An incredible, incredible, important uh, ingredient to the overall um, you know, uh, prevention strategy, but I, I'm, I'm more focused on the individual um, uh, initially. Um, so there's a lot that, that uh, I heard this morning that we follow a, a suit with. The last thing I would share, and, and this ties to, to Senator Tellis's uh, comments regarding changes that we say we see with uh, commander personalities and the changes of of command, if you will. And um, he's absolutely not wrong with that. We have some leaders that are just naturally more dynamic. They're more charismatic. They are able to really communicate and connect and influence. And then others that just don't have necessarily all those same attributes. Um, and so what we do it, until, you know, because we're never going to have an individual that, uh, you know, everybody is not in that category. So we place a lot of emphasis on our transitions, transitions between outgoing and incoming commanders, trans transitions between a drill sergeant that is departing, that has got a lot of experience and a new one that is coming in. But we also focus on the transitions that take place between basic training and the movement of an individual soldier into advanced individual training. And then, and then again, the final transition as they move into their first unit of assignment. Uh, and I'll close with that. And uh, again, I, I really appreciate the, uh, the privilege of uh, speaking with you all today. Thanks so much, General Klein. That was that was great information. And we really just appreciate that perspective. I um, wanted to ask the, the panelists a few questions. And, and maybe, General Klein, we can start with you, um, given you were just speaking about this. You know, you, t you talked about the importance of navigating those transitions and, I'm, I'm, you know, to different, you know, they start with basic, which is really the foundational piece of, of um, trying to, to foster these core values. What else, um, as they, as soldiers transition through their career, how does the, the Army um reinforce those values? Are they reinforced at different levels? I'm, I'm thinking about some of Dr. Banyard's yeah. comments about multiple doses. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So um, yeah, I just have the, I get the opportunity to set the foundation. 
um, were the first impression. And so we've got to, it's, that's got to be right. But it's just the first impression. So um, if, as an Army soldier, um, not only are you not only are you introduced with this and the operational force, but every level of professional military education as you go up all the way into the general officer ranks. So even now, so you, you get it at the lieutenant level, you get it again at the captain, at the major, at the lieutenant colonel. It just continues to go pre-command courses, the war college, and then into um, the strategic education programs that we have within the Army. It continues throughout your entire career. I got 30 years in right now. We're still, you know, participating in venues like this, for example. Um, these are very, very valuable. We have got lots that are within our service that are going to watch this afterwards or are plugged in right now. They're taking this in specifically if they are in the space of educating the force when it comes to sexual harassment and sexual assault. And then the operational force also does this. Thank you so much. That's really helpful perspective for um, Dr. Bo Sperry and, and Dr. Banyard. What are some of the, I, I know a few of you, uh, you touched on this throughout your um, presentations here or there, but what are some of the key skills that you think students really need to learn to contribute to positive climates? And, and how do we get um, universities, institutions of, of higher ed to incentivize the development of these skills? Um. I, I could talk a little bit about the incentivize, and I, I just should put up a flash for accountability every time because the way to th there's no incentive unless someone will be held accountable. You know, when my students say, "Well, how come workplace bullying is so prevalent?" Because it can be. People allow it to happen, and until they're like, let's not even talk about incentive, honestly, because there's no incentive greater than accountability, in, at least in in my opinion. Yeah, I think that's really well put. I guess what I would say to take this in a slightly different direction um, is I think we also need to pay attention to the foundation on which the skills training. And so, yes, we need the accountability. And that's where some of the policy work comes. That's where the contextual work, not just working with one individual at a time. Right. But that broader values and culture and social norms and policy accountability, all of those things. But I also think that we need to be thinking about prevention as helping people create a platform of well-being, because those things then make taking in those values and acting from those values and using their voice so much more likely. And those things also don't need incentivizing because they are things that that, um, you know, some of these strategies for building well-being for prevention are really pretty easy like they're not complicated you don't need train the trainer to learn how to do it and you can get benefit even if you're not very good at it and that is awesome because that will help give us a big effect size right on our um, on our impact and I think can create the fertile soil for then the more specific skill building and things around responding to and dealing with these specific kinds of issues and behaviors, if that makes sense. That's, those are those are all great points. And, and Dr. Bannard, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more about what some of those methods are. You know, when you said, hey, you don't even have to be great at it or good at it, um, but it can still be helpful. What are some of those things that um, students can do or even uh, faculty or staff? So at the risk, right, of saying things that then people sort of go, yeah, but isn't that kind of like the wellness center or the whatever, is it this, right? We got a social message better about a lot of these things, but research, meta, recent meta-analyses, super clear, mindfulness, right? You can do it a small amount in the day. But if it's not seen as just something that only certain people do, or that's a sign of weakness or whatever it might be, but that it gets kind of baked in, um, you know, taking moments, um, being out, you know, exercise, um, again, another really robust effect on well-being and reducing the kinds of regulatory problems that can lead to perpetration and harassment and all of these kinds of things, substance use, right? Um, so those, again, are, are things, um, again, research coming out about spending time outside, 
getting off, I was, you know, my colleague talking about getting rid of the phones, right? Taking a moment to just like building some of those things in. I think we all live and work and our campuses are, are no different with this sense of urgency and we've got to fit all this content in and we've, and, and there's a reality to some of that. But I still think there is a way to build out how we are living and interacting in our workspaces, in our learning spaces that can incorporate some of those practices where leaders can model some of those things and people can see some benefits. I love that. I think, you know, uh, typically when I think about these issues, and I know this is my my bias as an organizational psychologist, I always think, well, these things matter to performance and that's why we care about them. Of course, we care about individuals. We don't want bad things to happen. But, you know, when I think about the military, the bottom line is sometimes life and death. And so how do we, you know, create the context to, to protect teams and to protect individuals? Um, and so I, I like your point about also linking it to wellness and just creating that environment where, you um, people see the value beyond just, hey, we're going to prevent these things, but there are inherent values of doing these things just because. Um, uh, can they, I add on a little? Yeah, go, go ahead, Dr. Bosferi. Uh, one of the things I was, uh, I didn't say, but people want to do the right thing. All right. I think so many people want to do the right thing. And some of it is they don't know. That's the knowledge piece. What's the best thing to do? But um, like Dr. Banyard said, you don't have to do the best thing. You just have to do something, right? So like something could replace best thing. And um, how do we make people do what they already want to do? Destigmatize it. We're social creatures. If we don't want to be that guy or you know that person. Nobody wants to be that person. So make intervening involvement. And this is back to um, you know, the idea of bystander intervention. Um, when you think of it as an intervention, it certainly should be the last stage because we don't want the behaviors to happen. But it could be something as simple, this is a typology I developed, like believe it or not, almost 30 years ago. <laughs> and um, it's, it's interesting because now people care, very few cared back then. So it's kind of nice. But it could be something as simple as you see something happen, it's not egregious, but you're, you're kind of like, hmm, and you look around and no one else is saying anything, but everybody internally is going, hmm, right? So that's pluralistic ignorance. We all look at others for cues and we're like, all right, well, he doesn't, none of them seem upset. I must be overly sensitive. And, and you know how I am anyway, right? So that kind of thing, um, if we can get over that hurdle and have people know that just because other people don't look upset in their head, they could be like, oh, what am I going to do? What, will somebody do something so I don't have to do something, right? So, um, you know, I just keep coming back to that human behavior aspect of, of how do we do these things? And it doesn't have to be a bold gesture. It could just be talking to somebody after the fact or intervening in the sense of you see something and you're like, hey, Nancy, come over here for a minute. I have a question for you. Boom. Intervention, right? Dr. Bo Sperry, I think you would be a great uh, non-commissioned officer in our military, given um, your focus on uh, correcting the small things. That's one of the things that our, our NCOs who really uh, kind of set the rules for, for how things work in, in the military. That's, that's one of the things they tend to emphasize, that you can't walk past small things that need to be corrected because then they can become big things if left unaddressed. I love the way she delivered that, though. I mean, it could be just as simple as, dude, really? I mean, that's what you're doing right now. <laughs> you know? right. And that will change the scene that's going on at the bar or whatever the case may be. Maybe we can get a sign that just says, dude, really, and equip every person with it. And then Seriously, all you have to do is man. That. This like, that is... <laughs> and then if four people raise dude, really, then you're like, OK, we're good. <laughs> I, you know, it raises an interesting point. I, I think we tend to, um, in many cases, we think about these issues and the intervention piece as, as binary. You're either reporting or you're not. And, um, you know, as many of the folks on the panel today talk about, you know, some of the challenges around reporting and, you know, maybe something has not reached that level. And so what are some of the, what are some of the ways to have that conversation um, and, and I don't know if any of you have recommendations for what kinds of, of skills in that space you think we need to be teaching recruits or teaching students in terms of how do you just say, cause that can be a difficult or, or awkward conversation. How do you, how do you help people navigate that? 
I would, I'll offer, um, so we spend a lot in this space and, and I've seen it mostly in the operational force. Um, some units, for example, have a room that's dedicated and it's kind of like their, you know, it's where they can do a little role playing, if you will. Um, and I think it was probably a little more relevant years ago and I'll explain. So what I would, what you would see was like, okay, here's the bar scene. And you have leaders that are kind of um, going through a script to demonstrate what is inappropriate behavior for maybe some of the brand new soldiers that are coming in. So, you know, what it is that they saw earlier in life, they thought, oh, that's that was OK. I mean, that's what I did in high school, whatever the case may be. And we say, no, this is not appropriate behavior. Um, what is interesting, though, is the, the discussion we had a couple panels ago. Um, that bar scene is is not necessarily going to do it for us anymore because we've got folks that have accounts on Tinder and they're in the virtual environment. And so you get into the discussion we had earlier on where's the bystander intervention in this one and what is what does right look like in that particular environment? So we and I would love to hear the colleagues thoughts on this, too. I mean, what is the direction we've got to go to to make that influence as well? Yeah, I mean, I think that's such a good point. And I think Part of it is, is actually something I really admire about the military that I think campuses don't have as much developed. Some do, you know, there's more of a range, but the, you know, I, I think what you were talking about earlier about the values, about the, the collectivity, the working together, the sense of purpose, um, the sense of mattering. Like, I think that is something that is built into the military culture and system and training. And I think something that is, sometimes harder to do on a college campus. And yet we know that that kind of sense, it's the individual agency, but it's the tie to the collective, right? It's the we, it's the engaging other people. And I think that's the piece where it's taking it beyond in individual skills and your individual sign, which is important, right? Like you have to have that piece, but it's having training that allows you to have that conversation. Because I think to your point, whether it's online or the spaces where this is unfolding continue to change, right? So it like, maybe it was on Facebook like a hundred years ago when I was on social media, but now it's TikTok and now it's like something else that my children would say they use, right? And that's, those spaces are constantly evolving. And so I think when we go back to the strengths of how do you have conversations? How do you have difficult conversations? How do you regulate yourself? so that you can have those conversations and then how do you listen to other people? Those kind of things allow those things to then more organically so that when something new happens, you can kind of say, okay, that didn't feel quite right. How do we deal with this? Because we don't know what the next new situation is gonna be. That's such a, such a great point, Dr. Banyard. And I'm, you know, this is bringing me back to a comment that you made General Klein about uh, the shift away from the shark attack approach, you know, moving away from that in your face, yelling, kind of denigrating behavior. And I'm, I'm wondering how you respond to um, just some of the general perceptions that some folks have about, well, that's being, you know, soft on our soldiers and we need soldiers and sailors and Marines and airmen to be tough. And so how are we making sure that they're still tough um, if we're if we're not going to do these kinds of things, I'm, I'm wondering how you navigate that. Yeah, I am so glad you asked this question. This is a, this is a space I am very much into right now. Um, and honestly, had you asked me about five years ago, this if you know if I would be in this kind of discussion of you know bringing things like mindfulness into basic training, I I, I wouldn't have answered it this way. I'd be, I'd be completely blunt. I would say no. This is all about teaching individuals how to shoot, move, communicate, save lives. This is about jumping walls and putting rounds down range, that whole discussion. And that still is, you know, if you're watching the news, you see what's going on overseas, who knows what may, the future may hold. And we have got to be ready for that. But I, I, I say frequently, I have all the confidence in the world that our drill sergeants do an exceptional job of doing those things I just described, shooting, moving, communicating. We do that well. And I don't want to take away from that. That, can training, that training must continue. Um, where we struggle a little bit, though, is on this building, having an individual understand who they are, what their character is, what their own values are, what makes them tick, what drives them, what motivates them. This goes to the individual resiliency, because despite all the training that we will do and we will continue to do, 
we are losing way less lives due to gunshot wounds on the battlefield than we are in suicide. We are in all these other harmful behaviors. And so we have got to step up our game in this other area. I don't want to take away from the previous, but I've got to step up the game. And I would argue that, trust me, we can be very direct about teaching our soldiers what the standards are and imposing discipline without spitting in their face. It's actually, it's actually almost more powerful. If I can develop a, a connection with the soldier, if I can make this connection and I can instill a level of trust in that trainee, a mutual trust I have in him and he has in me, it is way more powerful than, um, I'll give you an example. When, it's, when a trainee screws up, the days of old would be to yell at him, tell him to do push-ups, roll over, do whatever, right? Now it may be, see, it might sound something like this. Come here, trainee. Um, Honestly, I thought you were going to do a little bit better in that particular task. I'm a little disappointed. And let's see if we can get after this again kind of thing. And this, I have introduced this, I may be a little bit disappointed. It's like a personal hit on the heart. You know, it's an individual that is like, ah, I've disappointed somebody that they immensely look up to. The drill sergeant is everything to these recruits. And so if the drill sergeant is able to develop this level of trust, it is way more powerful than anybody yelling in your face. Such a great point. I think about some of the the leaders I've worked for and, you know, just some missteps I've had through my own career and disappointing somebody that you really see as a mentor and and um, a trusted agent, just how like, oh, it's like gut wrenching because you never want to do it. It's just the worst feel. That's enough motivation to not do that again. Um, so I, I know we've got to go ahead. Go ahead, Dr. Bosberry. Oh, I, um, the general just literally, almost literally took the words out of my mouth. I wrote down coaching, not reprimanding. Um, tell, tell us a little bit more about that. So, you know, once again, human behavior, um, compliance versus internalization. I think this is a basic concept you learn maybe in Psych 101. To get somebody to behave in a way that you would like them to behave, compliance, they're only doing it when you're there right? Because they, they don't want to get caught. They don't want to get in trouble. That's like the low level of moral development. We don't, why don't we do things? Oh, because we might get smacked down. We might get spit in the face. We might have to roll, you know, whatever, whatever, jumping walls, we jump 10 more walls, whatever, whatever the punishment of the day is. Uh, versus with coaching, you're looking out for the person. So say if somebody says something that everyone's going, oh, dude, really, like we'll go with the dude, really thing. Dude, really? You can coach that person. You are looking out for them. You have because people are not perfect. I do stupid things every day. Let's follow me around and watch how many things I mess up. Not in a sexually harassing way. But what I'm saying is good people do bad things. People do questionable right. things. They may not even realize it. So you go in and you say something like, uh, dude, really? Are you trying to get fired? You know, I like you here. You're a great colleague. You bring so much to this unit, this division, this department, whatever it is. We don't want to, you know, you literally don't want to make a federal case out of it. But if we don't talk to that person and it just builds and builds and they think, oh, well, hey, I guess I'm funny. <laughs> I guess this is okay. And um, you're helping them. So if you frame it instead of like, I'm calling them out, I'm hurting them, I'm reprimanding, I'm threatening. No, I'm helping you keep your job is what, is what I'm doing. And I'm here on your behalf, um, as well as the person who you might be bothering this behalf. Those are such great points. And I'm, I'm, I see a number of questions coming through around. It looks like we only have time. We've got two minutes left. Um, I see a number of questions coming through a lot around leadership and, and engaging leaders. And I think you've, you've all um, touched on it a bit in terms of, you know, making these, the, the shifts from kind of this compliance and legal based focus to um, more of like a motivational is not the right word, but that values and ethics based approach that I think people just inherently um, have an easier time buying into. And I'm, I'm wondering what, strategies you've used to to help um, increase leadership, whether it's faculty, staff, um, you know, senior leaders or, or first line leaders even um, better, better make use of some of the concepts you're talking about today. How do we get that buy-in? I'll jump on initially. Um, and I'll, I'll, 
frame it a little bit differently. Every two weeks, I have the opportunity to um, address the company commanders, the next wave of company commanders that are coming in. They're part of their, their uh, company commander first sergeant course. And um, this goes kind of to the engaged leadership piece. And because there's a lot of folks out there that um, they say, you got you to gotta be engaged as a leader. It's, it's, it's all about engaged leadership. And, um, and we've got a variety of, of things that we, we teach, and, uh, and, and most of it is very good. But at the, at the risk of being simplistic, I will share with that audience, I said, there's two things that I know that will help make you successful. Um, one is that you've got to know, get to learn the members of your team below name tape deep. You've got to really care about who they are as individuals, their families, their hobbies, their interests, be involved in their lives. My boss says, he encourages, he says, uh, I, I want you to be um, positively intrusive. I want you to be involved in their lives. So that's number one, get to know them much deeper than just the name tape on their chest. And then, and the second one is you honestly got to give a damn. I mean, just to put it bluntly. So if an individual is calling you at one o'clock in the morning, that's your job. You pick up the phone and you get engaged with this individual. You talk about building trust with an individual that is on hard times and you come to their aid, that is, you know, it won't be broken. Yeah. That's unmatched. Yeah. Any and final say, comments? It looks like have to, got yeah, one. you have to do the same thing on a campus, right? So that, you know, sexual harassment and these kind of bully, bullying, these are not just problems our students on students, right? Like faculty are bullying other faculty and student like, so I think you make the program relevant to faculty, right? Because right. they are also in their own community. And so General Klein, I appreciate all your remarks today and that you do need faculty to see each other and their students as whole people, right? But I think you also need to, as, as conversations are happening in the academy, to change how the academy is built so that faculty are also building strengths in themselves. Um, and, and you see the relevance when you see that it works for you. Such a great point. Dr. Bosperi, did you have, oh, General Klein, you've got one more, and then we'll have, uh, we'll leave another minute for Dr. Bosperi since we're over no, time. I'm, just in, I'm in very much agreement with the doctor there, what she just oh, said. Oh, okay. Apologies. You were in violent agreement. Yes, yeah, so that, that was the thumb up. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I think that, um, you know, in terms of, uh, personal voice, right? Because I've talked a lot about bystander intervention, but um, getting people to, if you think about other things, communication broadly, persuasion, influence, de-escalation. Any skill you would learn in a leadership 101 about how do you persuade people? Well, the spit in the face we've ruled out already, you know, effective short-term maybe. Um, so if you just go to those basic types of concepts in terms of how do you de-escalate something, right? You yeah. wanna calm people down. You don't wanna elevate the situation. Um, and in terms of influence, you know, there's lots of principles that we teach when we talk about how do you influence, looking for mutual gain, right? So if it's I win, you lose, basic integrative, collaborative, the more you can make something about us instead of about you, it's going to be a good thing. I love that. Thanks so much, Dr. Bosper. I know we're out of time, everyone, and I've seen a number of comments come through from the audience about how helpful this session was. So thank you so much for the insights. And uh, we will we'll take a 10 minute break and then be on to our next um, session on healthy climates. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, panelists. I mean, this is, this is, I did not realize how much great information I was going to get today. And, um, you know, thank you for all those who worked to put this together. I know some people put in the comments and they think I did a lot of work. I, I'm just the host. I didn't do any hard work. I just show up the day of and everything just works. So, <laughs> um, but yes, thank you. We're going to take a 15 minute break. The code word for this session is celery. So we went from fruit to vegetable. Uh, I don't know who chose these because I really don't like celery. Probably wouldn't have been a choice of mine. However, uh, the word is, is celery and, and that is going to be the code for this session that just ended. We'll see you guys, see everyone back in about 15 minutes. For those on the phone call, I know sometimes people have missed it. The word is celery. It is up on the PowerPoint slide. And if you miss it, you can just ask in the question and answer uh, for the code. So thank you very much. And we'll be back in a few minutes.
Mm -hmm. I heard somebody. Audio checks. It's David Yamada. Oh, perfect. I can hear you loud and clear, and I saw you come on camera. Great. I've been watching the uh, uh, the Zoom recording uh, or the Zoom version uh, offline there. Nice. Great conference. Great conference. And it's uh, Rear Admiral Rebecca Patterson. I do apologize. We're trying to figure out if the laptop is perfectly uh, situated as well. So I hope you can hear me. Oh, yes. And I saw you come on as well, Admiral. Yes, I find Zoom is we're so used to MS Teams now. You get sort of brainwashed in setting yourself up on the camera. So now <laughs> I think I think I'm centered. I just ran from another meeting. So uh, get myself organized here. Awesome. Thank <laughs> Thanks very much for having me. Of course, thank you for being here. If you need me to tech check in, this is Kelly. Hello, Miss Kelly. I hear you, you not, Dr. Kelly, I see you on the, on the slide. I'm, this is hilarious, I'm not a doctor. Would you all keep promoting me? So I'm like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> And Kelly has said multiple times, like, hey, you guys need to fix this. And I do. But she always ends up as a doctor. And I'm like, look, you're just getting an honorary. <laughs> Thanks, Jessica. Because you're That's amazing. amazing. <laughs> Dr. Gallus, are you going to give me an honorary doctorate? I'm excited. I would if I could. I definitely <laughs> would. <laughs> well, clearly Hello, there's friends, friends in the Pentagon. Maybe make something happen. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> hey, thanks for joining us. Thanks. Thanks to all of you on this session. Um, it's just an honor to have you all on, on board. And I, I think the last session is a perfect segue into ours. So I, I like how you, uh, you set out the, uh, the agenda here. Yeah. Yeah. The, I think there are some nice introductions with, um, some of the areas that we covered, especially in terms of the bullying and just that climate piece. And I think these panels are amazing. And I do apologize for not being able to be part of the whole thing, but I'm looking at the panel that comes after us and I'm gonna make sure I don't encroach too much into that space as well. Thanks so much, ma'am. Hello, everybody. Just wanted to give, uh, we're going to start in a few minutes, and I do have the 
um, the codes for the all of the sessions, we should have a total of five. So if there's one that you may have missed for a session, just let us know the session that you missed and we can get that to you. I do see some questions coming in about that. So we're up to five total right now. My, 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 I'll tell you, this is like a scavenger hunt for these codes. Uh, <laughs> we're just getting some of the messages adjudicated. Again, if you missed any of the codes of the sessions for today, please reach out. And, um, and in the question and answer, we can make sure, uh, you know, we're go definitely going by the honor system, of course, but, you know, make sure if you missed a code, there should be five right now to enter at the end of the session, the end of the day. The link will go out to everyone who attended today for those that have missed it or need to go back and rewatch sessions. The, the link to submit these codes will be uh, emailed out and posted at the end of this event so you guys can, and can take it there. Um, as my next speakers are coming on, I'd like to just um, introduce uh, the moderator who is actually not a doctor, but I actually think she could be my best friend because she has a master's in, uh, let me see, let me, email went out. I just got a sent. Give me a second. Okay, yes. Uh, Kelly is a clinical social worker, which is my best friend. She's a clinical social worker and got her master's in criminal, uh, criminal justice, just like Kelly. Uh, but in her current role at the National uh, Oceanic and As Atmospheric Administration, Ms. Bonner oversees the creation and implementation of innovative sexual harassment and sexual assault prevention and response offices for all federal employees um, and contractors and affiliates with the agencies. Ms. Bonner has advanced training in workplace, workplace resilience. They gave me so many big words and I cannot read, I'm so sorry. And violence prevention on, on over a decade of experience working with victims and perpetrators of violence in the US and in Europe. Ms. Bonner believes the key to reducing workplace violence is creating a multidisciplined, comprehensive approach. And Ms. Bonner, the floor is yours. 
Thank you so much, Miss Floyd. And I got to meet your best friend. That's what that means. We all three of us have to be best friends now with that background. Welcome everyone to this panel. I'm so excited and honored to moderate it. This is all going to be about fostering professional cultures and climates through accountability. And to that end, this is an exciting topic because for so long we have talked about this topic in the context of individuals, whether it be bison intervention or supporting people who are impacted by this issue or victimized by these inappropriate negative behaviors. And while that is great, we wanna to continue to further that work, we really wanna to push to look a little bit broader and to look at context being everything and that team members, leadership, and organizations play a key role in mitigating negative behaviors. And to that end, we have some incredible panelists today. We have Mr. David Yamada, Real Admiral Rebecca Patterson, and Ms. Keita Salazar-Thompson. I'm gonna introduce each one of them one at a time and then allow them to have their time to bless us with their expertise before moving on to the next person. So first up is going to be Mr. David Yamada. Mr. David Yamada is a professor of law and the director of the New Workplace Institute at Suffolk University Law School. He's a globally recognized authority on workplace bullying and psychological abuse. He wrote the first comprehensive law review article on workplace bullying and his model legislation known as the Healthy Workplace Bill has become the template for enacted and proposed workplace anti-bullying laws and ordinances in the US. Professor Yamada was recently recognized for his work on workplace bullying in the field of law and psychology as one of the members who inspire feature in the American Bar Association membership magazine. Mr. Yamada is frequently free a featured speaker at conferences in such fields as employment law and policy, organizational psychology, and labor relations. He's often sought out by the media on these topics, and this include the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the Boston Globe, and the Chronicle of Higher Education, to name a few. Mr. David Yamada, we're going to turn it over to you to listen to what you have to say in this field. Thank you very much, Kelly, and thank you to the Department of the Navy and Howard University for hosting this wonderful program. Um, when I say it's an honor to participate uh, in a conference, uh, especially one hosted by the Navy, uh, I mean it in more than just an obligatory sense. And I'd like to share a very short story. Uh, I, I've been a lifelong civilian, but I have very dear friends who have served in the Navy and other branches of the military. Uh, and one of them in particular who passed away several years ago, his name was Brian McCrane. He was Annapolis class of 53. Uh, Brian served on and commanded uh, destroyers during the heart of the Cold War. Among the many stories I've heard are when he served as a senior officer on the USS Waller, a destroyer, during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And the Waller was one of the destroyers on the quarantine line that helped to surface a Soviet submarine. And it's stories like that that gave me a, a real special respect for uh, what folks in the military do, uh, the, the life stakes that are uh, you know, on the line there. And uh, so for those uh, and, and other reasons, I'm very grateful for this invitation. Um, I would like to uh, use my time to center on legal and policy aspects of the kinds of mistreatment we're talking about today, as well as introduce um, a, a term that was especially prevalent in the last panel, which is one of bullying behaviors, because that has been my focus in addition to looking at issues of sexual harassment and discrimination. So a um, little bit of a frame. If you see an organization where sexual assault and harassment are occurring, I will bet that if you scratch beneath that awful surface, you will also find a lot of bullying behaviors going on as well, generic kind of abuse. Um, that's one of the major lessons that we're learning about investigations coming out of the Me Too era. Um, I also want to emphasize military settings, military work settings, although a lot of what I'm gonna say is relevant to higher ed because unfortunately we know that there's so many of these behaviors uh, in higher ed. So with that said, I don't have PowerPoints. There is a handout that was distributed. If you don't get the handout, you can email me for it. It's a short one pager. But anyway, let's talk about bullying first. How do we define it? 
Well, for purposes of this talk, I'm going to go right to the Navy's own definition picked off of the Navy HR site, and I'll just read it quickly. Bullying is a form of harassment that includes acts of aggression by service members or DOD civilian employees with a nexus to military service with the intent of harming a service member either physically or psychologically without proper military or other governmental purpose. There's a little bit more to that definition, but that's really the heart. And that's what I'm using sort of as my base of understanding for when I talk about bullying. Now, I think it's important then to remember that this is a form of interpersonal abuse. Um, this is not a bad day in the office. This is not an ordinary dust up. We're talking about people mistreating each other very harshly. Um, I also want to mention a few things about the military context that I think we have to put out there because what might, one might see as bullying in a civilian context might be very different in the military one. I think we have to recognize that in the military, there is a heightened need for physical and psychological resilience. That's just it, life and death stakes. It's not like onboarding at uh, Walmart. It's not like orientation at a university. Uh, there's a lot more at stake, life and death. And it, it, it addresses or it, it pertains also to the centrality of the chain of command and the need for top performance in acute situations. Um, therefore, we have to look hard at the importance of unit cohesion and morale. Well, in, in that broader context, what are we talking about the costs of bullying, harassment, uh, sexual mistreatment and abuse? Um, obviously the personal impacts are severe. Uh, we're talking about physical and psychological health. Uh, PTSD enters the picture. And as we've heard during the course of this conference at times suicidal ideation is part of the unfortunate consequences that we see. Um, but more to the point when it comes to the military, folks, this is about performance, uh, bullying, harassment, sexual assault, poor performance and morale at a unit level. Um, in preparing for my remarks, I looked over some of the, the military uh, press and, for example, read about accounts of captains being relieved of their commands because of reading between the lines, bullying type behaviors that just sank the morale of that ship uh, into the ground. So it's about performance. It's about making sure that the things that we need to get done, get done. Well, what is the legal context of all of this? I'm gonna talk about legislation in sort of a big L and small L sense. The big L being laws and regulations, the small L being um, internal rules and policies. The big L in a quick nutshell is we can start with the Uniform Code of Military Justice for those of you in service. Um, the two key provisions that I found were Article 92, which is the failure to obey an order or regulation. Uh, those orders and regulations pertaining to um, abuse and bullying. And then we have Article 93, which is cruelty and maltreatment. Uh, I know that this has been invoked uh, for sexual assault and harassment, and it can also apply to bullying behaviors. On the civilian side, we have civil rights laws, uh, such as Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, um, and also uh, Title IX of the Education Amendment. So we've got the employment side and the education side um, covered in, in, in those laws. Um, unfortunately, some of these behaviors uh, invoke criminal laws, and uh, that includes uh, 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 allegations of, of sexual assault. Now, what about bullying? Um, as one of the speakers in the last session noted, uh, workplace bullying is uh, generally legal in the United States. Um, I've been attempting to remedy that by drafting a model statute called the Healthy Workplace Bill uh, that provides folks with a cause of action for severe workplace bullying and also gives employers uh, incentives to reduce their uh, exposure to liability by acting preventively and responsively to bullying risks. 
Um, the statute has been, or the model legislation has been introduced in various state legislatures over the years. We are getting closer and closer to the point where this will be enacted someday in full. Um, so far, we're not there yet, uh, but there are a handful of states, including California and Utah and Tennessee, that have taken parts of this model legislation uh, to enact statutes that require various forms of employee training and education about bullying behaviors. Well, in that void, what are we looking at? Um, we're looking at a lot of small L legislation, and by that I mean internal rules, policies, procedures to address bullying and related behaviors. I think that the the key in uh, the, the key dual inquiry internally is that in the context of your own institutional culture, when do these behaviors cross over the line and become abusive, and what responses are appropriate? Again, context matters, right? Behaviors that are meant to uh, create more resilience in uh, in the military uh, might be harsher and tougher than those that might be involved in, in onboarding at Target. So I think that the, the context has to be taken into account. I also think we have to focus on preventing and stopping abuse while encouraging in a more positive sense, accountability, respect, and dignity. For those reasons, I disagree with those who think we should be instituting a bunch of what we call civility codes, where we're sort of micromanaging everyday communications. And I think those types of approaches would be especially problematic uh, in a military context. Uh, I also think that coaching and counseling could be uh, appropriate uh, remedies in, in the cases of trying to basically uh, rescue careers that otherwise are promising and that could contribute a lot to our armed forces. Um, and I think the key thing here is that implementation and follow-up are, are very uh, challenging in those tough situations where you've got somebody who otherwise is valuable but is uh, treating people very abusively. So, uh, it's, I've got about 30 seconds to go. I'm just going to say that uh, I'm going to close by saying that laws and rules at best are complements to quality leadership. So I'm going to echo what people have been saying all day here today. Uh, good leadership can benefit from using some of the guideposts I've suggested. Um, but without good leadership, uh, you're going to have problems nonetheless. And so for those of you um, who have brass on your shoulders or have corner offices, uh, I'm going to make a special plea for your continued commitment uh, to addressing the kinds of behaviors um, that have been so uh, importantly uh, raised at this conference. So with that, I will turn it back uh, to our moderator uh, and look forward to uh, hearing my, uh, my uh, uh, co-panelists. Uh, Kelly, back to you. Thank you, Mr. Yamada. We really appreciate all the wisdom you just gave us, particularly highlighting the intersectional lens of these bullying behaviors with all these other inappropriate behaviors, including sexual violence or misconduct, the list goes on, and also giving us those tools with those big L's and little L's with the legislation and laws, how we can use them and utilize them as leaders, right, to give us what we need, the tools we need to enforce and create a culture of accountability. Thank you so much, sir. Next up, we have Rear Admiral Rebecca Patterson. Rear Admiral Rebecca Patterson is the Chief of Staff of Professional Conduct and Culture for the Canadian Armed Forces. She has held a number of senior leader positions and has held a, led a number of critical missions throughout her military career. She enrolled in the Canadian Armed Forces as a critical care nursing officer and has led and directed national level medical planning in support of missions at home and abroad to include leading a large primary care health center. She has held numerous command positions and she has deployed to the Persian Gulf conflict, Somalia, Afghanistan, where she supported or led NATO efforts to reestablish medical and training systems. She received a CDS commendation for saving the life of a critically injured citizen while deployed to Somalia. Rear Admiral, ma'am, the floor is yours. 
So thank you very much. And uh, it is a true honor to be here. This is uh, not my first attendance at one of these national discussions and it was pre-COVID was my last go. And so I'd like to thank the Department of the Navy as well for uh, welcoming me back as well as Howard University. I love these conversations. I might be Canadian, but I learned from you and hopefully I can give you a few morsels and let you know where the Canadian Armed Forces is going. And it turns out to be very fortuitous that I'm following Dr. Dr. Because what I'm actually going to talk to you about is the prevention space. We talk about leadership accountability and what does that mean. So I'm going to basically talk on that prevention pillar. So of course I have my normal disclaimer slide. It's uh, this is an unclassified briefing. I will talk to slides that come from uh, the Canadian Armed Forces, but again the opinions are all mine. So we talk about building healthy work environments, which is really what the focus is, is we will always have to have a requirement to deal when people have been harmed by the culture in which they find themselves. But the Canadian Armed Forces has been on this journey for a while. And uh, while we have certainly made some progress in helping those who are harmed, we've also realized that uh, we have to do a better job at trying to get at, well, the prevention space, but let's talk about the root causes within a military environment. So I need to give you, just for context, because we have a large, large audience here to understand who, who we are. So we obviously, uh, I come from a different country and I come from a, uh, a slightly different uh, political system. I come from an integrated Canadian Armed Forces, which includes Army, Navy, Air Force and Special Forces. And we're only about 75,000 people total. But we also have a, a civilian component, which takes us to, you know, about 90,000 people. So we're much smaller. We also have a vertically integrated chain of command, which means that our most senior leadership, including positions that I am in right now, uh, have uh, policy um, and leadership control over the Army, Navy, Air Force and uh, special forces. And again, it depends on the domain we're talking about. The other thing is, uh, for any of you who do uh, raise your eyes to the north, um, you may be aware that in uh, 2021, um, we basically are uh, hashtag me too came to a crisis and uh, we actually lost two chief of defense staffs, um, as well as a number of senior general officers and flag officers to both historic and current cases of sexual misconduct and abuse. And uh, we have been working in the same domain as uh, US forces in terms of trying to deal with um, sexual violence and sexual abuse. And uh, while this has been a very um, devastating moment for our forces, it's also been a success in that people are stepping forward, but we have to do better. So my focus today is definitely gonna be on where are we going now? Because obviously the work we have done in the past has not been enough to create safe and inclusive work environments for Canadians who choose to serve in our military. So therefore, our focus now is on building healthy work environments. And the pillar I'm going to talk about is leadership and leadership accountability. We all know that in any uh, uh, culture change management, you talk about leadership and the role of leadership in terms of that uh, changing the environment in order to create safe and inclusive work environments. So one thing that has been very beneficial of these very challenging times that we found ourselves in is uh, we have started to address a whole of department look at, at um, addressing uh, harm and abuse uh, to our people. And uh, so we have stood up a new organization of which I now belong to, which is the Chief of Professional Conduct and Culture. Not only does uh, uh, my uh, Lieutenant General not only report to the heads of our department in the form of the Chief of Defense Staff and our Deputy Minister, but also to our Minister of National Defense and is accountable for all the coordinated change initiatives. The other thing I'm going to very briefly talk to you about is uh, getting at the heart of some of those issues that Dr. Uh, Mr. Yamada um, talked to you about. What sort of initiatives are we doing to create inclusive leaders and hold them accountable? And uh, so you're going to see a number of different, uh, different things come up here. So first and foremost, let's have a look at leadership and where it works. So as part of this crisis, our Chief of Defense Staff, uh, General Wayne Eyre, 
came forward and said, we know leadership is not only responsible for getting us into this crisis, but also for getting us out of it. And one of the most important things that we have come across is the fact that our leadership has set down the tenants for moving forward. In other words, creating a diverse and equitable work environment where everybody can bring their full selves to work and feel meaningful and not be worried about experiencing harm. You will see in front of you his 10 tenants that he spoke to us about. He talked to us about ownership, meaning leadership must own the current environment, both for where we have been in the past and where we are now and where we need to go in the future. He talked about using opportunity and rather this being just a top-down led initiative in order to create that safe, diverse and inclusive environment is that we need to work with organic initiatives at the tactical level while providing guidance, shaping and listening at the most strategic. His focus has also been on the characters of the leaders. It is very easy for militaries to fall into rules-based application of trying to control a problem. And what we actually realize is that we have to develop people who can not only do a rules-based uh, leadership, but also are character-based leaders who know how to create safe and, and psychologically safe work environments and know how to manage and be held accountable for their behavior towards um, their fellow teammates and for the subordinates. The next thing that he talked about is loyalty. Loyalty has been in the past, especially in military structures, tend to be somewhat blind. It's loyalty to your boss. It's loyalty to your organization. And while there remains that place, we cannot forget that we are also loyal to the people that we lead and that we take into harm's way. He talked about accountability and accountability, not only in a rules based fashion, what's right, what's wrong, what are the consequences of doing that, but also accountability for being a leader who is inclusive. The next thing we looked at is humility, probably not something we tend to associate with many military leaders, but humility is absolutely essential in order to create an environment where you have many intersections of identity that can make people feel lesser than. Being a humble and uh, a leader who shows humility in everything they do is also one of the 10 tenants that we need to move forward in order to create these safe environments. He's focused on leadership development because what you measure, what you evaluate, is what people are willing to do. Leader development that not only focuses on the profession of arms and the execution of our tasks, but also developing us in our ability to, to listen meaningfully to people, to be willing to accept criticism in a respectful way, and also to be able to evaluate people um, in their execution of being these humble leaders. Communication being key, how we communicate, what we communicate, and as well as focusing very, 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 very carefully and being very determined in our desire to move forward with culture change. In other words, creating these environments where people can be safe. So what I'm going to do now is give you kind of three things that we are doing that we realize we have to do differently from in the past. And one of them that we have been able to do because of our very structure is to stand up a new level one organization, as I had said earlier, who reports directly to the chief of defense staff, to the deputy minister, as well as the minister of national defense. And I'm very sorry if I don't have a direct equivalent. Um, under our mandated functions, you will sort of see five buckets, functional areas that work in the prevention response and, uh, and sorry, I'm, I've got some issues with my slides here. Prevention and response and support space. Um, policy engagement and research, which we all do. One of the big challenges that the Canadian Armed Forces has had is actually translating that data, translating that research into something that's meaningful. We have actually looked at a functional pillar where we focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and what that means in Canada and in accordance with Canadian law. We've looked at culture change and how we're going to actually execute that on a whole of defense teams, military and civilian wide, in order to create this preventive space. How we professionally conduct ourselves and develop all of our people within, um, within our organization is also a critical pillar of this change, of which I know there are other uh, groups that talk about it. And finally, when there has been harm caused, it's the support that we provide to people who have been harmed. 
and to ensure that we are trying to meaningfully um, resolve conflict so we can continue to build strong teams where people wish to, to work and wish to remain and belong. So where do we go from here? I said I would cover uh, three initiatives that are underway. We've talked about um, having guiding documents. I cannot help where I come from. I am a, 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 a child of a military environment and I look at our ethos. And this is actually a, a brand new document that was underway and looking at our ethical principles and our military values beyond the ability of ourselves to recite what the content is of this. It's also a document that's going to help us live and to embody the values that we see as absolutely essential to create diverse and equitable teams and, uh, and continue to move forward on culture change. The next thing that we are also doing is we've always talked about, we measure what we value and we value what we measure. So one of the first initiatives across the start line for us was looking at building into measures of inclusive behaviors in all of our people from the most junior rank of ordinary sailor right through to admiral to make sure that everything that is done uh, focuses in around not only technical proficiency in what they do and process proficiency, but also how the behaviors that they have that create these inclusive work environments. And we are focusing on psychological safety. You can certainly hear some, some dialogue that says psychological safety and military operational effectiveness are incompatible. And in my Canadian context, I would beg to differ. The most psychologically resilient people are the ones who feel psychologically safe in their day-to-day -day work. They're more ready and able to handle the um, extreme unknown that comes with being a warfighter. The next thing uh, we have also looked at is we are um, not unlike uh, the United States, where we also have legislated influences that, that in terms affect what we do. So we have reached, when we say bill, just like yourselves, uh, this is how our laws uh, go through and are passed through both our federal uh, level uh, uh, parliaments and senates. And uh, there is now a law that talks about the requirement to deal with uh, harassment, interpersonal violence and abuse, regard regardless of the type that it is. What is very unique within our, uh, our Defense Department, and I believe it is also like in the US, is that as a member of the Canadian Armed Forces, federal um, bills such as this do not necessarily um, apply. In the past, the Canadian Armed Forces has used that as a reason to be special or unique or exclusive. But what we do know now is that that is not acceptable. So any policy that is built, that, that works or program uh, that is built, must work for both our civilian uh, teammates as well as our military personnel. And we do move forward with trying to create these safe work environments that is embodied and entrenched in legislation with suitable policies. This would be the rule-based application. So I've tried to speed through this very quickly because I know we need to leave time for questions. So I hope I'd like to leave you with kind of some of the parting words that have come from our Chief of Defense Staff. And he talks about being seized with this moment to truly use uh, the very unique and difficult space the Canadian Armed Forces has seen. And with that, I refer to losing two chiefs of defense staff uh, to, to uh, historical sexual misconduct allegations. And to use this initiative to truly make absolutely evolutionary change in how we do business within defense. Because we know in our current world with what's going on in Ukraine right now is that we must maintain an effective and operational ready force that welcomes all Canadians. And with that, I'll pass the floor back and I look forward to the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Rear Admiral. This is incredible, your discussion of how just comprehensive leadership engagement is. It's definitely something for us, as you said, to look to our neighbor in the north and learn from uh, continuing on. So thank you so much. Uh, we will go on to our next, uh, last but not least, panelist, which is Ms. Kita Salazar-Thompson. Welcome her to turn her camera on. All right. Hi, Kita. So Kita has spent more than 14 years of experience in international development. She's currently the coordinator at USAID's Action Alliance for Preventing Sexual Misconduct and the Respectful, Inclusive, and Safe Environments Learning and Engagement Platform. 
Through these efforts, Ms. Salazar Thompson is helping USA promote human dignity, foster accountability, and advance diversity, equity, and inclusion and access in its workplace and programs. Prior to her current role, uh, Ms. Salazar Thompson led strategy development, scenario planning, and program cycle capacity building for USAID's Military East Bureau, Middle East, excuse me, East Bureau. She also served as USAID Senior Desk Officer for the West Bank in Gaza and as the Afghanistan Donor Coordination Lead in the USAID's Office of Afghanistan and Pakistan Affairs. Before joining USAID, she worked with the National Center for Refugee and Immigrant Children, part of the US Committee on Refugees and Immigrants. We will turn it over to Keita. Great, thanks Kelly. And uh, thank you so much to the Department of Navy for hosting this conversation, to my fe fellow panelists, um, Mr. Yamada and Admiral Patterson. I am learning as we go and I love it. Um, I'm coming at these issues from a, a different perspective, and that's why I love this panel. Um, and so hopefully I can round out some of some of the contributions of my fellow panelists. So uh, at USAID, which is the US Agency for International Development, um, we've been looking at these issues of what it takes to create a respectful, inclusive, and safe environment for the last several years. And to give you a little bit of that origin story, this started, at least for me, four years ago, at the time that USAID stood up our Action Alliance for Preventing Sexual Misconduct. Uh, then USAID leadership at the time realized that there was a lot going on in the world. There was Me Too. There were scandals emerging in the international development and humanitarian aid space about the sexual exploitation and abuse of communities by aid workers. And all of this led rise to a conversation about what it really meant to create a culture that not only prevented these things, but also responded in survivor-centered manners and help a culture that would allow us to hold each other accountable um, while also growing and moving forward. So all of that to say that the very outset of the Action Alliance, we were looking at this issue of sexual misconduct and I'll separate out what we were doing in our programs for the sake of today's discussion. But we said within USA's workplace, what can we do to better prevent and address sexual misconduct? And I include within that a range of things, right? Sex, it's at the whole spectrum of behaviors. And that's really important to understand everything from inappropriate jokes, comments, touching all the way to criminal, um, criminal offenses, right? Rape, sexual violence, et cetera, and everything in between sexual harassment. Um, as we started to look at this, we realized a couple of things. So first of all, we realized that we couldn't just treat this issue in a silo. It's really common for organizations to think we've got a problem. And so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna narrowly focus on this problem and this will be our top priority. And we're gonna give it everything without taking that step back and saying, let's look at our overall system and our overall culture. And how is that contributing or enabling this particular issue set? So when it comes to sexual misconduct, but when it comes more broadly to creating what my fellow panelists have described as a healthy, a safe, a respectful workplace, we really have to think about the overall system. And within that, because I work at USAID and we're big, big systems thinkers, we need to be thinking about what, what we sometimes refer to as the five R's, right? We need to think about the results that we want. What are the roles of the people within that? What are the rules? Who controls the resources? And what are the relationships between the different stakeholders, the different individuals? And within that, we really need to pay attention to different things like power dynamics and other types of norms that may influence this behavior. This is especially important at a place like USAID because like many other organizations, we are a global organization. So not only do we have our workforce located in Washington, DC, but we have staff located in more than a hundred countries around the world. And that includes US staff, but it also includes many, many staff who represent their countries of origin or our host country partners and who are native to those countries. And so we're talking about uh, an organization of just about 15,000 people with it has to deal with hundreds, if not, uh, well, I won't want to say thousands, that's a dead rate, but it has to deal with many, many different cultural nuances when it comes to these types of issues. Another thing that we realized at the outset was that if we were really going to change culture, if we were gonna really change that system around how we create respectful, inclusive and safe environments, that it would be something that would take a lot of time. 
In fact, we talked to other colleagues, we talked to interagency counterparts and other organizations that had embarked on these kinds of projects. And what they told us is that if you're gonna do something other than a check the pox approach, you need to budget years. In fact, some of them told us five years, some of them told us 10 years. And so from the very outset, we messaged to our leadership that taking effective action in this space would require time and sustained investment, attention and commitment from USAID leadership. I also wanna be really clear. I have some things to share about what USAID is doing, but by no means do we have all the answers. In fact, I feel like every single day I learn something new, I discover a new aspect of this particular issue set that needs attention. And I think what you're hearing from others is that there are many different organizations testing out different methods and approaches in this space. And I think that commitment to learning is also really important. Part of that is because our workspaces continue to evolve. Just think about the last few years, what we would have talked about in terms of creating respectful, inclusive and safe environments pre-pandemic might look different than what we talk about now and the attention that we need to spend and put toward cyberspaces, digital engagements, keyboard warriors, uh, as a colleague recently called um, one phenomenon. So we have to realize that our workplaces and our workforces continue to evolve. And that means that our approaches to these issues have to evolve too. And they have to be grounded to the extent that they can in evidence, in learning, and just as importantly, in the felt experience of the people who make up our workforces and who make up our organizations. I can't stress this enough. You heard um, Admiral Patterson talk about moving from the sort of rules-based to more character-based leadership approach. I would argue that when it comes to creating respectful, inclusive and safe environments, we have to move away from that sort of rules or compliance based approach to a human centered approach, very much grounded in principles of human centered design, which I saw references to some of the other things, but also just in terms of that lived felt experience, which really honors the diversity of our workforce and the many different experiences, identities and perspectives that they bring to the table. So, what have we done at USAID? I'll just give a couple of examples. And I'm gonna focus most of this around not just the sexual misconduct work, but around what has come to be called our respectful, inclusive, inclusive and safe environments or RISE platform. RISE evolved as a happy accident. When we were looking at designing training for our staff around sexual misconduct, we realized that we didn't want to operate in a vacuum. And the more we start talking to other stakeholders who are dealing with issues like broader harassment, discrimination, workforce safety, staff wellness and resilience, the more we talk to folks about this, we realized that there were a lot of intersections around these issues. And then we also realized that many of us had been training or engaging with staff on these issues in completely separate siloed efforts. So what we did is we came together and we said, what would it look like if we actually brought all of these pieces into one place and created a program? What it started out initially is a one week in-person training program that wove together these different elements. That was the very beginnings of what became the RISE platform. It included things like the elements of civility and respect, bystander intervention, courageous conversations, unpacking micro messages in the workplace, it included a, a module on managing stress and building resilience and modules for managers and supervisors about how to manage misconduct and other modules around how to engage respectfully, prevent harassing behavior, um, sexual violence awareness, et cetera. And so we brought together this program. And as we started to test it, as we started to pilot it with our staff around the world, we realized there's something here. When COVID hit, we had to flip that into a virtual program. And I'm actually really proud to say that weaving together these themes and taking very much a learning approach where we've collected feedback from staff, where we've tested different models, where we've moved more and more towards scenario-based practical application has yielded a lot of results. However, I will focus for right now just on the scale of it. Since we officially launched this, we have trained more than 5,000 people at the agency. That number continues to grow. More than 50% of USAID leaders have attended at least one RISE training or event, and that number also continues to grow. 
And we continue to see a lot of interest from other organizations who are looking at not just taking a siloed approach to these issues, but asking themselves, what are the foundational concepts, learning and awareness that we want to promote within our workforce so that we're not just focused on the compliance or the incident response, but we're actually thinking holistically about the system and what are the skills, the competencies and the awareness that our staff need to make that system a reality, that respectful, inclusive and safe environment. So, I'm going to stop now because I want to make sure we have plenty of time for comments. I just want to reiterate what we've heard from the others. I think it's so important. Leadership absolutely must and should play a role in this. I would also say leadership at all levels. And in terms of that accountability that we were just hearing about from others, I would say that we need to move away from this hierarchical top-down accountability, which is too often what we over rely on. And we need to start thinking about how we build systems where as peers, as colleagues, as people, fellow people and organizations, we can hold each other accountable in a positive and respectful way for the kind of workplace that we want to see. I say this every day when we do trainings through RISE, but I'll say it again, workplace cultures are co-created we create them each and every day through the way things we do, the actions we take, whether they're small or large. Um, and I have to give credit to Dr. Christine Porath because that comes straight from her. Uh, it's a wonderful concept. So I'll end there. Thank you so much, Kita. That was just wonderful. And you did a little bit of my job with summarizing this. So I feel like you've kind of done my gig for me, but I'm going to try to follow up this act and say that I am not much of a cook these days, but I feel like we are creating a recipe where there were all the ingredients to a healthy, safe work environment were on this panel right? We talked about, you know, with the Admiral, her talking about leadership in a, in a much more expansive concept. Kita, you mentioned, and again, you re-echoed that rules-based leadership to more character-based leadership, expanding those tenets to include humility and loyalty, really expanding what it means and what true leadership accountability looks like. It's owning that the problem starts at the top, and therefore there has to be some expansive approach to fixing it. Um, that level of accountability truly is something to be marveled at and is key in creating a healthy and safe environment. And then we talked about organizations and their piece in this, that really as an organization, it's not about silos, which has been far too long. I think one of the biggest the basic things that are holding us back is what I would say from really getting to the meat of this issue and tackling this is that you cannot handle this issue in a silo. It cannot just be about sexual abuse or misconduct or discrimination on this side or just abusive conduct or as Mr. Yamada brought out, he used interpersonal abuse, that it has to be handled together and that it has to be done with everyone playing a part and coming together to deal with this as RISE shows with that respectful, inclusive and safe environments. It is a comprehensive look that pulls in all the stakeholders to give one concise presentation. And then, of course, last but not least for Mr. Yamada, your great overview of the fact that leaders need some tools, right? They need teeth to be able to be impactful and effective. And those big L's and little L's, and I love that, dis that separation, right? The big L's are the laws and the legislation. We need those to guide us. But then empowering ourselves as organizations and leaders to do those little L's, our policies, our procedures, how we day-to-day -day do operations, and to do that with some teeth to it, right? That it's not meaningful if it's just words on a page and understanding that these issues above all are intersectional. We cannot, again, to reinforce that point, just deal with one piece. Oh, we're just gonna deal with workplace bullying. They never occur in silos either. I've also, in my experience, they always co-occur with all of these unhealthy behaviors. So thank you for this panel and there are questions. So I wanna to get to these questions now and have plenty of time, but I wanted to make sure we hit again on some of those highlights. I'm gonna to go to the first question, which is for you, ma'am, the Rear Admiral Patterson. And that is, I see Canada as fairly homogeneous compared to the US. What does diversity and inclusion mean to you in the Canadian forces? Oh, that's a fabulous question because you know, when you live next door to an elephant, every time the elephant rolls over, the people on the other side get smacked. That's how Canada sees himself. And while we, we may have that appearance, I, I wish to reassure you, we're just a smaller version of, of the challenges that you face. So, but thank you for that. 
uh, I think where where it comes in, I'm going to talk about diversity first, because for me and for the Canadian Armed Forces, this is where diversity in Canada is really more of a rules based piece. When I say that we have legislation, we have um, uh, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which is um, the Constitution. It's the thing that, that tells you who must be included in Canadian society and that cannot be discriminated against. So that would be what represents diversity. When I start to get to the people level, um, I think we also have to be very cognizant, and I'm going to get into the inclusion space here, which is really about people, is that um, militaries tend to be young. Uh, Canadian Armed Forces average age is sitting in that 18 to 35 to 40 bubble. You know, so the majority of our population sits in that bubble space. Um, most of them have grown up in, I mean, these are my kids, you know, they've grown up in an environment where, what do you mean diversity? Of course, diversity. But where the challenges remain and that we aren't different from you is in the inclusion space. And so inclusion for us in the Canadian Armed Forces is really where um, looking at diversity and inclusion uh, comes into the equity space. So I'm going to tell you, we have um, legislated groups. We also have language rights in Canada as well, as you know, French and English, which is quite colonial in structure, I have to admit, but it is it is another intersection that we have to consider. But what we're actually looking at is the elements of the humanity. And Kira, I really appreciated your comment about being human centric, trauma informed, evidence based in what we are trying to do. And when we I had to put notes down because I thought you did great steps of notes. Um, and so when we're looking at it from a, a Canadian Armed Forces perspective, we're actually looking at inclusion, meaning people reaching their full potential as they are, what they bring to the table. And then it may mean I look at barriers and whether it be policy barriers, programming barriers, uh, recruitment, career paths, whatever, training barriers. The other thing is, is that we also look at um, inclusion, meaning can the person contribute to their full potential? Because there's reaching your potential, but there's contributions. And then finally, and for me, which is the most challenging space that really is an outcome of change, is do you feel like you belong? You bring who you are to the table, no matter who you are, uh, and that you actually belong. And this is the space that we're navigating in when it comes to what inclusion means to us. So therefore, as we move forward and we try to shape the space into operational effectiveness, because the Canadian Armed Forces, as we always say, it, it, it's not, it's not a, a social welfare agency. We must, uh, we are the profession of arms is making sure that everything that we do allows us to be more operationally effective when we actually uh, uh, conduct defense on behalf of the nation. And I think I heard a very, very good, interesting uh, uh, point today in the meeting I was just at. And it's because we are one team, public servants and uh, members of the Canadian Armed Forces, is that um, our public servants are able to look at conflict of interest, whereas the focus for the Canadian Armed Forces is conflict. But it's where we we can be collaborative in order to make the best culture uh, as we move forward. So that's what I would add to the table. Thank you so much. There's one more question that a little bit expands on this. It asks, how are the Canadian forces and USAID's efforts to prevent gendered and sexual violence connected to global women, peace and security initiatives, or are they not? Peter, do you wanna go first and I'll follow up? Yeah, absolutely. So they are absolutely interconnected, especially when you think about the principles behind them and what we're trying to, to achieve in our, for instance, women, peace and security efforts, um, both in our programs and sort of in a national security level for the US government. Um, what I would say is that uh, those, those goals, which are very high, high level overarching, um, which often are looking externally at our programs, a lot of what we're doing through RISE and through the Action Alliance is saying, how do we take those things and point that lens at our own organization and make sure this is a point when we're working with organizations, we're working with our implementing partners, I reinforce all the time, make sure there's consistency across it. Uh, we see this all the time in the news when you see scandals emerge, organizations who get in trouble for various various things around this space that oftentimes they may have had really great policies or principles on one side of the house, maybe on the program side, maybe on the external facing, they had a great set of policies, processes, procedures, but when you look at their own workforce, there wasn't a consistency with how those were applied there or vice versa. 
maybe at headquarters level, you've got a great code of conduct. You've got systems, processes, but you never do anything with your folks who are located overseas on the grounds and communities to uh, let them know what their rights, roles, responsibilities are. And so you get these gaps that expose not just organizations to risk, but much more importantly, real people to harm. And so, um, I would say that those broader women, peace and security objectives, like I said, examining power dynamics, uh, elevating the voices of the people we serve, especially women and girls, but others, LGBTQ+, um, other underrepresented groups and groups that are more vulnerable in certain contexts, elevating their voices and bringing them to the table as partners. I think all of those things are very consistent with those, those higher level principles. But Admiral Patterson, I'd love to hear what you have to say too. So, so I love that. And I think it's a great segue because we're actually talking about uh, um, culture here. And the one thing that Canada has definitely realized is um, we signed that UNHCR, I can't remember the number, sorry, uh, on women, peace and security as a country. And we go out there and we're part of the LC initiative and we've done a lot of work there. And some of the principles are making sure that the voices of women and girls, we've added men and boys and, and other um, uh, equity seeking groups are actually heard in the peace process. But when we put the mirror back on ourselves, we weren't doing it ourselves. So it's very hypocritical to go out there and start wagging your finger like a good colonial master that you need to do this and not do it yourselves. So the one thing that, I mean, we felt uncomfortable, which is usually the best place to start with change and looking at women, peace and security as part of the whole culture change uh, efforts for diversity, equity and inclusion and preventing, well, we know we want it to prevent violence uh, abroad, but we also want it to, to prevent it here. So women, peace and security, that element uh, um, that the Canadian Armed Forces hold actually now is part of my new organization. And um, our prime minister actually appointed an ambassador for women, peace and security as well, who works with our global affairs. But with that to be said, I think that is a wonderful question. And uh, Canada has certainly said that we are uh, hypocritical if we try to do this elsewhere, if we do not do it ourselves and we are signatories. Thanks. Wonderful explanations there. I wanna circle back to a question that was in the Q&A, a two-parter for you, uh, Mr. Yamada, you're up and there's two parts to this question, okay? Mm -hmm. Someone had, <laughs> so I think you'll be up to it. Somebody had asked about earlier, the, the real struggles that higher ed institutions might have in, in being risk averse, right? How do you encourage an institution to actually enforce those legislative policies and or policies they set for themselves as an institution when there are so many other competing concerns, like for example, the reputation of a university? How do you motivate someone to take accountability? That's part one. And the second part was, how do you think tenure is a challenge? So now we're gonna talk about how do we deal with academic institutions that are risk averse and scared of their reputation. And the second part is what about the individuals, right? How is tenure a challenge when it comes to getting rid of or holding accountable higher ed employees who are violating bullying or Title VII laws, Title IX, excuse me, laws, I'm back in the, my federal mindset. So first, how do we help organizations, academic organizations be less risk averse? All right, boy, where do I start on this one? Academic organizations, I think many academic organizations, I don't know what percentage, but there's a good number of them that have to exercise more moral courage. It just boils down to that. Um, connected with the themes of our conference, um, there are a lot of lumpy rugs at different colleges and universities where uh, uh, reports, credible reports of, of sexual harassment, sexual abuse, bullying, other types of interpersonal abuse and mistreatment have been just swept under there. Uh, sometimes it's because there's a prominent professor involved or a prominent administrator. Um, and in that case, uh, I, I don't think that uh, the protections of tenure or other types of job security should privilege misconduct. So to get to the second inquiry, um, does tenure sort of protect or insulate those who uh, might be engaging in some of this uh, mistreatment and abuse? Um, I think it makes it a little harder. 
uh, because although I strongly believe in the institution of tenure to safeguard academic freedom, uh, I think it is also seen as a way of keeping faculty who are performing at a high level uh, to give them some degree of job security. But that said, you know, again, misconduct should not be privileged. And there is nothing in anyone's, any reasonable university's tenure policy that says that the kinds of misconduct we're talking about here uh, should be in any way uh, protected from accountability. So if schools are operating uh, properly, then they would fairly investigate reports of uh, abuse and they will act accordingly. Um, and if that includes some type of discipline or even termination, then that would be appropriate. Uh, unfortunately, I think there are just so many stories that I've heard over the years uh, where those basic principles have not been followed. But I think if schools want to do the right thing, they should. And you know what? My feeling is places in the rankings and all reputation, all that stuff, frankly, be damned because we're talking about treating people with basic human dignity. And it goes back to what all the thread, all three of you brought to the, the table here, which is that this is human centered. This is ultimately about people and the profound impact these negative behaviors have on someone's life experience and their job and performance, where that's so critical these days. People are crying out for really great employees and really great service members, right? And then to have that taken by the behavior of other employees. We have just a few minutes left. So I wanna ask you a final question that hopefully isn't too challenging. I wanna ask you, what is one thing not to reduce all that you've said, because so much has happened here today, but if there's one message you want to leave, what would that be for the people attending? We'll start with um, Admiral Patterson, and then we'll work our way to Mr. Yamada and close with Ms. Salazar Thompson. Darn it. Okay, I will go first. Um, so I think one message I would like to leave is this is a different world. The pandemic has changed us, all of us especially in the Western world, we have to do business differently. And I'm gonna say, um, listen to people, give them a voice, give them agency, value them for who they are. And it should be the center of everything that we do to try and make, doesn't matter who our institution is or what we're trying to do is make sure, and I'm going back to our people again, but it, this, is, this is about people and their voices. Thanks. Mr. Yamada? I heard an earlier reference to the golden rule, and I think that's a really good place to start. I believe in organizational and systemic accountability, but I think we also have to look inward at, at how we're treating each other. And I don't say that because I've never made mistakes in that realm, but because um, I've learned too, uh, as many of us have here. Uh, that there are lessons that we can all learn to be better people and to, uh, to, to support the kind of dignity that we would like to see everyone have. I like that. We uh, oftentimes say not the golden rule, but the platinum rule, not just treat others the way that I want to be treated, but treat them the way that they want to be treated. Um, I think that brings it back to the sort of people-centered theme for this panel. But I just wanna repeat what I said before, which is that we create each and every one of us, our workplace culture every day through our words, our actions, our behaviors. And so um, I hear oftentimes from folks who say, but leadership, the agency needs to do this, leadership needs to do that. And that's absolutely true. There needs to be this framework, there needs to be a system that encourages this. But I want to say to everybody on the line today that what you choose, the actions that you do, they matter and they matter for the people who work directly with you. They matter to the other people who are watching, who absorb it. And that's how culture is created over and over through our individual daily decisions. Um, so just, just a thought. Love no pressure. Thoughts. Yeah, no, no pressure. It's all on us. No pressure. No, but it is. Culture changes, small actions repeatedly done, right? That add up. They accumulate to culture. I want to let you know that as it's coming in, you can't see all this. There's incredible thanks and gratitude to this panel saying how riveting it was, how useful it was, um, and how great this has been um, to listen to you all. And I think we started by saying, well, yes, it's not all about just the individual, it's organizations. And we talked about that, how organizations, leaders, and legislation and laws protect and create healthy workplaces. But ultimately, if 
everybody has can feel empowered to have a piece of this and to really foster a healthy and respectful workplace. I think we're at time. I, I'm trying to be very well behaved. I used to work for the DOD. I got to represent um, and keep us on time. So we want to thank you all for coming to this panel and, and being a part of this incredible conversation. Well, thank you. Thank you again, panelists. And uh, she knows about the, the whole time thing. Um, uh, Ms. Bonner, she knows she knows the time thing is big because we want to be respectful of everybody's time. We are going to take a few minutes break, but first going to give the code for this session that was just completed. And I, and I really like that. Uh, treat others the way they want to be treated. That's actually really key because I really I thought about it. I'm like, people probably don't treat themselves good. So if they don't treat themselves that well, they won't treat others that well. So that was a good one. Um, so yes, thank you for those those final remarks. The code is is Peach for the phone callers and um, is placed up on the screen as well. And it is being shared to all the different devices. So we're actually gonna come back in about 15 minutes and I'm gonna put up the next slide for this session. So if you guys can come back in about 15 minutes as a reminder, or if you had just, just joined us, at the end of this session, we will be sending out a link to all those who attended today to be able to take these code words that we've given you throughout the sessions to make sure that you are present for the session so you can get the continuing education points or the, C, the CEUs and all the different acronyms that all the branches use. So that will be given at the end of the session, at the end of the, the day, and it will be emailed out to you. So if you're missing a code, please let us know. And we thank you. We'll see you back in about nine, 15, 14 minutes. Okay, thank you so much.
Okay, well, uh, welcome back everybody. If you guys missed the last code from the session previously, again, it was Peach. And uh, it's been a, like a cool scavenger hunt. So I think uh, we gotta do these things uh, more often. Um, but yeah, just want to welcome you all back from break as uh, my speakers, it looks like they all checked in, but as they start to come on camera and uh, come off mute, I'm going to introduce our next moderator. And I think I made the comment earlier that I can't read. I can actually read, I just can't read in front of people, virtual or not, because that's when you get all tongue-tied, tongue but I can, I can read in my head. Anyway, Dr. Christine M. Pearson has built a global reputation as an expert on leading through the darker aspects at work. She has provided the foundation for work on organizational crisis management and workplace civility. For more than three decades, she has guided leaders of all levels in corporations, nonprofits, and government agencies against five continents to plan for, respond to, and learn from the extraordinary impacts of crisis and curtail the uh, the consequences of workplace incivility. She is an award-winning professor of global leadership at the Thunderbird School of Global Management at Arizona State University. And her research has been featured in the Harvard Business Review, the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and in more than 600 newspapers and magazines. Her latest publication came out stronger uh, her latest publication, Come Out Stronger, embraces crisis to stack the odds, people on your side, and by time is her sixth book. And I think she's going to send me this. I'm adding this, Jess. She's going to send me her book and, and John Hancock it there because uh, she's really popular here. I can see. So um, welcome, doctor, and uh, the floor is yours. Oops. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that nice introduction, and I am delighted to be here. This is su such an important conversation. Um, now I've got a request to start my video there. Sorry. Um, there, Yeah, there we go. So I'm really happy to be here again. I appreciate that introduction, Ashley, very much. Uh, my job at this point is to do the introduction of our panelists, and uh, let me go through that, and then uh, we'll get to... Um, the, the overview of the session and we'll be off and running. So uh, first up here, uh, let, we have just, uh, we have a tremendous, a wonderful panel with us today as you will soon find out for yourselves. Uh, let me start by introducing our first speaker, Dr. Benjamin Walsh. Uh, ben is Associate Professor of Management at the Seidman College of Business at Grand Valley State University. Uh, Dr. Walsh is an expert in interpersonal treatment and organizations with a focus on understanding the drivers and outcomes of workplace incivility and sexual harassment, of course, germane to what we're looking at today, and the effectiveness of prevention interventions. He's worked as a senior consortium research fellow for the US Army, and has also collaborated with the Defense Equal Opportunity Management Institute to study service members' perceptions of leadership. Dr. Walsh has published extensively and is an associate editor and an editorial board member for a number of business and psychology journals. Welcome, Dr. Walsh. Our next presenter, allow me to introduce, please, Ms. Marie Nuth Borasse. Uh, Marie Nuth Borasse provides oversight and leadership for the University of, Cal uh, University of California Berkeley's Path to Care Center. She is deeply committed to social justice, access to education, and eliminating all forms of violence and aggression. Ms. Nuth Borasse has a strong background in creating equitable environments and leading transformational change. Prior to joining UC Berkeley, she worked with community and university response teams, campus women's centers, and as a consultant for equity and justice. Her scholarship focuses on perpetration prevention, norms, and pro-social behavior, and equity in education and workplaces. And finally, let me conclude the introductions by introducing Ms. Lynn Rosenthal. At the direction of President Biden, Lynn Rosenthal chaired the Independent Review uh, Commission on Sexual Assault in the Military, an independent effort to support the military in taking bold action to address sexual harassment and sexual assault in the force. The commissioner's recommendations would transform military culture to better protect service members from sexual violence. 
Ms. Rosenthal built her career in government and public service. President Obama and then Vice President Biden appointed her to serve as the first ever White House advisor on violence against women, where for more than five years, she worked closely with then Vice President Biden to engage communities and create new ways to reduce domestic and sexual violence. She co-chaired the White House Task Force to protect students from sexual assault and was a representative for the White House Council on Women and Girls. After her service at the White House, Rosenthal served as the Vice President for Strategic Partnerships at the National Domestic Violence Hotline. As you can tell, we have some uh, esteemed panelists. Just to give you a quick uh, session overview and then we'll get started. Uh, each panelist will speak for 10 minutes. Following that, I will provide comments and insights, and then uh, we look forward to having questions and answers uh, with the audience for about 15 minutes. So uh, Ben Walsh, if you could lead off, uh, we're ready and anxious to get started. I think your mute is on, Ben. I was that guy, had to be someone. <laughs> so uh, I just wanna say it's a real pleasure to be here to talk uh, about these important issues of harassment and assault. Um, I was asked to talk a bit about the role of leadership, uh, which we've heard uh, a fair amount about today. Um, now my background is in uh, the fields of industrial organizational psychology or IO psychology and occupational health psychology and I use the tools of research and statistics to study these issues. Um, so there's really three questions that I wanted to uh, try and touch on today um, by uh, drawing on uh, some of the research in these areas. So first, um, what exactly do we mean uh, by a healthy climate? Uh, second, what is the role of leadership in organizational climate? Um, and uh, I'll talk a bit about some destructive leadership styles uh, as well as um, a focus on uh, some positive leadership styles as well. And then finally, what are the implications of this research for uh, building leadership competence, specifically with respect to the prevention of harassment and mistreatment more generally? So first, uh, you know, what do we mean by a healthy climate? Uh, we've heard some discussion about this uh, earlier, um, but if we look to the literature, we might get some nuanced uh, answers there uh, as well. So. Um, if we look to uh, Naylor and colleagues' uh, definition, climate really reflects individuals' anticipated consequences of their behavior. So uh, essentially, what are the consequences when someone acts uh, disrespectfully or engages in harassment or assault more specifically? Are they held accountable? Uh, which is something that we've heard a number of individuals speak to. Um, uh, really, climate is also a reflection of the behavioral norms within a unit, like a work group. Um, so for instance, uh, Susan Fisk points out, points out that norms are really behaviors that act as implicit rules. They are really descriptive of the reality, um, but they also serve to prescribe and sort of constrain future behavior. Um, people tend to behave consistent with those uh, existing norms within their group. Now, my colleagues and I uh, have studied uh, climates for respect, climates for civility and respect, um, using those two broad definitions as sort of the foundation. Um, and we define climates for respect quite uh, simply as the extent to which individuals perceive norms supporting respectful treatment among group members. And we have uh, a fairly concise, uh, just four question survey that can be used by organizations to capture and assess those norms for respect, that climate for respect. Uh, an example question is uh, uh, just simply, people treat one another with respect uh, in my work group. And that would be evaluated on a, uh, you know, a strongly disagree to a strongly uh, agree kind of a scale where higher scores would be more reflective of a, of a positive climate for respect. Now, to that end, perceptions are positive when people see that dignity and respectful treatment uh, are the norm. And, and that there are consequences for disrespect. But more than that, um, it's also important that there's ideally little variability in perceptions across uh, different identities. So um, ideally men and women view uh, that climate for respect, those norms for respect 
uh, quite similarly. We know from research uh, that that is often not necessarily the case. Now, it's, it's important to point out that although uh, this climate for respect is positively framed, it's rather uh, general in nature, um, its role in shaping mistreatment uh, has been relatively well documented. So we've seen consistently that when, when individuals and groups hold more positive perceptions of the climate for respect, there's less likely to be sort of general rudeness or incivility. There's also less likely to be more specific forms of mistreatment, uh, such as ethnic harassment, um, as well as sexual harassment, which in part is our, our focus today. So uh, fundamentally, uh, it just reinforces this importance of focusing on those norms for respect and the climate for respect. To that end, uh, the second question, what is the role of leadership? So we know from uh, a considerable amount of research at this point, whether they be uh, unit heads in academia or unit commanders in the armed services, that leaders play a fundamental role in creating and in shaping and in maintaining, uh, maintaining organizational climates. Um, leaders are salient role models. They're, they're the people that we look to to try and understand what is okay and what is not okay. Uh, they have formal and informal power that uh, essentially uh, serves to make their behavior more impactful um, and salient in terms of shaping that climate and those norms. And more generally, their behavior both directly and indirectly uh, influences the kinds of behaviors that are supported and rewarded and reinforced uh, in organizations. So uh, my colleagues and I, as well as a number of others, have attempted to understand how different leadership styles, um, some negative, uh, such as toxic leadership, uh, which I'll talk more about, and uh, others uh, that are more positive, such as charismatic and ethical leadership, uh, influence and shape in different ways those norms for respect and that climate for respect. So I wanted to talk just a bit about each one of those leadership styles and, and the kinds of behaviors that make up um, those, those different kinds of leadership. So first, um, the negative. So uh, destructive and toxic leadership. If we look to uh, Schmidt and Hanji's work, um, toxic leaders are really these, and this is uh, quite an interesting definition, these authoritarian narcissists who unpredictably engage in political behaviors and authoritarian supervision. So these are the kinds of leaders who publicly belittle so subordinates. They express anger often for uh, unknown reasons. You're not really sure what's going on there. Um, uh, they have a sense of entitlement um, and they are found to accept credit for successes that aren't necessarily even their own. Um, so uh, my colleagues and I, including um, Dr. Gallus, who we've heard from uh, a number of times today, we collaborated with the Defense Equal Opportunity Management Institute to study how service members' perceptions of leadership, specifically toxic leadership, influence that climate for respect. And quite simply, we found that to the extent that uh, service members reported that their leaders were engaging in, in, in a, a greater extent of toxic leadership that those norms for respect and that climate for respect was harmed. So uh, in brief, toxic leaders serve to, uh, to constrain, to um, uh, sort of demolish that climate for respect in many ways. Um, now, uh, let's think about the positives. So uh, first, charisma. We often think of, uh, of charisma, uh, I think, in, in different ways. Um, I, I think we could potentially think of, of some charismatic leaders as using their charisma for uh, for harm, um, but if we look to uh, to other definitions, to act, some of the academic definitions, there's there's really a positivity uh, about charismatic leaders that sort of just pulls you in and and makes you want to um, to join them and help them and and follow them. Um, so if we look to some of the questions that are used to to capture charisma uh, and and what these kinds of behaviors and and these kinds of leaders really are, so charismatic leaders they they make their people feel a sense of pride um, uh, by working for them. They, they're selfless um, as opposed to selfish, uh, selfish if we think about toxic leaders. Um, charismatic people, they work toward the benefit of the group rather than uh, oneself. Um, uh, charismatic people, they, they talk about their most important values and beliefs. And there's also a really an ethical, um, a moral component uh, to charisma. So they uh, they're found to really consider the moral and the ethical implications of their decisions. So second, uh, a related 
uh, uh, construct um, as it relates to, to the study of positive, positive leadership, and that is ethical leadership. So if we look to Trevino's and, and Brown's work, there's really these two pieces of ethical leaders. They are they're moral people themselves at work, outside of work. Um, these are people who have integrity, that who, uh, who are trustworthy, who do the right thing regardless of uh, whom it is that may or may not be watching, okay? But more than that, they are, they are moral managers. They, they listen to their people. They, they discipline consistently when unethical behavior, including um, uh, some of the various forms of mistreatment that are being discussed today, when they occur. They're fair and just uh, as well. And maybe, um, maybe even more importantly, they, they set an example. They are, they are sort of the, uh, the exemplar for what others um, are expected to, to follow. So as it relates to positive leadership, um, my colleagues and I have found uh, in uh, a couple of samples, including one that, that included uh, university employees, that when individuals worked for more charismatic and ethical leaders, we tended to see more positive uh, norms for respect, that positive climate for respect, and fewer experiences of mistreatment, uh, such as incivility and other more general disrespect. So uh, finally, my last question. So what are the implications uh, from this research for building leadership competence uh, in terms of harassment prevention? Um, uh, first, uh, so I, I really think a major focus needs to be on selection. Um, who is being selected for these leadership positions? Um, what is it that they value? Um, all leaders are passionate about something, but are they, are they passionate about respect? Um, and is this something that fundamentally matters to them? So I think we need to be um, uh, careful and um, deliberate in thinking about who we place in positions of power um, and why, and using uh, various methods to really disentangle and trying to understand who these people really are before they're in those positions. Uh, second, uh, training and development. So I think we need to think carefully, and others have discussed this as well, about what are the competencies that we expect to see our, le our leaders uh, exhibit. Uh, fundamentally, uh, they need to see uh, and understand that um, uh, sort of the nuances of some of the different leadership styles, such as the ones uh, that I just discussed, they also need to develop self-awareness. Um, uh, having done some work in this space, uh, I've learned that often people don't fully appreciate how their behavior is perceived uh, by others. So through coaching potentially, through um, uh, multi-rater assessments, we might be able to achieve and, and work towards that goal of self-awareness. And then finally, um, uh, accountability. It's something that's been discussed uh, uh, throughout the various sessions today, leaders need to be held accountable for the climate, the climate that they create, not just uh, via their own perceptions, but via the, the perceptions of uh, the people around them. Uh, I agree with others in saying that without that kind of accountability, any kind of change uh, in the direction of promoting these positive norms for respect uh, is difficult, uh, if not impossible to achieve. So thank you again. There we go. No. Nope. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, lots to think about. And hopefully, I uh, will also be um, the information you shared will also be the foundation for some questions at the end. So, so thanks very much for that. Uh, up next, please, Ms. Marie Muth Borase. Thanks, Chris. Um, thrilled to be part of this conversation with, with everybody today. Thanks for having me. So in my career, I've been responsible for departments or organizations that lead prevention and response um, to address sexual and relationship violence, uh, notably mostly within institutions of higher education. And so often these units focus on primary prevention, response to survivors, and institutional change, which includes consultation, coaching, and supporting um, leaders uh, across our institution. So just to ground us and, and make sure we're all speaking the same language, you'll hear me reference primary prevention a few times. And what I mean by those um, are efforts that really affect culture, practices, policies, and knowledge and skills, and efforts that really aim to promote healthy, respectful climates and deter violence and harassment. Um, and so these are really proactive efforts, not, not reactive or in response to a specific incident. 
And so to be sure, we know that secondary and tertiary efforts like victim advocacy, like fair and equitable investigatory processes, healthcare, mental health response, all of those are, are critical. Um, however, I think to reach our goal of really reducing and eliminating violence and harassment in our institutions, we have to keep expanding our focus and investing more in primary prevention. Um, so that I, I share that because that will really ground the focus of um, what I share with you today. And we know our scholars and public health experts really recommend prevention across the social ecology. So um, I think we have seen, especially in the last uh, dozen years, a lot of focus on individual education. Every student needs to receive prevention education when they first join campus, right, or, or your academic institution. Um, but experts have been imploring us to also focus across the other aspects of the social ecology. So relational, um, so looking at our critical relationships, our mentoring relationships, our supervisory relationships, um, at the community level, looking at groups, um, and then at the broader and broadest levels of the social ecology, our policies, our institutions, and our norms. And because of the science and behavior change and what we've learned from scholars studying the prevention of violence, in my own work, um, I have wanted to and promoted an increased focus on community level prevention. Um, and I think this is an area where leaders can make really significant contributions. Okay, so first I'll share with you um, my perspective on two simple and core practices that are necessary to um, developing and sustaining leaders who promote prevention and institutional change. Um, and then I'll highlight a few examples um, from UC Berkeley where I've been most recently about how we utilized a climate survey and some related initiatives to leverage leaders, leaders and leadership. And then I'll conclude with a couple of reminders for our professionals who oversee prevention efforts. Um, so I love that I um, get to follow Ben because I absolutely agree with everything that he just said about what we need in our leaders. And so, you know, I think what I would want to add to that is minimally to be successful in preventing harassment and violence, leaders must have a commitment to the prevention and then know how to leverage and sustain subject matter experts. And so I want to be clear that I'm just saying minimally um, because my perspective and my experience, I've worked with a lot of leaders who are really anxious about not being experts in violence prevention. They're really worried that they don't know enough. And the great news is that if you're a great leader, if you develop those managerial skills that Ben was just speaking about, then the ask is really simple. Have a commitment and know how to use your experts. Um, and of course, when you are ready to deepen your expertise, if you um, want to reach uh, the levels of knowledge um, that Lynn, one of our other esteemed panelists has, we can get you there. Um, there's lots of um, knowledge out in the field to deepen your expertise as a leader. Okay, so when I speak about commitment to prevention, um, I, there's a few sort of different aspects to that. One is really understand what the consequences of violence and harassment are for individuals and organizations. And at a really high level, we're talking about risks to health and safety for individual peoples. We're talking about short and very, very long-term consequences. Mm -hmm. And then if you're thinking at the organizational level, let's say it is a department, um, a workforce, um, there are threats to productivity. Um, there are concerns like absenteeism and retention and workplace dissatisfaction that are gonna contribute to that negative climate um, Ben was um, inviting us to avoid. Um, and then develop your philosophy um, and your foundational knowledge. And from my perspective, there's just a couple of key takeaways. Violence is preventable. It's not innate to the human condition. Survivors deserve care. Um, and our communities are impacted far too often. And we need to be really aware of collateral impact. And then recognize when policies, practices, issues are beginning to intersect with issues of violence and harassment so that you can tap in your experts. Um, and so here's a, a way that I would invite us to think about this. Um, most leaders, if you lead a department, a division, you need to have a foundational level of competence with budget and financial matters. Um, 
but often you're not, I mean, unless you are the CFO, often you're not expected to be um, a financial analyst running projections and reconciliation. Um, the same is true in violence prevention and equity and inclusion and healthy climate development. We're asking senior leaders not to be the CFO, but to have um, some foundational knowledge and know when to bring in those experts. Similarly, we do expect affirmative prevention leadership. So, <clears throat> you know, if we look back at the, at the financial example, not embezzling is not the same as proactive and strategic financial stewardship. And the same is true in violence prevention. Not harassing an employee is not enough. We have to cultivate that healthy culture strategically and in a sustained way, again, and I would say, uh, do so by developing and, sustain, and sustaining strong subject matter experts. So that's the second um, sort of advice that I have is really position your subject matter experts with sufficient information and access within your institution to allow them to influence and make change. And sure that they have the infrastructure and capacity, we've certainly heard that for decades. Um, and then leverage and activate them in times of crisis, as well as in instances where you're hoping to promote proactive um, equity work, climate work, and organizational development efforts. Okay, so those are my, my first two tips. Just to share a couple of examples um, at UC Berkeley. Um, in 2018, we implemented a campus-wide climate survey. And um, first I should mention, we learned so much from the Rutgers I Speak implementation. So if you're familiar with their work, you'll see a number of similarities in our process. And um, we organized a collaborative campus community working group responsible for determining the goals, resolving issues, administering resource audits, leveraging marketing, and ensuring that we as a campus really responded to the results of the survey with a, um, thorough action plan. Um, and this process of implementing a climate survey was a really pivotal opportunity for leaders across our institution. Our executive leaders um, utilize that opportunity to assert support for gathering such data, to demonstrate courage in making that information transparent, and also to spotlight and support such efforts on our campus. And then divisional and departmental leadership not only promoted participation and expressed the importance of this to, um, to their divisions, to their units, um, but also really took on actions in response to the results. Um, so um, on our campus, it was really important for us to include the workforce. So this survey included um, faculty and staff. Um, because of what Ben has mentioned about how important leaders are um, to shaping the climate. Um, and early on, we um, really sort of just agreed that prevalence rates was going to be a really important um, piece of information, but that we didn't expect for our institution to be any different than the national wide studies. And so we were really focused on how do we use this data to inform our campus efforts? How, what do we learn about Berkeley community members specific protective and risk factors? Um, and leveraging the survey for a, as a consciousness raising tool. So in response to the survey, and, um, and I will share a number of links with, um, with everybody who's joining us today, we have quite a few resources that are publicly available including the report, but also a lessons learned document for any institution who wants to implement a similar survey. Um, but part of our big commitment was ensuring that we had actions and that we leveraged the findings. Um, and so we did that in a few different ways, um, certainly social norms campaigns. So we utilize what we learned about our campuses, uh, risk and protective factors. Um, we identified the need to develop toolkits for departments and leaders, as well as, as skill building for friends who were the most likely to receive disclosures. And subsequently, um, about a year later after the release of the report, we also conducted analysis at the unit level, say a division or a college, um, to unearth risk factors and protective factors that were unique and specific to those communities, those cultures, those climates. And those reports 
included um, corresponding actions that deans, executives, and leaders could take to make change, including the two toolkits that I'll mention now. Um, Dr. Sarah Gamble developed a toolkit for academic departments to prevent harassment and violence. And that toolkit um, invites leaders to appoint a committee who will work together over a series of weeks to review data, review efforts across the social ecology um, with a focus on departmental policies and practices. And that process then yields a department specific set of recommendations that can be adopted and supported by executive leaders. Um, Leah Wexler from the Path to Care Center developed what we call the manager's playbook. And that's really a guide for managers to have conversations about preventing violence in, in really bite-sized ways, you know, 10 minutes over five or six staff meetings. And it's a guided program that allows leaders to really leverage their position of influence, to invite conversations, set the tone, um, set the culture, and really, it has very minimal expectations of subject matter expertise, but leaders are then able to tap into coaching and consultation and TA from experts. Um, a couple of other um, quick examples that I'll share with you. Um, I'll also provide a link to what we call our social norm seed grants, which allows intact communities to really uplift positive norms um, um, and utilize technical assistance. And then um, an area that's been really important to us in supporting leaders has also been in critical incident management and response. And so um, supporting leaders, providing consultation, ensuring that individuals are responded to with care, but also that we're managing the collateral impact um, across a department or a college um, when an incident has happened. Um, and the, utilizing what I think is sometimes a very um, traumatic and painful experience to garner commitment to transformation, growth, and improvement. And then I'll just end by uh, affirming and supporting what Ben had mentioned around recruitment and expectations. I have seen investment in that area really transform institutions, as well as ongoing orientation and training for new leaders. For the prevention experts out there, be prepared to support your leaders facilitate their role and make prevention focused decisions easy for them um, and do engage in regular evaluation and assessment of your efforts. Um, know what is effective and what isn't and ensure that your institution's resources are invested in me meaningful and efficacious ways. Thank you very much, Marie. In addition to having lots of great ideas based in research uh, and avenues to take, I'm sure that everyone will also appreciate getting links from you so they can uh, track the information a little bit uh, more deeply. So thanks for offering and, and providing that as well. Uh, next up is Ms. Lynn Rosenthal, please. Thank you so much. And I, I'm, I'm a little overwhelmed with the brilliance of my fellow panelists. And also the genius of uh, Dr. Gallus, Dr. Pearson, Melissa Cohen, and how you crafted this panel, because I didn't realize that uh, what Ben and Mari would talk about it, it conceptually would so neatly dovetail with what we found in the IRC report. So I'm just uh, thrilled to be a part of this conversation. I also realize it's the end of the day, and it sounds like it's been fantastic. I'm sorry I couldn't join you, but it sounds like you've had a lot of information to absorb. So I'm going to keep it a little simple. I did go back to, you know, the 300-page IRC report, uh, Hard Truths and the Duty to Change. And I used to tell people you don't have to read all 300 pages to get it. But after today's presentation, I think you should, because there's so much in here about leadership. It's woven throughout the entire report. Uh, and we particularly focus on leadership in our line of effort that deals with prevention and our line of effort that deals with climate and culture, both of which were subjects from our, our very smart panelists today. You know, I'm an advocate. I come from the field. Uh, so I'm always glad to know that things I've experienced are validated by academic research and by the literature. So I'm very happy about that. Uh, I think you all know about the IRC, but just a quick overview. We had 12 very, very smart people focused on four line of 
five, four lines of effort, accountability, prevention, climate and culture, and victim care and support. Leadership was woven through all of them. Uh, the IRC was stood up in uh, March of last year and produced our 300 page 82 recommendation report for Secretary Austin and President Biden in July of last year. Uh, today, I particularly want to acknowledge the folks who worked on our line of effort two on prevention, because it's so much what we're talking about today, and our line of effort three, which is actually entitled leadership and the imperative of ending sexual assault or something. I've got the exact title. Uh, but that is uh, Kai Hunter, who you, many of you know, who teaches at the Air Force Academy. Chris Fuhrer, who does a lot of work with the Army Rangers and is a mentor for Army Rangers. And Colonel Bridget Bell, who's uh, in, an Army expert in HR. Uh, so they really looked at the questions of leadership, climate, and culture. And then in the prevention line of effort, Major General James Johnson, a 30-year Air Force uh, veteran, Neil Irvin from Men Can Stop Rape, who many of you know on the civilian side, and Deb Howry from the CDC, who's now the Principal Act Acting Deputy Director. So we had really great people looking at these issues. But I wanna start with the words of Secretary Austin, and I will tell you that I, it's something that I wasn't prepared for, but that happened during the IRC process. You know, I was in the Pentagon, like, you know, 25 hours a day, I, I think. We had a little suite of offices in there and I was there for four months. My current employer, uh, Nationwide Children's Hospital, where I run a child abuse and domestic violence center, gave me a leave of absence very generously because everybody thought this topic was so important. And I learned in that building so much about leadership. Saw the examples of the best leadership and the not so good leadership. But I learned about those really best leaders at every level and particularly the very senior leaders within that building who demonstrated a lot of curiosity, who asked really tough questions, who had studied the issue and knew what to ask and also who cared. And so that was for me as someone, I, I run an organization, so I, I am a leader here and I find myself applying on a day-to-day -day basis what I learned from leaders in the Pentagon. So I, I just wanted to note that. This is what Secretary Austin said on July 2nd, 2021 about this issue. We must do more to counter the scourge of sexual assault and sexual harassment in our military. This is a leadership issue and we will lead. Well, you've heard that before. Uh, many leaders have said that over decades. So we've heard it in Congress many times, uh, but Secretary Austin actually did something about it, which is sort of all of our first lessons on leadership. He appointed the IRC. He gave us, he gave me, I will say, the freedom to choose these 12 people who were not the usual suspects of sitting on these kinds of commissions. About half of them were former commanders. Most of them were women. It was racially and ethnically a diverse panel. And um, uh, it represented views that are not always at the table. And then after we produced our found findings, he developed a process to implement them. I don't doubt I'm not there anymore. Um, so my part of the IRC is concluded, but I don't doubt there's bumps along the road, but even so, I think that we there was something was said and something was done is one of the most important characteristics of leadership. You may remember, we talked about this last summer at the, at the national conversation that uh, our number one finding of the IRC was broken trust that the chasm between what senior leaders say about the problem and what junior enlisted members experience was so wide. Uh, and that even though we've heard time and time, there's no tolerance for sexual assault and sexual harassment. We, we wipe it out when we see it, we're getting to the left of it. We've heard all of that for many, many years, but junior enlisted members did not experience that. Instead of a no tolerance, they experienced actually a very high tolerance. And they were very candid with examples. If you can meet with junior enlisted members, this was also a commitment we got from the services. You meet with them without their leadership present and you will hear their experiences. It's very important. And I also think many of them would have also uh, revealed some of that even with their leadership in the room because they felt so strongly about it. Uh, so there, to them, the leadership rang hollow. They felt that many of their leaders didn't know, didn't care. And what we, the phrase we heard more than any is check the block. If a leader's doing it, they're doing it not in the spirit 
of the laws and policies, but rather just to check the block on a compliance checklist. Uh, I think this is also true on college campuses. You know, I, as you heard in my intro, I did I uh, worked on the White House Task Force to protect students from sexual assault. We also found that there, that there's a compliance culture and there it's so litigious that the compliance culture is very difficult. Um, yet that doesn't always speak to the spirit of the legal remedies that are in place to address sexual assault and sexual harassment. I think this issue of leadership is the through line between what happens on college campuses and the military academies and in the services. It's where these common experiences lie. We also found it, as Mario has already talked about prevention, our line of effort too found that leaders knew very, at all levels, almost, almost all of them, <laughs> knew very little about prevention. They didn't really know what it was. And so very commonly they conflated prevention and response. So they would say, they might even call the local rape crisis center and say, come to a sexual assault prevention month program. And it was all about, and in fact, somebody actually said, giving out teal coffee cups is not sexual assault prevention. It's just not. It may be sexual assault awareness, but it's not prevention. And we found that leaders, even well-intentioned leaders, didn't really know what it was. And um, so they would talk about it in all the wrong kind of ways um, and then not really do anything about it beyond awareness. Now, I know that this at the DOD level, there's a tremendous amount. And then the think tanks at the service leadership level, there's a lot of knowledge in these areas, but out in the field, uh, we found that there was much less so. Um, and uh, we found that because leaders didn't know what sexual assault uh, prevention was, they didn't know what skills people needed to engage in it. They didn't know it was a public health science. This was really what General Johnson really talked so much about, James Johnson, is that there's a public health science. We're not starting from scratch. We don't have to make it up. There's a science to it, and we can learn about it and really study from the people, the academics and others who know it super well. Uh, so uh, that was what was most important. And, and also, because they didn't know what it was and they didn't know what skills you needed, uh, they didn't know how to talk about it. So they didn't really know what right looks like and sounds like. Uh, so that's what we really found in the prevention bucket. And I think the department and the services, and again, there are lots of expert, there's lots of expertise in every service and in uh, DOD, but it's getting it out. And I think they're really working hard on it. And I know there's a detailed plan in that regard. And I, I do endorse the effort to link up prevention of sexual assault and sexual harassment with other types of interpersonal issues, because um, in some ways they stem from some of the same roots. And, and then we also have to think about the sort of entitlement, entrenched patriarchal views about women and gender that also underlie sexual assault and sexual harassment. So uh, just channeling our LOE3 leads, Kai, Chris, and, and Colonel Bell, um, they really looked at this imperative leadership in the war against sexual assault. And they identified some of the toxic elements of leadership that they saw uh, in studying the literature, but also in the meetings we had with junior enlisted. Remember, we met with 600 uh, stakeholders at all levels. They identified that uh, when leaders engaged in male bonding activities at the expense of women, uh, that that created a toxic climate. When leaders furthered the othering of LGBTQ troops or sexual minorities of any kind, and that when leaders had this check the block kind of mentality, uh, that those were really elements of sort of that toxic leadership. And even when it didn't rise to that level uh, that Ben talked about, there were just those who just had such a lack of understanding of how negative outcomes would flow from poor leadership. So we recommended that uh, and Ben mentioned this, we use qualitative data to select and develop the right leaders, that they have to have social and emotional intelligence. And we dare say, it said in our report, we use the word empathy and we got some pushback. One person said to me, we can't be empathetic. It's, it's, it's in, inconsistent, incompatible with war fighting to have empathy. And I think there are many others who would make a profound case that that's not the case. In fact, that you have to have it. Uh, but that's sort of above my pay grade. But the, the need for empathy, social emotional intelligence, to care as much about your people as you do about your equipment, that's what we heard the most about. And as Kai Hunter would say, what this was really about was considering sexual assault and sexual harassment response and prevention as part of the main effort, 
the main effort, not a sidebar issue that I have to do to be in compliance, but something I care about because I care about my people. My people are my number one asset. And a command, I heard this so many times, a commander's number one job is to take care of her people. That's her number one job. That's what she needs to be doing or he needs to be doing. So to be able to do that, you need different kinds of skills than just taking care of your equipment. And there are people who have all of it and that or who, who can develop all of it. And that's who we really need to be looking for. Uh, and then this is more of a technical issue, but an important example of modernization of leadership that in the services, leaders really need to understand the cyber domain. So they can't at the very senior level say, that's too complicated, I don't understand it. They have to know it because for service members, it's their day-to-day -day life is online and in social media. And we did find that some leaders who understood social media misused social media to blur the lines. So somebody didn't know, was is my leader communicating with me as a commander, as an NCO, is my leader communicating me with a friend? It seems kind of crossing the line. So it, it's not an option in today's military or on college campuses, certainly in the academies, that leaders have to be competent in the cyber domain or sur and surround yourself with people who are, uh, Leaders can, when they do it right, they can save a life. And when they do it wrong, they can greatly harm somebody. And I don't mean to imply that there should be a zero defect mentality. This is something Colonel Bell taught us a lot about. She said, we can't have a zero defect mentality because then people won't come forward and share their concerns, do problem solving together. So we can't have that, but we have to have a care and a concern. And this is true in the college administrative space. I will tell you when I, when I worked on the campus task force that we heard about leaders at the same campuses who said the same things to students even years apart. One victim came forward and said, this dean said this horrible thing to me about, well, didn't you have too much to drink and what were you wearing? Like we think this doesn't happen today, it still does. And the same leader said it to another victim a couple of years later, that leadership harm somebody. It sets the tone for everything that's going to happen next. That's not the same as I studied it really hard. I felt that I understood it. I tried to be aware of my own biases and I still made a mistake. That's where we want people to come forward and share what they're learning. That's a, a strategy we can use together is let's share learnings, let's share data, and let's serve, share research. Not zero defect, but starting from care and concern for your people. If the, that Dean had said something very different, which is, I don't know the full details of your story, but it sounds like something happened to you and it sounds like it's really harmed you. So let's talk more about what you need today. That person, that Dean didn't have to be an expert. They didn't have to understand everything, but they needed to understand the basics of sexual assault, of trauma response and how to not re-victimize people. And uh, I guess I would end, uh, I wanted to end by saying that, and I talked about this last summer, that the real test of leaders here is not how you would handle it when everything goes right. And this is true in the services and the academies and on campus. You will be working with victims and with people who may have committed this harm and there will be no accountability in the judicial process, the Title IX process on the college campus or in the military justice system. There may not be any accountability. Maybe there'll be some in the non-judicial punishment space, maybe not. But even though the, the, what happened to this person doesn't rise to the level of the evidence that's needed to adjudicate this case in a certain way, doesn't mean that the person didn't experience harm. And the real test of a leader in these spaces is how you work with somebody and integrate them back into the unit, or if they're coming from another unit where they've been through this experience, people may have heard about it, people talk, there's a lot of gossip that goes on, as you all know, in the services. How a leader handles it then, when it's not easy and clear cut, but when it's messy and challenging, and how people are cared for. And I would end by saying, you know, I, I even heard this, I'm a victim advocate, but I would end by saying, I even heard this um, about people who may have committed the harm that um, when somebody uh, 
when somebody may have been accused of committing this kind of harm, especially these very young service members. There's a lot of confusion. Uh, there is uh, a sense for themselves of some isolation and that their care and concern is important as well. It's how we treat everybody that is the real sign of a, of a leader, regardless of the outcome of the case. So I'll end there, but I wanna urge you to go back and look at the IRC report if you haven't in a while. I think there's a link to it in the chat. There's a beautiful forward that some of our members wrote to service members uh, thanking them. And it ends by saying, uh, and the letter talks about their disappointment in their leaders, but it ends by saying, we, the IRC, thank you for your valued contribution to this report and for standing in the breach. The future is in your hands. We are counting on you. So all in there, thank you. Thank you very much, Lynn. I think you um, added a, a great deal of integration there that is so helpful, not only across uh, academia and practice, but also a big picture and details and discussion and examples and action. So uh, there's just, again, a wealth of information to go from. Um, am I, I can't tell if this looks like I'm almost muted. Can you hear me? I'm hoping so. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that. So I was, I, my charge here for five minutes, and I, I will speak quickly, but um, is to try to cut across. And what I thought I would do uh, is try to put it at a level in terms of um, practical tips um, that I've, I've uh, learned and shared and written about and, and so forth um, for decades now that, that really seem to be helpful. And for the context for this, we've talked about leadership that's the focus here. One of the things that I would also um, start with as a foundation is that the, the two uh, perspectives we're taking in this exceptional opportunity of this discussion are uh, the military and academia. And uh, if it's not been pointed out in broadly in previous sessions today, uh, there is a, a very strong tradition of um, very sharply hierarchical relationships. And so um, when we look across other sorts of institutions at this point, and given the challenges that we face in the environment, what no matter what our charge is, no matter what we're doing, those challenges are rising. So we're seeing more and more organizations empowering people, and that's happening in academia and the military as well. Um, but again, the push toward that is the idea in my mind, or that the outcome of that is that when we talk about the behaviors of leaders um, that tend to perpetuate things that should be changed or to take things forward in a new direction as you've all, all three of you have talked about superbly today. We're not just talking about people who are at the um, top of the hierarchy. Leadership today really runs throughout. And so it's not so much a hand down kind of thing. And, and I say that because I think the tips, I hope the tips that I'm gonna offer quickly to you uh, will be useful to you um, in the near term or in the long term, uh, no matter what your official level of leadership is. In other words, um, they help in terms of you influencing others, whether it's because of your designation or uh, whether it's because of the emergent situation and uh, how you help to deal with it and so forth. So um, just starting from um, the very, the idea in terms of leaders, some of the things that uh, relate specifically to things that, um, that, that Benjamin and Lynn, and in fact, Marie talked about as well, uh, some tips here again, that's my goal in this closing part. Um, make sure that your behavior is civil, your own behavior is civil, and don't use self-awareness as your sole means of that. So, um, you know, ask people who you trust to give you, who you trust to give you an honest perspective. Uh, these may, be above and beyond the workplace, these may include relatives, uh, partners, and so forth. Um, take the courage to have yourself videotaped. Take the courage to audio tape some of your phone conversations from your side of the conversation. Uh, have people for the videotape catch you in real time in meetings. Um, and it's certainly easier now with a phone than ever before, but it's some challenges, no, you know, I would acknowledge behind that. Uh, don't make excuses for powerful offenders. If you have people uh, who are working for you and with you who are uh, offensive and crossing the line on all the kinds of things we're talking about now and through this day, um, no matter how much power they wield, you know, you, you certainly need to find the way above them to change their behaviors. But 
Uh, you, you just can't, once you start to excuse that, excuse that, you know, you set the, the downhill uh, spiral very quickly. Um, recognize too, and, and one of you I know alluded to this a bit, recognize too that there are big financial costs, um, even to the very early warning signs of this. So uh, we know from research um, in incivility, which um, Lynn Anderson, Chris Porath and, and I and others uh, originated now three decades ago, um, that when you have um, uncivil behavior between and among people, um, it first of all, it reduces satisfaction. Uh, it cuts into effort. People put in less time at work. They're less likely to do what we call citizenship behaviors, which are the behaviors outside the margins of the official job description. And those are crucial behaviors in any organization. Uh, and what's more is um, there is negative emotional contagion that affects all of us, whether we recognize it or not. So if we observe people behaving uncivilly to one another, uh, we may, we have instances uh, that we have studied certainly and witnessed in organizations where people who witness it will carry on uncivil behavior because those folks seem to get ahead of it, be ahead by it or get away with it. Um, very often, about 60% of the time, at the fundamental level of incivility, it is a top-down phenomenon. It doesn't mean the boss to the subordinate, but it means uh, to the direct subordinate. It means a person of higher, um, higher power to a less powerful person. Again, um, three times out of five, that is the case. Uh, what happens then is when people watch that, they will, may attribute that person's power to the way he or she treated uh, the target. So these are all things, again, um, you know, practical recommendations, hopefully, in this regard. The other thing I wanted to talk about, and, and the idea that it impacts, back to Marie's idea, uh, it impacts not just the target. Uh, this is, again, an effort to try to demonstrate or describe some situations where people, not just at one off reach, but even further off reach than that, may be affected and either think, gosh, this is the way to get ahead, or uh, it's okay for me to do this because uh, these role models of mine are doing the same thing. So even if it's one person who's behaving badly, um, the, the swarm of influence can be remarkably horrible. Um, and again, there is there is dollar signs. Whether you are in charge of dollar issues or not, you know that that plays out eventually in terms of resources and, and the people who are there to help you and so forth. So that, that's not a small concern. The other thing I wanted to talk about and just close out on this is the idea of warning signs. Um, and you've talked a bit about that in the sessions uh, already in this, um, in this piece uh, in terms of re recognizing and acting early when you see the warning signs. So I've got a couple specific tips on that as well. Uh, the most important one is to never punish anyone who brings forth uh, bad news um, in good faith. Um, and that sounds like a tall order. I don't easily say never, but this one actually does mean never. Um, there's no quicker way to shut down the, the truth um, about negative situations than to punish the people who bring it to you. Um, the, the sidebar on that one also is to separate the signals from the solutions. So I've worked with many organizations across the various spheres, um, including uh, government and nonprofit and so forth, not just corporation kinds of places where people will say, yes, bring, it's okay, bring the problems to me as long as you bring the solution with you. And I think one of the biggest things to take from this whole spectrum today is these are really messy problems. And so the likelihood that uh, someone will come with a solution you know, is not very strong. And, and Marie had on this very strongly uh, in terms of talking about bringing experts into the conversation and certainly uh, that helps as well. Um, so not setting that kind of a mandate. The other thing I would add is erring on the side of over-reporting, uh, favoring false alarms instead of missed opportunities. And again, these all relate to one another because you have to get the information to understand that there is a potential signal there. And if you shut off the information flow, <clears throat> even without intentionally aiming to do that, um, you know, you're losing possibilities of catching things early on when they are always easier and simpler uh, to handle. Um, the last thing I was gonna say, uh, again, on the, the um, idea of warning signals is to uh, make sure that you have paved a path for swift, accurate reporting within whatever your segment of the organization may be. So, you know, um, whether it is uh, anonymous tip lines, uh, whether electronically by phone or drop boxes or whatever, 
uh, whether it is being able to go to experts and being able in, with those experts to report anonymously, if you've seen some problems, you know, whatever they may be, uh, just making sure that those, um, those are available to people as well. Um, and with that, we go to, uh, well, we have just a few minutes for questions. And I don't know, I'm, I'm hoping someone else is seeing whose hands may be going up or something and, and handling this. Ashley, is this something you're going to take over, I hope, because I'm not seeing people other than just the speakers here. Uh, yes, it doesn't look like we have any questions. Uh, getting some thank yous. I was dismissing some of the thank yous, but lots of thank yous. Um, I'm going to share the screen. And uh, the last for the phone callers, the last session for uh, the last code for the session today is Plum. Uh, but this has been amazing. I'm going to put this up because I know they were right on time to go into our last session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, speakers. Like this is this has just been fantastic. Phenomenal. And as you guys can see in the chat, there's lots of thank yous. So I'll share my screen and um, uh, Dr. Gallus, you can have the floor. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. That was an incredible session. What a, um, a great group of experts. I, there were so many comments that really resonated with me. And, uh, you know, that last one about, um, you know, these are complex issues. And in the military, you know, we have a, a culture where we say, hey, don't bring me a, a problem without also bringing me a solution. And so, uh, you know, Dr. Pearson's comment really resonated in terms of, you know, we really, we really need some support at times for, for helping folks work through these complexities. So huge thank you to that, that panel um, of experts and leaders and, and the work they're doing in this space. So we are we are now at the end of the day. We're going to transition to our last session. A number of folks have asked about where they can get the resources. Will we be sending this information out? Absolutely. We'll consolidate the information that's come in through the chat, has come in through the questions, and um, we'll be sending that out in a few weeks. Please give us a, you know, a little bit of time. We are a, a small but mighty team, I like to tell folks. Um, it's my distinct honor to have the opportunity to introduce Ms. Melissa Cohen, who is the director of Don Sapro, the Department of the Navy Sexual Assault, Sexual Harassment, and Suicide Prevention and Response Office. And in her role as director, she's the principal advisor on issues pertaining to sexual assault, sexual harassment, and suicide prevention and response. She um, entered the senior executive service in 2019. Before that, she was the director of personnel studies and oversight uh, for the United States Marine Corps, where she served as an advisor to the assistant commandant of the Marine Corps and recommended policy changes to enhance efforts to attract, assign, and retain talented Marines and civilians. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Ms. Cohen for, for closing comments. Thanks so much. Thank you. What an honor it has been to listen to national leaders and so many subject matter experts who are actively transforming the way we think about violence prevention. As we close out today, and before I turn it over to the Army, um, who will host the 2023 national discussion, I have a few thank yous. First of all, Howard University, thank you so much for your partnership, for your commitment to excellence. Um, we are grateful to uh, be side by side with you in this discussion. To the Department of Navy and to that small and mighty team Dr. Gallus talked about, um, who worked tirelessly on this effort, thank you so much. Dr. Gallus, you have brought together what an incredible caliber of professionals today. Uh, we've learned so much, your leadership uh, Lisa Moore, Priscilla Rodriguez, just a few uh, names who've uh, worked uh, many hours to put this together. Thank you for that. Ashley uh, with Naval X, Ashley Floyd, fantastic. Thank you for your continued friendship, for your partnership, collaboration. We couldn't do these things without you. And of course, to all the university, college, Naval Academy, all the military academies, um, industry leaders for continuing to follow these discussions and for always being uh, steadfast advocates for needed change. Uh, it's exciting for us 
listening to these sessions, the, the conversation yes. about culture and how we're, some of the things that stood out for me is really getting back to what the basics are and focusing on civility and respect and trust, leadership, teamwork, collaboration, accountability is how we get after sexual assault prevention and response. Um, next year, we turn it over to uh, the Department of the Army, uh, passing the baton over. I'd love to introduce Dr. Jim Hellis, who's with the Army Resilience Directorate. Thanks, Ms. Cohen. Um, and again, congratulations to the uh, Department of the Navy and especially to Ms. Cohen. You know, we, we both came into our jobs about three years ago and she took on the leadership of putting together the first national discussion three years ago. And it was such a success that it has been sustained now through three years, through COVID, through lots of changes to the program. So congratulations on great job on, you know, making this a continuing program to you and to your team, but especially to you for your leadership that I've seen on, on a daily basis in this space. Uh, to, to the participants today, this has been an absolutely wonderful day of students and scholars and subject matter experts and leaders talking about critical issues of how we will eliminate the scourge of sexual assault and sexual harassment from, from the service academies, from our campuses, and, uh, and, and hopefully ultimately from, from our country. Uh, your commitment, your passion, uh, your persistence in the face of obstacles, uh, trying to create change uh, is inspirational. Uh, we'll take that away from us today and, and, and double down our efforts when we get back to work tomorrow morning on, on these critical problems. So thanks to all who have participated. Congratulations and thanks again to the Department of the Navy and to Ms. Cohen for getting this net program started and keeping it going through the last three years. And we look forward to joining all of you and those that you can recruit to come and join this great session again uh, next year at the 2023 National Discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Hellis. With that, we close today's National Discussion. Thank you so much. It has been an incredible honor. Thank you.